Sealed with a Kiss, a Snow Valley small town romance, written by Kimberly Montpetit, narrated by Cassie Rowland. Chapter 1 Will this day never end? Jessica Mason wondered as she took a quick glance across the practice room. The second hand on the old-fashioned clock hanging above the wooden ballet bar inched forward like a slug. She pulled the neckline of her leotard away from her skin, creating sweaty puckers in the fabric, then grabbed her water bottle and proceeded to gulp it down in one long swallow. The dance studio was stifling and muggy, and it was only the third week of March. Pouring rain came down in sheets outside the studio windows, steam rising from the ground, the thick rain and lowering gray clouds of New Orleans gave Jessica a claustrophobic feeling. Her mind journeyed back to Montana, where most days a person could see a hundred miles in every direction, and the air was crisp and clear, not cloying and suffocating. The Big Easy was the extreme opposite, although it had all the big city advantages. Her hometown of Snow Valley was small, confining, and gossipy emotionally claustrophobic, if not physically. Jessica's stomach turned cartwheels while she practiced the battement turns for the Grand Paw Ensemble Dance with the Corps de Ballet in Act Three of Swan Lake. The ballet opened right after Easter at the lavish theater, the Orpheum, which had been newly redecorated. With loads of gold trim and hanging chandeliers, the performing theater would feel like she was dancing in Paris, and Jessica was thrilled to have a larger role at last. Swan Lake would be her first full-length production on stage with the New Orleans Dance Company. On stage for two weeks and 12 performances. The idea of it still felt surreal, despite the sore muscles and a broken toenail she had to tend and wrap every night after practice. One of the curses of a dancer on point wearing inflexible toe shoes most of her career. But that wasn't the only thing causing Jessica's stomach to flutter. Two nights ago, Pastor James, her, James, had flown into town. His fourth trip to New Orleans since they had begun dating 15 months ago at Christmas time. She'd gone home a couple of times to visit him and her family in Snow Valley, but being apart from the man she loved was getting harder and harder. Although Jessica preferred him coming to New Orleans, where her mother didn't hover over them and they weren't exposed to the small town's quirks and blather, dating the pastor had its drawbacks. James's actions were watched more carefully than other people's. Everyone in town had an opinion on him dating a dancer who lived 2,000 miles away. Not exactly the most reputable career because Jessica didn't remain in Snow Valley and run a ranch or the local flower shop, or bring cookies to the congregation and run a soup kitchen. Occupations more suitable for a pastor's wife. Jessica shook away her thoughts and blew out a breath, running a hand along her damp hairline. She was ready for a shower and a break, and even more ready to fly into James's arms. She had tickets for Oak Alley, one of the finest antebellum plantations on River Road, for the final four o'clock tour of the day. Jessica had come into the studio earlier than usual so she could get off a couple hours sooner. But if this rain kept up, they wouldn't be admiring the rose gardens. Male arms suddenly gripped Jessica's waist and swung her around the polished wooden floor, interrupting her thoughts of the enigmatic man she adored. Prima ballerina Jessica Mason rises into the air, her dance partner cried out, and then performs a perfect arabesque penche. Her right leg swept vertical toward the ceiling in a split parallel to her own body. It was one of her favorite moves. Jessica's torso leaned forward while she stared straight into the eyes of Alonzo Bellamini, who went down on one knee, his hands firm about her waist to keep her in position. Alonzo's face was so close Jessica could see the gold flecks of color in his brown eyes. It was a romantic, intimate move, and she wished Alonzo could turn into James. <sighs> Prima ballerina, huh? She said with a snort, 
holding the position for a few seconds before bringing her leg down again. Don't let Sierra hear you. She'll scratch my eyes out. He lifted an eyebrow with a cocky grin. But you dream about it, don't you, my sweet? Alonzo was a cheeky new hire this past fall. Flirtier than Jessica would have liked, especially since he knew about James. Fresh from Chicago, Alonzo had experience in modern dance as well as ballet. He was taller than most dancers, athletic and strong, perfect for lifting Jessica since she was a bit taller than the average ballerina. Jessica had never performed the leading role of Odette in a big production like Swan Lake, but at least she was dancing and getting paid for it. Most 10-year-old girls in ballet classes with stars in their eyes didn't get this much of a chance to dance professionally and make their dream come true. In the back of her mind, Jessica had entertained the idea of switching to modern dance just to expand the possibilities of working into her 40s or beyond, which meant she was eager to learn from Alonzo, even though he was a bit too exuberant at times. Arms out, he commanded, holding Jessica tight. Pretend you're la prima ballerina, my pet. I hate to break it to you, but I am not your pet, Alonzo. He shook his dark hair out of his eyes, knowing he was adorable. No mind, I call everyone that. And here I thought I was special, she shot back. Arms, Jessica, he commanded, ignoring her observation. It appeared that the only way out of this was to just do the move he wanted and get it over with. Obeying, Jessica flung out her arms as Alonzo dipped her into a daring hold called a fish dive. After a quick pause, he turned her hips with his hands to twirl her under his arm. Jessica's breath caught. They were practically nose to nose again, and Alonzo's grin was exasperating. Ava, another dancer in the company, had a mad crush on Alonzo, and she quickly swept across the room to slap him on the arm. Quit goofing off before Maddox sees you. Vernon Maddox was the company's director, and the dancers exhibited their best hardworking behavior when he was in the building. But Jessica knew the reason for Ava's comment. The young woman was jealous of the attention Alonzo gave Jessica, although she never encouraged him. Every time Alonzo talked to Jessica or initiated a ballet move with her, Ava was suddenly there, inserting comments about his Italian heritage and traditions like she was an expert on the subject. Her eyes were too bright and eager. Alonzo liked girls who played hard to get. It was the only reason he pursued Jessica. But Jessica wasn't playing hard to get. She was already taken. Hey, she said now, ignoring Ava. I need to finish memorizing these steps from the Grand Adage, and then I'm leaving early. Aha, you have your small-town boyfriend visiting, Alonzo said with a knowing wink. His hand lingered on Jessica's waist, and she took two deliberate steps away. Yes, yes, I do. But... Alonzo leaned closer, his cologne heavy. What if I want to be your big city Italian boyfriend? It can be our little secret. Alonzo had the classic Grecian aquiline nose and high cheekbones, soft, dark brown hair, and the touch of a romantic Italian accent, which Jessica personally thought he faked since he was born in Queens, even if his parents were from the old country, he was the ultimate gorgeous man that made heads turn and women sigh. And for some bizarre reason, he'd latched onto Jessica. Why not Sierra Armstrong, the prima ballerina of the company, a girl he danced with regularly during their solos? Or Ava, who obviously adored him and would give next week's paycheck for a date? You are incorrigible, Jessica told him. But you love me anyway. I love your dancing, she corrected. You also loved our night on the town during Mardi Gras, he was quick to insert. Except you pooped out on Bourbon Street too early. We were just getting started. 
A group of dancers had gone out to see the annual craziness of New Orleans. Mardi Gras had come early this year, in February. They had survived the crush of the main streets of the French Quarter, watched the street clowns, magicians, and break dancers, grabbed burgers, and then found a small place with a great blues band. You wouldn't buy me a beignet to keep my energy up, Jessica accused. What could I do? Is that all it takes to win your heart? A donut with powdered sugar from Café du Monde? Alonzo's fingers trailed sneakily down Jessica's arm, making her shiver after sweating all afternoon. Someone had turned on the air conditioning. I would buy you a dozen beignets. We'd sit in the park and share tiny bites with our wine. Ava was now fuming, desperately trying not to look angry and, well, desperate. Alonzo, Jessica said firmly, glancing away from the girl. No. Okay? I make my own beignets, Ava offered. My mother's secret recipe. A feat, to be sure, Alonzo said, casting the girl a small smile. This was getting awkward. I'm off now, Jessica said airily, glancing about the large room where dancers had their heads bent over choreography notes or were practicing in small groups. See you later. Alonzo tried to grasp at her hand for one last move, but she was too quick, stepping across the room on her toe shoes in tiny darting movements out of his reach. The man was friendly and funny, but there were times he really got on her nerves. At her locker, Jessica grabbed her street clothes, shoes, and a sweatshirt, intending to change at home. When she slipped down the hall toward the exit, Ava had finally cornered Alonzo. He was resignedly showing her a lift. Ava and Alonzo, Jessica muttered. Your names are cute together. Go on, dance, be happy. Let me live my own life. She gave a quick wave behind her and pushed through the doors to the parking lot. The rain was slowing when Jessica turned the key in the ignition of her little green Honda Civic, ten years old, with worn interior and the dent from the Target parking lot a few months back. Hit and run, and not enough money in her bank account to pay the deductible. Bypassing the downtown streets, which were filling with people despite the fact that it was only three o'clock in the afternoon— Jessica headed to the outskirts of the French Quarter. Loud music from another car filtered through her car windows, and Jessica grinned at the saucy Cajun zydeco with its distinctive accordion and country fiddle sound. During Mardi Gras, it had been fun letting loose on the dance floor with the others from the ballet company, not worrying about perfect arms and toes, but holding their arms high, singing to the lyrics in off-key voices. Jessica parked on the left side of the duplex she rented and hurried inside. It was a 30-minute drive to Oak Alley, and the clock was quickly marching forward. At last, she was in the sanctity of her own bedroom, with its piles of strewn clothes, unopened mail, and dishes from late-night snacks. Unfortunately, she hadn't had time to properly clean in a month. After Swan Lake is over, Jessica promised herself when she jumped into the shower— Fifteen minutes later, she was dressed in jeans, a yellow sweater, and brown suede boots with her hair pulled off her face since she hadn't had time to wash it, tendrils of curls popping out along the sides. You will have to take me as I am, James Douglas, Jessica said out loud, searching for her handbag under the couch pillows. And that's just how I like you, a deep male voice said at the door. Every which way you are... Every single day. It was James, standing tall, fresh and perfect in her foyer, although overdressed in a gray woolen overcoat like the pastor dude he was. At least that's what Jessica's 18-year-old brother, Sam, called him. Jessica sucked in a breath, trying not to swoon at how good James, her James, looked. How'd you get in the door? I knocked he confessed. But I spotted your car outside and then discovered the front door wasn't locked, so I took the liberty of coming in. 
He smiled, and his beautiful crystal blue eyes knocked Jessica over like they always did. Her stomach shot into her throat at the sight of him, and her heart began to race. Every single time. I probably didn't hear you from the sanctity of the shower. He came closer, closing the door behind him. I didn't try the handle on your bedroom door. I do have discipline, even if it was a temptation. But one of these days, Jessica, he added with a murmur. I didn't think pastors ever got tempted, she teased, a delicious shiver running down her neck when he ran his hands along her bare arms. We just pray a lot. Jessica's mouth quirked up and they grinned at each other before he gave her a long, slow kiss. James was getting bolder in his physical affection, which wasn't unexpected, of course. They had been exclusive for quite a while, despite the 1,800 miles between Snow Valley and New Orleans. But with daily phone calls and visits every six to eight weeks, it was getting harder to say goodbye each time. Jessica missed him dreadfully in between visits. Shall we, my lady? James said, tucking her hand into the crook of his arm. Jessica breathed him in with a happy sigh. He smelled like rich musk and rain. And all man. Oh, there it is, she said suddenly, trying to keep her brain on straight after James's kisses. Her handbag was lying on the kitchen tile. She had dropped it when she peeled off her workout clothes to strip down and slam into the shower. After sliding into the seat of James's rental car, Jessica checked for the tour tickets in the side pocket of her purse. Got him, she said. We're all set. Nice rental car, she said in a teasing tone. My car wasn't good enough. No, James said leaning over to give her another kiss with those perfect lips. It's not good enough for you. I wanted our last evening together to be a little bit more high class than usual. I left the mud and frozen ground of Snow Valley behind. Jessica pointed out the windshield. And got rain. James shrugged, his fingers sliding into hers when he pulled into traffic. It's letting up, and I brought an umbrella. I'm impressed, Jessica said, teasing him again. You must be a Boy Scout. Be prepared is their motto, but I didn't dress up, as you can see. I didn't notice that, and you look fantastic. I love you just the way you are. Plus, New Orleans doesn't have much of a dress code. True, but that's not exactly how you said it. James braked for a red light, and a group of partygoers took the crosswalk, dressed in costumes and quirky hats, talking and laughing loudly. He lifted Jessica's hand and kissed the back of it. No, I added a little something. Jessica's stomach flipped over and into her throat to hear him say, in person, that he loved her. They so rarely spent actual, in-person time together— they wrote the words in text messages and had begun saying it at the end of their phone calls the past couple of months, but James was being more direct about his feelings than he'd ever been before. And boy, how she liked it. Chapter 2 Holding James's hand in hers while he drove with the other, Jessica pointed out the next turn to the river road— after spending the last week together, talking constantly and visiting tourist sites, she felt completely content. They didn't talk much, just enjoyed the lush, rain-drenched scenery along the quiet, winding river road, happy to be together. While the road twisted and turned, they passed a few antebellum plantations set back along the road, oak trees dripping with Spanish moss. I never get tired of visiting these gorgeous old homes, Jessica said. Oh, there's the sign, she added, leaning forward to point it out to James. Oak Alley, one mile. Glancing up through the windshield, she saw blue sky peeking out behind the dispersing clouds. 
See, James said, the sun is cooperating just for us, just like I prayed for. Jessica laughed and leaned in to kiss his cheek, his skin warm with the hint of a five o'clock shadow. He was a pastor, but all male. Oh, you and your praying over everything. That's what the scriptures tell us to do. And hey, it works. James was comfortable with his faith and his choice of careers. But there were still times that Jessica couldn't reconcile that she was in love with a pastor. Falling for James Douglas had turned her life inside out and upside down, especially after turning her back on God six years earlier, until she could finally put aside the grief over her best friend from childhood and Michael's death in the car accident when they were seniors in high school. All because of James. Not that he'd bopped her over the head with preaching, quite the opposite. Jessica knew she had healed because of his unconditional love and patience. After parking in the gravel lot of the plantation house, James took Jessica's hand to walk to the entrance where a sign read, House Tours. The mansion was superb, majestic in grand pre-Civil War splendor. The alley of dozens of enormous oak trees on both sides of the entrance drive were picturesque and awe-inspiring, running toward the Mississippi River trees that had guarded the house for almost two centuries, planted by the original owner before the house was even constructed. What are you thinking about? James whispered as the guide escorted them through the grand front parlors, ballroom, and dining room, then on upstairs to the bedroom suites. Jessica suppressed a laugh, daydreaming about what it would have been like to live here in the 1850s, navigating an unmanageable hoop skirt through the doorways, wearing a corset so tight I couldn't breathe, and dancing the Virginia reel on the marble ballroom floor without fainting. He grinned at her, his smile making her swoon with its perfectness. Ah, but I've heard that the men held the ladies upright so they didn't pass out. So that's what men are good for. Jessica murmured as they fell behind the rest of the tour group. James put his arm around her shoulders and leaned down to kiss her hair. You are incorrigible. His choice of words reminded Jessica of what she had said to Alonzo earlier. And she didn't want to think about Alonzo right now. After their tour was over, the guests were invited to wander the property for as long as they liked until closing time. The place was tranquil, and it was hard to believe that the plantation had once seen war closing in, and its peace destroyed, the house and sugarcane fields ruined. Jessica's feet squished in the soft, wet grass as they sauntered through the sprawling oak lane, while the sun grew stronger behind the diminishing storm clouds. James guided them behind the house to the old-fashioned gardens where rolling swaths of emerald lawn lay before them. Nobody else was in sight. See? Prayer works. Are all of your prayers answered just like you want them to be? Jessica teased. Most of them, he said, lifting his eyebrows from under his brown fedora hat. The hat went well with his long overcoat in both style, color, and mood. Jessica felt like a casual college student next to him, or a hired servant discussing duties next to the owner of the mansion, despite the warmth of her hand tucked into his arm. A direct line, huh? He gave her a grin. Something like that? Jessica gave a deep, contented sigh while they crossed the paving stones next to raised beds filled with a profusion of roses and flowering spring azaleas in pinks, purples, and reds. You're taking to this southern living, aren't you? James asked now, gazing down at her. I am, Jessica admitted. At first it was so different from Snow Valley, but I'm falling in love with the beauty of the South. The people's warmth and friendliness, the charm and the food, of course. Gumbo, crawfish, perfect shrimp, and beignets. What's not to love? Besides, my mother's parents were born and raised in Alabama, so I guess it's in the genes. The gardens were quiet. 
The tour ended at five, but the grounds were open for another 45 minutes until six. The rest of the tourists were long gone with their umbrellas and damp shoes. Let's sit here, James finally said, pulling Jessica toward a bench under one of the giant oak trees. Miraculously, it wasn't wet with puddles. Jessica pulled her jacket tighter and dug her hands into her pockets. Cold? I'll keep you warm. James pulled her tight against him, and Jessica rested her head on his shoulder. You are good at that, she told him, snuggling close, not wanting to think that he was soon getting on an airplane and leaving her alone in New Orleans again. Let's get hot chocolate after this. He stretched out his legs. Hot chocolate reminds me of the night I watched you dance for the first time during the Christmas recital. Oh, please, my most embarrassing moment ever. Falling on stage was your fault. I will be forever blamed, but I never did get the rain check for that offer of hot chocolate that night. You finally paying up? Surely we've shared cocoa at my parents' house, Jessica said lightly. Oh, my sweet Jess, he said, turning to gaze at her and placing his forehead against hers. I remember every single moment I've ever spent with you. Don't do that, she whispered. Melancholy swept over her, so sudden it caught her off guard. Do what? Make me cry. For a pastor, you're pretty darn romantic. So just stop it. You're going to be gone by tomorrow afternoon, and I have no idea when I'll see you again. My schedule the next few months is killer. A week goes by much too fast, he agreed, his voice turning husky. But you know, I don't have to go. We can see each other every single day if we want to. We could change all of our long-distance woes. How, Jamie? Jessica asked, using the nickname she'd christened him with. But it was a nickname he wouldn't let anybody else use. She gave him a small, sad smile. The reason you're leaving at the crack of dawn is to be home in time for Sunday meetings. Pastor John is going to retire soon, right? And then you'll be Pastor James of Snow Valley Community Church forevermore. Not necessarily, he said, rubbing his fingers over hers while they sat there in silence for several long moments, just staring at each other. Before Jessica could take her next breath, James was sliding off the bench and kneeling in front of her, holding both of her hands in his. An earnest longing filled his face. James, what are you doing? Shh. His hand went into his breast pocket, and then James produced a small red velvet case and snapped it open. Oh my goodness, Jessica choked out. The most gorgeous diamond ring sparkled in a sudden ray of sunlight, slanting through a cloud as though James had ordered it for exactly 5.36 p.m. Does that mean you like it? He asked, his voice going hoarse. Oh, James, it's stunning and beautiful. Jessica paused, trying not to choke up. So very perfect. Miss Jessica Mason. I love you. I adore you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I want to wake up to you every morning. I want to laugh with you, argue with you, and make babies with you. Jessica's eyes widened and she couldn't help teasing him. Should a man of the Lord say such things? A gleam came into his face and the look he gave her was filled with passion and trust and an overwhelming love. Will you do me the honor of marrying me, my darling Jessica? She bit at her lips, emotion pricking at her eyes. This was so unexpected. Why now? How could she not have seen this coming? Jessica stalled for time. But you need to ask my father's permission first. I did, before I boarded that plane a week ago. You did? Jessica was surprised and touched, and suddenly terrified. This proposal wasn't a spur-of-the-moment decision. 
Even her father knew, which meant her mother probably did too. So this isn't merely a product of the Romantic South? She stammered. You're not overcome by gone-with-the-wind romantic notions? He chuckled. <laughs> the last vestiges of Mardi Gras in the beer halls and strings of beads hanging from the trees downtown aren't exactly inspiring. But you and I have been touring history and the gallantry of the South, not partying and going crazy. Although this proposal is a teensy bit crazy, don't you think? How about last night's rehearsal of Swan Lake I sneaked into? That's a pretty romantic ballet. True. Jessica went silent, staring at the dazzling ring waiting for her in its velvet case. She was frozen in the moment, while time rushed past, the clock ticking while she stayed silent and didn't respond to his heartfelt question and the answer he was waiting for. Part of her was tempted to reach out and slip the gorgeous ring on her finger. Show it off at ballet practice tomorrow. Keep Alonzo Bellamini at bay. While at the same time, Jessica wanted to run, screaming back to the parking lot. Say something, James begged, while Jessica sat frozen on the bench. Before she could speak again, he leaned forward and carefully slipped the ring onto her finger where it felt cold and hard and heavy and dazzling. Cupping Jessica's face in his hands, James kissed her softly, his lips warm and perfect and irresistible. Her breath caught and her stomach seemed to fizz into her throat with an explosion of sweetness. She always had that reaction when he kissed her. Every single time. When their lips broke apart, they were nose to nose, eye to eye. I, I, Jessica stammered. James, this ring is beautiful. I'm in awe. I do love you, but I wasn't expecting this at all. Not for a long time. You've caught me by surprise. I don't know what to say. It's easy, he told her softly. All you have to do is say one word. Yes. Oh, right. She bit at her lips, willing herself to say yes, but couldn't get the words past her dry throat, past her fears, past all the obstacles that currently lay between them. No, the word is yes. He smiled at her, but behind the smile there was worry now, and fear. Jessica's heart was about to explode. Love and longing for this man spread through every single vein in her body, but it wasn't the right time. She wasn't ready. She wanted to say something to ease his pain, but the words, the right words, wouldn't come. James held both her hands in his. He bent down to kiss her fists and then lifted his chin, his blue eyes latching onto hers. I love you, Jessica. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I've been thinking about this for months. But you know I'm not the typical pastor's wife. I'd be terrible. I grimace at church potlucks. I can't quilt or can beans or sew or crochet. James tried to chuckle, but his voice was strained. Who said you have to? Tradition? Snow Valley? That's who. I'm a dancer. My career is just beginning. I even get my first 20 seconds of solo time during the ensemble number. Vernon Maddox is going to give me a raise after the company has completed its first run of Swan Lake. I knew you would succeed, he said quietly. I'm so proud of all the hard work you've put in. I love watching you dance. You're a wonder of precision and grace. And perfect legs, I might add. She smacked his arm, her face heating up while the ring slipped just a little bit. We'll get it sized better, James said, referring to the too large ring when he caught Jessica's hand again and slid back up along the bench to sit next to her. Jessica pressed her face into his woolen coat, 
her mind whirling with things she should say and with all the things she couldn't say. The sun sank while they held each other. Across the garden, a man collected coils of watering hose and a box of tools. I think it's time to go, Jessica whispered. James's deep voice rumbled in her ear. Jessica, I'm not letting you off the hook. I can't get up from here, get in the car, and pretend this didn't happen. I wanted to propose to you in a spot you love, a place of timeless beauty and romance. Oak Alley is perfect, she told him. You couldn't have chosen a better spot. We love each other, don't we? James said. We can figure out the rest. Jessica swallowed and tried to speak coherently. You know a pastor and his wife can't, shouldn't, live apart. And commuting would be horrific. It takes two planes and all day to go in one direction. But the ballet company is taking a hiatus through the summer. I thought we could marry in May and have three months together. I figured we'd figure it out when we could spend more time than three or four days together. I'm not ready to give up my dancing. Can't we wait a few years? A few years? James thudded against the bench. I'm sorry, Jess. Being a part is already hard enough. Talk to your Uncle John. Surely he's not ready to retire yet either. But he brought me to Snow Valley with that purpose. I can't leave after all the time and expense of training me. Small town churches have a shoestring budget as it is. I... Oh, James, but you're asking me to give up my life, my heart's dream. His lips tightened when she slipped off the ring and placed it back into the box. The lid closed with a snap, and Jessica cringed as it disappeared back into his coat pocket. I wanted you to leave Oak Alley wearing that. I'd thought we'd be celebrating tonight. It's truly beautiful, James. I love you for choosing the perfect ring, for loving me with all my orneriness and stubbornness. Will you wear it as a promise of the future? Jessica slowly shook her head, and it felt like her heart was breaking. I can't. It's an engagement ring, and we don't know what the future holds. At least for the next year or two. Her breath hitched, and a stab of pain pierced her heart. She wanted to kiss him until midnight, but Jessica held herself back. She couldn't tease him with that while turning down his proposal. She was hurting him, and yet it was tearing her own soul into pieces, too. All I see right now is uncertainty. We don't have a plan that works. I can't give up my dancing yet. I can't, James. I'm not asking you to give it up completely, he began, and then stopped, pain etching lines along his face. Jessica blinked back tears with a fierceness that hurt. She wasn't going to make this harder for him by turning into a blubbering idiot. Perhaps, perhaps time will give us the answer. I guess God didn't answer all my prayers, he said wryly as they rose from the bench and began the slow walk back to the car in silence. Jessica's chest was tight and hard, and she knew James was stunned and in shock. Would he forgive her? Would he give her a second chance and propose again in the future? When they climbed into the rental car and James backed out into the growing dusk of evening, Jessica clenched her hands together in her lap waves of panic rising in her chest. There was one aspect of turning down his marriage proposal that Jessica didn't want to face, but the fears came anyway. What if James didn't wait for her? What if he found somebody else before she was ready? Chapter 3 James handed over his boarding pass, and the scanner blinked green over the barcode. Thank you, sir, said the Delta Gate agent. Welcome aboard. With a quick nod, he moved down the jetway as if in a fog, running the events of his last night with Jessica over and over again in his mind. James knew exactly what Jessica had been trying to tell him. 
A hint that perhaps there was somebody else in his future. A girl better suited to his particular life's calling as a witness and pastor of God. He understood her concerns and her fears. He wasn't sure of the exact path forward either, or how events would work out with both of them living in different states on completely different career trajectories. Perhaps he should have finished medical school years ago, and then he could have been searching for a medical practice in New Orleans right now. Or a clinic partnership with a group of other doctors. But James had known a year ago that Jessica Mason was the girl for him. He loved her snarky irreverence, her passion for life, and the tender heart she kept hidden deep inside. He had waited patiently, courted her, talked every day, flew to New Orleans often to see her. He'd thought, wrongly, it appeared, that after Swan Lake, she would be ready to leave the demanding life of a dancer and marry him, come back home to Snow Valley, set up a cozy love nest, have a family. James had never doubted his judgment before or his feelings. The world tilted unsteadily. He had tried to listen to his heart, his attraction for Jessica, as well as his inner intuition for what God wanted for his life. He'd never fallen in love with any girl so fully before. Not even close. And yet, he'd been completely wrong. How could he counsel anyone else in their spiritual journey if he couldn't even manage his own? After buckling into row 14, seat C, James went over the previous evening in his mind for the hundredth time. Oak Alley had closed. They'd returned to the car. Jessica's hands shoved into her jacket pockets while the diamond ring was hidden away in his coat pocket. They were silent. There wasn't much to say. James had a hard time focusing when they returned to New Orleans over the hazy, winding road while night fell all around them. The fog hadn't helped. Fog clouded his mind and enfolded the rental car, making him edgy and unsettled and afraid about his future for the first time in his life. He was now questioning every decision he'd ever made. Seminary school, uprooting his younger sister Lydia to live in Snow Valley. James, Jessica said softly, finally speaking from the seat next to him. Let's not have a bad last evening. I have tickets for a swamp tour in the morning. And you know I still love you. Do I know that, Jessica? He hadn't meant to be sharp, but honestly, what was he supposed to think? He'd never proposed to a girl before, never been this close to a girl in his life. Never dreamed she'd turn him down. Of course I do. So very much. I haven't been leading you on. He glanced at her when he braked for a light and noticed that her eyes were filling with tears. Honestly, Jess, I don't know what to think. I feel completely broadsided. I don't know what to say. I wish I could make you feel better. I just wanted to relax and have some fun with you this weekend. Especially when the last few weeks have been so intense at the studio and are only going to get worse. So it's all about you? He asked with a sigh. You can't even see that I'm devastated. That's not fair. Your proposal was lovely and romantic, but the timing is difficult. How can I think about getting engaged or begin planning a wedding when Swan Lake has completely taken over my life? I didn't think it would be so time-consuming. I mean, he struggled for the right words. It's not like you're the principal ballerina. Jessica sucked in air. Wow, she said, her voice cracking. That's a low blow. I'm sorry, Jess. That was wrong of me. I apologize. I can't think straight right now. All I wanted to tell you was how much I loved you. I wanted to plan a future together. I wanted to celebrate us before I left to go back home. The vehicle behind them honked their horn and James stepped down on the gas pedal, not realizing the light had turned green. Jessica became silent while they found a quiet restaurant, 
away from the noise of Bourbon Street and the boardwalk along the Mississippi. A meal where they ate very little and hardly spoke. Now, the plane revved down the runway. James felt his stomach lift when the Boeing 737 left the ground and tucked its wheels in. He pulled out a magazine from the pouch in front of him, flipping through the pages without seeing them. After the swamp tour the next morning, where they spotted alligators and nutria and heron flying through the cypress trees, Jessica dropped him off at the airport and offered to return the rental car for him. When they said goodbye, she had clung to him for a moment, her head back to stare at him, eyes pleading. But for what? Forgiveness? Assurances? He couldn't give her either one. She was the one that had turned him down. After a quick kiss, he strode toward the security checkpoint. A quick glance backward showed him that she remained standing in the same spot, watching him. Her pale face was solemn, the long clouds of hair brushing her coat lapels. Someone in line nudged him, and he marched forward, removed his shoes, slid his carry-on along the rollers to be x-rayed. When James looked up again to lift his hand in a final wave of farewell, she was already gone. His gut clenched into a tight knot. Dear Lord, he thought silently, what am I supposed to do now? Had he done this all wrong? Was Jessica gone for good? That night when he drove the hour back from the airport in Billings, James felt even more depressed. Every minute and every mile back to Snow Valley was further away from the woman he loved. The crusty, half-melted piles of a late snowfall along the dark streets was depressing, too. When he locked up his car at the church and pushed through the doors, the air was cold and sharp against his face. Not even the church sign could lift his mouth into a smile. Honk if you love Jesus. Text while driving if you want to meet him. He needed quiet. Solitude. He had to shake off this melancholy and finish preparing his sermon for tomorrow. The sanctuary was dusky and quiet, empty of people, and also empty of the peaceful gift of the spirit he was hoping for. Carrying his suitcase, James strode to the back offices. His uncle, Pastor John, was standing behind his desk when he passed, head bent, and shuffling papers while he muttered something. You still working, Uncle John? James asked. Go home and spend some time with your wife. I was just about to, his uncle quipped with a grin. How was your trip? It was fine. When James didn't elaborate, John lifted his eyebrows. I've seen more enthusiasm from a kid stacking the hymnals after services. Thought you'd return home with a big grin and I could call you the happiest man in Snow Valley. James frowned. What makes you say that? John spread his hands, a look of guilt crossing his face. Didn't you propose to Jessica Mason, or is that a big surprise next month for her birthday? James let out a surprised snort of laughter. <laughs> How would you know that? I didn't even talk to you about it. Is God giving you personal revelation about my life now? Hey, son, I wasn't born yesterday. I've been seeing the signs for weeks now. Your giddy whistling has been driving me crazy. Then I saw a bill arrive from the local jewelers. You were so eager to see Jessica a few days ago, you left five hours before your flight was scheduled. James shed his coat and pursed his lips. Didn't know it was that obvious. Uncle John moved out from behind his desk and put a hand on his nephew's shoulder. What happened down there in New Orleans? You don't look so good. Is Jessica all right? She's fine. Her career is going full steam ahead. A solo in Swan Lake. Couldn't be better. John stared at him for a moment. And therein lies the problem, I take it. Raking his hands through his hair, James leaned back against the door jamb in a gesture of defeat. Exactly. 
You weren't able to set a date for the wedding? Uncle John, she wouldn't even accept the ring. She said no. She turned me down. Saying the words made it sound so final, so awful. His uncle let out a deep breath and shook his head. I am so sorry. Never expected that outcome. You okay to take tomorrow's sermon? I can do it. I've pulled all-nighters before. Of course not. It's my weekend. I don't want any speculation. This is only between you and me. Well, your aunt may have her suspicions, but I'll take care of that. She's not one to gossip, as you know. Ministers' wives know how to keep information close to the chest. James dropped heavily into a chair, his energy vanishing in an instant. Tell me something good that happened around here before I go spend a few hours in front of my computer. Okay, well, the Easter play is going full swing. A few of the mothers used the recreation room to sew costumes. Mrs. Barton had twin girls. Oh, and Porter Wilson is teaching the high school Sunday school class. James' cell phone dinged and he glanced down. A text from Jessica. Did you get home okay? I didn't hear from you all day. A flash of guilt came over him. He'd been feeling sorry for himself and hadn't communicated his arrival. Yes, I'm home. Road's good. Talking to John at the moment. Call you later. Stuffing his phone into his pocket, James changed the subject. So you had an appointment earlier? That's unusual for a Saturday night. His uncle nodded. Yes, with a new member of the congregation. I remember hearing about her once, although I can't recall how long ago. She's a relative, cousin, niece, of the Sterling family. Perhaps she's visited before. Her name is April, maiden name West. James tilted his head, trying to follow the flow of family connections. Meaning she's married now? Murphy. Roy Murphy was her husband's name. Why is she meeting with you if she's only here for a visit to see your extended family? Not a visit. April's relocating. She's in need of family around her right now. Her husband, Roy, was a Marine. Killed in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan a few months ago. Wow. I'm very sorry to hear that. What a tragedy. She can't be much more than 25 and wanted to ask me about grief counseling as well as get a feel for the town and employment possibilities. She has a three-year-old daughter named Daphne. Cute little thing. Cora and I met with her here at the church together. Told her about the preschool Luann Snow runs. I think April got her registered a few days ago. That seems fast, James observed. Mrs. Murphy is currently suffering through government paperwork and red tape to get the insurance she's due. This may not be enough to support her for more than a few years. She says she needs to find a job. She and her daughter have been living with her folks in Billings. But April wants to attempt to forge a new life, and the Sterlings offered her a way to do that and become more independent without having to rely on her parents. I can understand that, James said although Snow Valley didn't offer anywhere near the employment and educational opportunities a bigger city like Billings did. She'll be at church tomorrow. Just wanted you to know before you saw her and didn't recognize her from one of her previous visits. In a small town like ours, people sometimes get offended if the preacher doesn't know everything about their lives. Thanks for the warning, James said lightly, but inside guilt assailed him. He'd been irritable since last night and feeling sorry for himself. Every person in his congregation had bigger problems than his. Widowed with a child at such a young age. Life could be so much worse. You okay, son? Uncle John asked again, peering at him with piercing eyes. James shook his head. The office was warm and his wool suit coat was making him sweat. In addition to that, his uncle's all-knowing eyes were getting to him. He just wanted to hide from the world for a few days, nurse his wounded heart, 
not speak in front of 200 people tomorrow morning. I'll be fine, trying to take all this in stride and not make a big deal out of it. Pastor John gazed at him. A broken heart isn't a small thing. But Jessica didn't break up with you, right? So there's always hope. Hope. Yeah. I'm in love with a girl who lives almost 2,000 miles away and won't be ready to get married until she's 40 when her career is over by default of aging. Where does that leave me in the meantime? Alone? Childless? Pining for a dream I can't have. You're the only one who can figure this out. I have faith in you that you will. Thanks, Uncle John. Now I'd better get to work so I won't be maudlin and depressing tomorrow. How do you keep a happy face? Pastor John gave a chuckle and shrugged. <laughs> one word. Practice. Seriously? I'll be frank with you. There are days when someone needs more help than I'm capable of giving, or I'm too ignorant to know how to deal with it. Or a certain grief weighs so heavily, it's like your chest is piled with rocks. But prayer and faith can get you through it, step by step, moment by moment. Remember that hope outweighs the dire. Love overcomes adversity. James rose from the chair and reached down to retrieve his suitcase. I'll post that on my computer and on my forehead. He held up a hand with a small smile. And I'm not making light of your advice. I mean it. Thank you. Chapter 4 once in his own office, he shed his suit coat and slumped into his desk chair, hitting the power button on his computer. While it booted up after being cold for days, James stared at Jessica's phone number. It was almost 11 o'clock in Louisiana now, an hour ahead of Montana time. Before he could talk himself out of it, he dialed her number and listened to it ring. And ring and ring eventually going to voicemail. He opened his mouth to leave a message, but there wasn't much to say, actually. He couldn't pretend that he wasn't hurt. He didn't want Jessica to hear the resentment in his voice, even if he tried to cover it up. He'd call her tomorrow after church, after he'd had some sleep. When midnight struck, James finally shut everything down, so tired he couldn't see straight through his red and bleary eyes. The rough draft of the sermon was a bit more polished. He'd looked up references and inserted them, adding yellow sticky notes to the pages of his Bible so he could find the scriptures more easily. After turning off the lights and locking up, James made his way behind the church to the small apartment Uncle John and Aunt Cora had converted from their garage two years ago, when his uncle invited him to come to Snow Valley when he graduated seminary. James helped his uncle do a bit more remodeling when his younger sister, Lydia, came to live with him. She consumed a lot of his thoughts and time, too, but after graduation in May, only two months from now, his younger sister would be prepping for college and moving into an apartment in Billings. Right now, James was so tired his legs were leaden and he could hardly keep his eyes open— he gave a light tap at Lydia's bedroom door, and it slowly creaked open from the pressure of his hand. The door hadn't been latched completely. Lydia wasn't here. His eyes finally spied the note she had taped to the door. Staying over at Melissa's house tonight. See you at church in the a.m. James was secretly glad she wasn't here. He needed some quiet time, and he couldn't face the barrage of questions from Lydia as to why he looked so done in and miserable. Throwing the luggage onto the floor, James told himself he'd unpack tomorrow. After a quick, hot shower, turning the thermostat higher to fight the chill of the empty house, James crawled into bed and slumped against the pillows. It was well after midnight by now, but he found himself craving the sound of Jessica's voice, like a teenager wanting assurances. He dialed, 
positive she was home in bed by this time of night. Jessica didn't keep late nights unless she was reading an engrossing novel. On days when she was yawning every five minutes, he teased her about the latest bestseller. You just don't realize how good Sandra Brown is, she'd say with feigned indignation. I am compelled to turn the pages. After several rings, her phone went to voicemail again. So he knew the phone wasn't turned off. Why wouldn't she be answering? It was disconcerting, especially when he'd received a text from her not more than a couple of hours ago. Setting the alarm early so he could go over his sermon one more time, James snapped off the light and tried to sleep, but it soon became impossible. He kept picturing Jessica's heart-shaped face, her expressive green eyes. The memories of her kisses were torture. James pounded the pillows and rolled over onto his back. Where are you, Jess? He asked the ceiling. Was she avoiding him? Finally, the worst thought of all came into his mind. His worst fear. When Jessica gave him back the ring, was that actually her cowardly way of telling him goodbye? While the choir sang the next morning, James gazed out over the audience, barely registering the faces. It was Sunday morning. No work or dance practices for Jessica, but she still hadn't answered her phone. His eyes passed over the various families in the congregation, the wiggling toddlers, Lydia and her best friend Melissa sitting together and trying not to whisper, the older ranchers in their jeans and bolo ties trying desperately to keep their eyes open after a hard Saturday workday. Sophie Morris, the woman everyone in town called Aunt Sophie, was looking very frail these days in her usual spot on the third row from the end. Finally, James's gaze rested on a young, attractive woman he didn't know. He stared, trying to recall her name, and then it hit him. She must be April Murphy. Mid-twenties, reddish-auburn hair, hazel eyes with a soft, vulnerable smile. A young girl wearing shiny black shoes and a yellow dress was sitting on her mother's lap, quietly turning the pages of a board book. All of a sudden, April Murphy's eyes flickered across his face, pausing to study him. Quickly, James pretended he was just assessing the Sunday morning crowd. But this new woman's situation tugged at his heart. To lose your husband after only a few short years? In combat overseas, no less. Alone, and with a child starting all over in a new town? At least Snow Valley was the kind of town that welcomed new folks with open arms and lots of baked goods. It was three weeks before Easter, and he and Uncle John had planned sermons for the entire month to focus on forgiveness and unconditional love. Today, he talked about the parable of the prodigal son. Even as he spoke, interspersing his comments by quoting the story straight from the book of Luke, he was feeling guilty at the anger rising within him. Jessica was ignoring him. Wouldn't she have at least sent him a text after seeing that she'd missed several calls from him? He tried not to panic. There had to be a reasonable explanation. If he truly loved her, he shouldn't get so angry. If she came back to him like the prodigal son, he'd forgive her instantly. He was pretty sure. He hoped he could. He wanted to. Because she drove him crazy and he loved her like crazy. James tried to suppress the images running through his mind. The image of Jessica running toward him in a meadow of daisies, her incredible hair flying behind her, a beautiful, loving smile on her face, and... Concentrate, Pastor James, he ordered himself. The words blurred on the page and he stammered. And thus we see that, um, that God will... The congregation tittered ever so softly. 
Uncle John, sitting behind the podium, shifted in his seat. James shuffled his papers and found his place again, banishing the curse word echoing in his mind. He was a pastor for heaven's sake. Act like one, he admonished himself. Think like one. He was sweating by the time he sat down, grateful for the rustling of hymnals as the organ played the introduction for the final hymn. You okay, James? John said under his breath, barely moving his lips. Fine, he said shortly. Surreptitiously, he checked his phone. A message from Jessica popped up, which made his heart leap. He'd have to read it later. He was always chiding the teenagers for holding their phones surreptitiously in their laps during Sunday school. They had the art of a listening countenance perfected. He was grateful Porter was teaching Sunday school today. Pastor John could have continued teaching as he had for decades, but the older minister was trying to back away a little bit and let his nephew have more control over the church so he could retire. He was probably regretting that decision after James's scattered sermon this morning. Next to him, Uncle John sang, Onward Christian Soldiers, in a hearty voice, not even needing the hymnal to read the words. Moments later, they were at the doors chatting up the members of the congregation as they departed the meeting house for their respective homes. Now give me a kiss, you handsome young man, Aunt Sophie said in a wavering voice, leaning on her cane. James leaned down and the elderly woman pecked him on the cheek. She smelled like baby powder and chicken feed. An interesting combination— But then Sophie Morris was a dichotomy of elegance and a good old-fashioned ranching wife from the era of World War II. Have a good Sabbath, James told her, shaking hands with the stream of worshippers. Sam Mason was next, punching him lightly on the arm. Hey, Pastor Dude, how's my sister? New Orleans suddenly seemed a million miles away, as far as the moon. Good. Good, James stammered. Again. She wearing a rock on her finger now? Jessica's younger brother was as incorrigible as she was. That's our little secret, he said vaguely. April Murphy was right behind him. We'll get ice cream this week, he added, trying not to have this conversation with all the listening ears surrounding them. You buying? The perpetually hungry 17-year-old said with a grin. James chuckled. (laughs) I'll arm wrestle you for the bill. You know I'll beat you. James gave him a quick shrug and a competitive grin. This week that's all gonna change, buddy. I'll practice on my dad. He's a weakling. Drilling people's teeth has made him soft. Same as preaching, I think. Wow, thanks for that vote of confidence. Maybe I should just retire now. Move along, move along. His voice was teasing, but he certainly didn't want his sister's boyfriend to air the current status of his relationship with Jessica to the world, especially with an earshot of April Murphy. The young widow was next. Mrs. Murphy, he said, shaking her hand. Hope you're enjoying Snow Valley. I am, actually, she said in a soft voice. Not that it was quiet and timid, but soft around the edges like a pillow. So you're related to... Irene Sterling, now Wilkins. She's my mother's much younger half-sister, actually. Long story, family scandals and all. Your ears will burn, Pastor James. Was she flirting with him? He should never have sat there staring at her. Despite the fact that he'd never intended to stare more like lost in thought while she happened to be in his line of vision. Good grief, he hoped nobody else had noticed. Perhaps the less said the better, he replied, groaning inwardly. Now he sounded like he was chiding her. Or, just as bad, an old geezer type like Buster Wright who dressed like Elmer Fudd. I didn't mean. That came out badly, he began, but April Murphy shook her head. No worries. I won't say another word in front of the children, April added, suppressing a smile at Sam who caught the good-natured insinuation 
but just laughed it off. You're a good sport, Mrs. Murphy. Could things get any worse today? Please, call me April. I don't feel like a missus at all. Not at twenty-five. And especially now that Roy... Her voice trailed off and her face flushed. My fault. James quickly took the blame. I didn't mean to make you feel uncomfortable. You have my deepest condolences. Sudden moisture filled April's eyes and she blinked hard. Thank you, Pastor James. The rest of the congregation had now filed out the door to the chilly gray spring day, giving small waves or shaking his hand and moving on. Please tell me if there's something I can do for you. Pastor John mentioned that you're moving into your own place. April said, Irene has been very kind, but after living on my own with with my husband for five years, it's hard to be under someone else's roof. I found a small apartment, and Daphne and I are moving in this weekend. I'll round up some of the guys from church, and we'll help you on Friday. That sounds perfect. I have a few pieces of furniture I brought with me and boxes in a storage unit. Sounds pretty straightforward. And don't worry, Snow Valley has a few pickups around that we can confiscate, James added. April smiled, getting his joke. Snow Valley probably had several hundred pickup trucks. Every farmer and rancher had one, even if it was just to haul firewood or a Christmas tree. There were probably a couple dozen in the church parking lot right now. A few minutes later, James was in his office making calls and rounding up some extra hands. A half day sounded like it would be enough time. Sam Mason was quick to agree, along with a few other boys and their dads after school the following Friday. Finally, James pulled his personal cell phone out of his pocket. Anticipation. And dread. Tugging at his gut. Jessica had texted, Sorry for the radio silence. My phone died, so I had to go pick up a new battery this morning. And yes, I missed church. Bad me. I'll do ten extra pirouettes to make up for it. Sort of like saying rosary. Glad you're home okay. Talk soon. What did that mean? A combination of friendly, flippant, and distant. Somehow, James had blown it with her. And he had no idea how to fix it. Chapter 5 Jessica had to admit that her odd friendship-slash-flirtation thing, she had no idea what to call it, with Alonzo Bellamini wasn't near as annoying as Zach Howard's attentions had been the previous year. She was grateful when Zach left the company to go study tap dancing in New York a few months ago. The man had never taken the hint. Never backed off, even when she had made it very clear and in no uncertain terms that she wasn't interested in Zach and had, in fact, a boyfriend. Alonzo was a better dancer than Zach, too. Sometimes, Jessica paused her own routine just to watch his execution of those perfect grand jetés or flawless lifts with Sierra Armstrong. Alonzo was also handsome and charming, but Jessica had a hard time trusting him when he flirted with anyone in a skirt and then turned around to ardently confess his devotion to her. You're such a playboy, she stated a week later when he was leaning over while Jessica tied her toe shoes with pink ribbon. He ignored the accusation. You have such a beautiful feet, he said instead, his Italian accent suddenly thicker than usual. Blisters and band-aids are not beautiful, Jessica countered. The female foot is magnificent, a work of art. A dancer's feet are a mess, everyone knows that. It's a wonder we are not all crippled by the time we're forty. But the broken toenails and calluses are a sign of love for one's art. The soul knows no bounds when it comes to passion for one's life's work. Jessica rolled her eyes at his flowery verbosity. You're impossible. And you are too perfect for words. Marry me, amore mia. 
Um, you do remember meeting James last week, don't you? Alonzo waved a hand, dismissing the whole idea of another man. But you turned him down, which gives me hope. What in the world are you talking about? Jessica demanded. How did he know James had proposed? She suddenly wondered if he'd bugged her apartment. I could see it in your eyes. See what? That man from the boonies of Snowy Crevice, Snow Valley, Jessica corrected. He shrugged as if it were no matter, although he'd never find it on a map and couldn't care less anyway. The boyfriend proposed and you turned him down, ma chérie. That speaks volumes. Now he was mixing Italian and French. Jessica ignored that last bit of commentary. It was mere opinion. A man of God, too. He probably prayed about it, and you ignored God's answer. Which means you're not in love with him. Shut up, Alonzo. You know nothing. Jessica sighed. She was seventeen again, telling some guy to stuff it. But honestly, the man was incurable in his ardor. Even so, goosebumps broke out along her arms. How did Alonzo know about James proposing to her? It was uncanny and a little bit weird. Alonzo chuckled, trailing a finger along her ankle to grasp the wayward ribbon. Jessica jerked her foot from his hand and the toe shoe clattered to the floor. Now you're wondering if I'm talking to God, right? Alonzo waggled his eyebrows, knowing he had her. Am I right? No, Jessica said sharply. It just means you've been spying on me or, or something. You keep things close to your heart, sweet Jess, but the emotions come out in your eyes and in your dance. I see it. I see the real you, my Bella girl. <laughs> More than that boyfriend of yours. Good grief. Jessica had tried to be careful not to come into work red-eyed from crying into her pillow. She had tried so hard to pretend that nothing was out of the ordinary when she went through the motions of warm-up and bar work like a wooden robot. Often, she would catch herself daydreaming about James's kisses. And that ring, it was so beautiful Jessica coveted it. James tolerated her moods and high-strung personality like nobody else ever had. The quips and sarcasm she dished out when she was afraid she was getting too close to someone. James understood her, saw her in her heart and soul, and loved every piece of her. Jessica hadn't appreciated him as much as she should have. Now she'd brushed him off and hurt him all over again. Jessica brushed off Alonzo, too, but he took it all in stride, never one to be deterred by a reluctant girl he was determined to catch. In fact, she suspected he loved the challenge, and the challenge was the only reason he was even interested. Oh, Alonzo, we are so not suited to each other. But you've never given me a chance. A drink after work tonight. Just one. I promise I won't make a pass at you. Jessica gave a small laugh. <sighs> you do know that I didn't break up with James, right? But when you sent him away with a broken heart and an expensive ring, it's the same thing, isn't it? Annoyingly, he had a point. Oh, come on, just for fun. You badly need to relax. A few other dancers are coming too, so no pressure. We won't call it a date. It's only Wednesday, and there's a good band playing somewhere near Charter Street. My mood is terrible. I'll just depress everyone. Listen, Chica, Alonzo said sternly. You need to get out and take your mind off work and men, and spend it with someone who knows how to dance the rumba right. He held out his hand in a Latin flourish. All right already, Jessica finally said. One drink, a soda, 
and one dance, just so nobody can say I'm a party pooper. Alonzo took her hand to help her rise from the floor, but she hastily dropped it before he could get any ideas. Jessica did not want anyone at the dance company thinking they were starting a relationship. Even if she and James were over, and that was debatable, Jessica didn't have the time or emotional strength to put into a new relationship so soon. Her passion for dance demanded hard work and all of her heart and soul. That she could commit to. At least for now. Men could be so difficult. They wanted to change things up when life was perfectly content. Why couldn't James relax? They were still so young, not even close to 30 yet. Jessica had her best dancing years ahead of her. Driving home, Jessica tried to shove James out of her mind, determined to put aside her heartache, including the unanswered questions that went along with him. After showering, she dressed in tights, a skirt, and a pair of good black heels for dancing, a red blouse and a loose black jacket with a scarf finished off the outfit. A few others from the company were already at the Blue Nile when Jessica arrived. It was a small cafe with shadowy wall sconces, dark wooden tables flickering with candles, and a tiny dance floor. A small crowd gathered around the bar ordering drinks and talking most of them from the dance company. Jessica was surprised to see Sierra Armstrong there, the principal ballerina. I didn't think you went slumming, she told the other girl, trying to turn it into a cute quip, but it came out strained and petulant. You're just too much for words, aren't you, Jessica? She muttered coolly. Just because I'm principal doesn't mean I can't be friends with the other dancers. Don't be a snob, Alonzo murmured into Jessica's ear, passing her a glass of red wine. She glared at him, pushing it away. Jessica hadn't taken a drink since Michael was killed in the car accident, and she had told Alonzo many times that she didn't drink. She supposed her actions towards Sierra were snobbish, but Jessica just clenched her teeth and tried to smile pleasantly. No need to bring more attention to a stupid remark. Besides, the din of conversation and music in the cafe covered up the faux pas. For some reason, she was upset with Sierra and upset at herself, but she couldn't pinpoint why she felt irritated. Sierra and her boyfriend, Justin Irwin, on vacation from his position at the Martha Graham Dance Company in New York, were too perfect for the lower-class rungs of the dance hierarchy the rest of them clung to— Sierra and Justin outclassed the troupe in looks and skill. Just being in a social setting with Sierra was like having Jessica's nose rubbed in the woman's talent. She got enough envy flowing through her veins every day at work watching Sierra's perfect figure, long neck, and precision moves. Why would Jessica socialize with a girl she was insanely jealous of? Sierra might be a perfectly nice person, but Jessica's envy got the better of her, which meant that when they were in a social setting, she didn't know how to act around her. Sierra represented all the dreams Jessica wanted to achieve, but probably never would. Jessica realized that she was sour grapes, and jealousy made her ungrateful for her own talents, as well as rude. Perhaps she had been away from church too long. It was making her an angry, frustrated person. Maybe that was the reason she and James were having trouble. He was too good for her, by far, and she didn't deserve him. Alonzo tore the napkin Jessica was clinging to from her grip and tossed it onto the table. Come, ma chérie, he said. Let's dance away our cares. Fine, Jessica said, moving her glass of Coke into the center of the table. Alonzo's hand was warm around hers when she took it. Cold hands, warm heart, Jess, he said in a low voice. What are you implying? Just observing that you must be nervous or uncomfortable. Your fingers are like ice. 
But I know your heart is warm inside that splendid body of yours. Jessica sighed. Do you ever give up, Alonzo? He shook his head. No. <laughs> and then he laughed, and the moment passed when he pressed his fingers against the small of Jessica's back to lead her in a slow foxtrot to warm up to the music. Feeling my inadequacy, I suppose? Jessica shot a glance at Sierra and her boyfriend dancing slow and tight across the floor. Sierra curled her fingers around Justin's long hair, smiling at him languidly. Their lips moved in a conversation meant only for them. Jessica idly wondered what they talked about. Ignore her, ma chérie, Alonzo ordered. We're here to dance. Focus on me. Look into my eyes. I won't lead you astray. Is that a promise? His palm was gentle against her back, and Jessica automatically turned. I look at her and know I'll never be half the dancer she is. That is not true. Alonzo shot back. She's had better teachers coming from Chicago than you've ever had. Your little hick town in Wyoming. Montana, Jessica said automatically. Montana, he repeated. A town of 3,000 doesn't prepare you for a big city company. But here you are, holding your own, getting better, being rewarded with a raise this year. I'd call that success. And you have talent. I can see it. And so can Maddox, our fearless director. Jessica made a noise in her throat, not conceding his points. She wasn't ready to let go of her childish petulance. Will I ever be principal female dancer? A dream that even accomplished girls might never achieve. What makes me think I'll be in that one percent? Alonzo's hand slipped around her waist. Sierra isn't the principal dancer in New York, or San Francisco, or Atlanta. She's not even prima ballerina in her hometown of Chicago. Think about that, Jessica. She halted on the dance floor and stared at him. This guy had just made another good point. Maybe I've underestimated you, Alonzo. No, I like to hear that, he said, his eyes lighting up. Forget the gloom and doom now, my pet. Let's dance. This is a good song coming up. My Latin roots are begging us to let go. Chapter 6 Turned out Alonzo was right. He did dance a mean Roomba. The guy had Latin hips, moving perfectly to the rhythm, as though he was communing with the music and the floor below his feet in a swoony romance. Ava showed up right when they were getting into the swing of the Roomba, staring daggers at Jessica the entire time. She tried not to let the girl rattle her and hoped Alonzo would dance with Ava at least once. Alonzo suddenly missed a step and then Jessica missed a turn, and it reminded her of goofing around with Sam. She and her brother used to turn on the music in the living room full blast while she'd teach him a few ballet moves. Then Sam would teach Jessica the latest line dances they were doing at the high school. Jessica missed her brother. Out of everyone in Snow Valley, she missed Sam the most. Their late-night talks, cravings for Big C burgers and milkshakes, eating raw cookie dough with spoons until their mother swatted them away, hiking the mountains in jeans and hoodies when the spring wildflowers bloomed. Snow Valley was a whole other world from New Orleans, and of course, Jessica missed a few other things, although she kept James close to her heart. She missed him painfully. They hadn't even had a decent telephone conversation since he'd left the previous Saturday, and the longer time passed, the harder it was going to be to have a normal conversation that wasn't completely awkward. Texting was so much easier, but hard on a relationship. I need water, Jessica finally gasped, out of breath from the fast number. 
Of course, she was exaggerating, but Alonzo did a final twirl and dip, his face coming dangerously close to hers. For a moment, Jessica held her breath, wondering just how close he was going to tempt her to slap his face, but then he merely smiled and brought her back to a standing position. After you, my dear, he said, sweeping his arm into a bow as the music changed into a sugary pop number by the Spice Girls. Ah, you're speaking good old boring English again. Once the Roomba is over, there's nothing much left to say, he said with a shrug. Only emotions to feel. A dark corner with wine and stolen kisses. Jessica quirked an eyebrow at him. Dream on, buddy. I assure you, I will. His voice was low, and honestly, Jessica didn't know what to make of it. Did Alonzo say these things merely for show, or did he actually mean them? That was an unnerving thought. You do know I have a serious boyfriend. Of course. But if you were that serious, you'd be wearing his ring, or you'd be in Snowy Valley with him right now. That is so sexist, Alonzo. Jessica punched him lightly on the arm, but she was getting annoyed. Women can have careers and not have to be in the same town as their man. Inwardly, she wondered, why couldn't James be here in New Orleans? Jessica desperately wanted him to be closer, but she also knew it wasn't fair to ask him to give up his career either. Touché, Alonzo admitted, but dancing is temporary, especially for a woman who wants a home and a family. Who says I want a home and family? That's my mother, and I vowed long ago to never become my mother. What if you break a leg and can't dance anymore? What if you want to have a baby? They had approached the table where the rest of the company was sitting, but hers and Alonzo's voices were so loud the entire group lifted their heads to stare at them. I'll have a baby later, Jessica said firmly, lifting her hand and greeting. Maybe I don't need children to be fulfilled. Dance is my life, my romance, and my family. She was just being ornery because Alonzo was asking difficult questions she had no desire to discuss with him. Tell that to an empty apartment when you're 35 and need arch surgery because you've destroyed your feet, Monica said, sipping from a glass of red wine. She was part of the corps de ballet and an excellent dancer. Jessica was surprised at her pessimism. Are you telling us you're harboring secret motherly ambitions? She asked, but only half kidding. Monica shrugged, but Sierra interrupted the girl before she could answer. Take your calcium, eat your vegetables, and always do two hours of stretching. Then, if you're lucky, you won't need leg, foot, knee, or ankle surgery down the road. Well, that's a lot of negative assumptions to make, Jessica began. Hey, life happens, Monica quickly interjected, staring at Sierra. Jessica saw the glint of envy in her eyes, too, and it startled her. Did Jessica look at Sierra in the same envious manner Monica looked at her? With fear in her eyes of being relegated to the ensemble dancers forever, only to live a life of obscurity in an empty apartment? Perhaps not at 35, but at 40 or 50. Don't let life just happen, Monica, Sierra told the girl firmly. Direct it yourself. Be determined. Be creative and work hard. Yeah, just like all the other thousands of dancers in the world, Eric muttered under his breath. He slouched against the cushion bench, a beer in his hand. He winked at Jessica and slurped past the foam overflowing the mug's rim. She gave him a small smile. He was right. A dancer could work their brains and muscles to pieces and never get past the first level of pay and prestige in a professional company. As with any creative arts, there were no guarantees of success, let alone mega recognition or lead roles. After all, there was only one Mikhail Baryshnikov, only one Anna Pavlova, one Martha Graham. Now take me, for example, Sierra said, commanding everyone's attention. 
I don't plan on ever marrying or having children. It would totally ruin my dancing career. Jessica couldn't help cringing a little bit. The girl sounded like she had from just a few minutes ago. But when she heard her own words coming out of Sierra's mouth, it sounded so... so selfish. Was that just Jessica's upbringing of a small church-going town where the families tended to be larger? The people of Snow Valley loved children, adored their kids, and spent a lot of time with them. Kids helped on the farms and ranches, too. Thinking about the families she personally knew, Jessica realized that the people of her hometown were the epitome of unselfishness. Their families were their focus and embodied their thoughts, hopes, and dreams. They didn't need to have high-powered careers and recognition to love, to be fulfilled, and to be happy. Women can't take a year off and regain the time they lost, Sierra went on, driving her point home. Or the body. Physique is everything in ballet, Monica said unhappily. Female dancers try to pretend that aspect doesn't exist, but it does, Jessica had to admit. Whether we like it or not, wider hips and bigger-boned women don't work in ballet. It isn't part of the look. The smaller and lighter, the better on stage. Lifts are easier, too. Especially for the guys, Eric said, and Alonzo laughed in agreement. The other reason your ballet career is over after childbirth is because even a slim woman spreads, Sierra went on. The weight redistributes. No longer are you thin and lithe on stage. It's a fact that women who've born children look more womanly. That works in belly dancing, Monica mused, wiggling her eyebrows. Hmm, Alonzo said, leaning back. That brings up an interesting question. A sexy belly dancer or a ballerina? Which would I choose if I had a choice? They're not sexy, Jessica contradicted. They're sensuous. Same thing, Alonzo said with a grin. Jessica rolled her eyes. You're impossible. I love it when you roll your eyes at me, Alonzo said. I try to get you to do it at least five times a day. So you haven't grown up since your 15th birthday? She got you there, Eric said, raising his glass to Jessica. Sierra and Justin leaned in close, making eyes at one another. We've already made the decision that once our professional careers slow down in 20 years, we'll open our own company and offer a mix of both modern and ballet. No room for babies. Children take you away from your life's work. I'll dance somehow, some way, until I die. While Jessica stared at Sierra, her thoughts skittered off into strange territory. At the end of her life, Sierra would be surrounded by cases full of programs and awards with her name on them, alone in a cold apartment. After Justin had long deserted her for a younger dancer. She was truly getting melancholy now. She missed James deeply, with an ache that spread through her chest. Jessica sighed, wishing she could order a tall, ice-cold Dr. Pepper. But she was trying to cut back on the soda and caffeine. Terrible for a dancer's bones and energy level, but she still craved it like a kid in a candy store. A waiter came by and Jessica asked for ice water. Ice water? Alonzo said. That's so boring. You know I don't drink any kind of alcohol. One Coke a day is probably one too many. Doesn't leave many choices. Jessica is very wise, Sierra said sagely, nodding her head. Water is best. Dancers need to keep hydrated for stamina and to flush out the toxins of all the hours of exercise we do. Sierra was a walking, talking, obsessive woman whose every thought was health and dance. She was starting to get a little boring. I'd like to order the variety platter of appetizers. Alonzo said to the waiter. And another beer, Eric said, raising his still half-full glass. Jessica glanced at him questioningly, but he didn't respond. Just eyed her. Jessica was curious what that look meant, but she didn't ask with the listening ears of the group surrounding them. 
Finally, Eric leaned forward, speaking so that only Jessica could hear. Probably gonna get cut from Swan Lake, he said in his endearing Louisiana accent. Oh no, she told him, placing a hand briefly on his. Her stomach sank. The threat of getting cut from a performance was the worst thing that could happen to a dancer. It usually led to an actual firing from the company. And once you were fired from a ballet company, that was often the end of your career. Very few dancers were hired by another company unless they hired a private teacher for a lot of money and then worked their derrieres off to bring their skill level up to audition for a new position somewhere else. Many dancers ended up in privately funded troops or veered off in a different genre of dance altogether, such as modern or jazz, or teaching kids. Maddox took me aside this morning for another lecture, Eric went on, dejected. I'm not growing, not improving, he said. Said he's already been scouting out new dancers to take my spot. That's awful, Eric. I'm so sorry. Having endless talks with the company manager was the worst. We all want raises, Eric mumbled, when the platter of appetizers arrived along with fresh drinks. The tortilla chips and spinach dip, barbecue buffalo wings, sliders, and taquitos with hot sauce smelled fabulous. Some kind of job security. Most of all, we want to move up the ranks so that we can dance the coveted lead roles. Eric snorted. <laughs> our names on the program with our bios and pictures. I've wanted that since I was a kid. Been taking dance classes since I was seven. I'm so sorry, Jessica said again. Perhaps this company isn't the right fit. Don't kill yourself and your spirit by trying to force Vernon Maddox's hand. Have you ever thought about focusing on tap instead? Eric drained his beer and leaned his head back against the cushion seat. You're really sweet, Jess, but I haven't tapped since high school. It would take a couple years to get back up to speed. Sometimes there wasn't an easy solution visible on the horizon. Every dancer had to figure out their path, but if she said those things, they would sound like platitudes. The last thing Eric wanted to hear right now. Her cell phone buzzed in her purse. With the noise of the music and the conversation, Jessica wouldn't have known, except that her handbag was sitting on her lap. She pulled it out, her stomach rising into her throat, hoping it was James. It wasn't. It was her mother, calling from Snow Valley on a Wednesday night. Mrs. Mason never did that, always Sunday evening for exactly 30 minutes. Hey guys, Jessica announced, rising from the table. I gotta take this. Moms, you know... She pressed the talk button and headed down a quieter hallway toward the ladies' room. You mean your snowy crevice, Mama? <laughs> Sierra said with a laugh. Jessica wanted to slap the smile off the girl's face. Her sharp edge was really starting to annoy her. Ignoring Sierra's comment, she held up the phone, speaking while she walked. Hi, Mom, what's up? Hello, sweetheart, how are you? Her mother's voice came through. I'm fine. What's up? Are you busy? I know how busy you are all the time. I'm out with friends from the company. It's Wednesday night, you know. Ha <laughs> ha. I know what day it is, she said lightly. Not senile yet. I wasn't implying that, Mom. I know I don't usually call midweek, but I wanted you to hear this from me, not through the gossip grapevine of Snow Valley. Mom, is everything okay? Now Jessica was worried. Is Dad okay? Sam? Oh, yes, they're both perfectly fine, and bribing me into making brownies, but that's neither here nor there. Mother, just tell me. My friends are waiting. Jessica heard her mother's breath catch. Are you on a date? No. A pause. No! If you were, James would be heartbroken. You know, he didn't seem the same the past couple of Sundays. Distracted a little, perhaps a bit sad. Was her mother making that up, or reading too much into a couple of thoughtful sighs during a sermon? You two didn't have a fight, did you? No. 
Not exactly, Jessica said to herself. She certainly hadn't planned on telling her parents that James had proposed and she'd turned him down. It was too complicated to explain to herself, let alone them. Besides, it was none of their business, even though they had an inkling, especially after James had spoken to her father. Maybe Sierra was right. A dancer didn't have time for a husband, let alone a family. But Jessica didn't want to die old and alone. Well, she'd have Sam as her best friend. Maybe. Her younger brother would probably marry James's younger sister, Lydia, whom he'd been dating for over a year now. They'd live happily ever after and have ten adorable and perfect children. She could be the favorite aunt. Jessica suddenly wanted to cry. That was stupid. She was living her dream. She had everything she'd ever wanted. But for some inexplicable and infuriating reason... She wanted James, too. She needed James. Without him, her life would be far emptier, the hole in her heart growing larger. Mother, she said now, taking a deep breath, what am I going to hear through the grapevine that's such a secret? It's not a secret at all. Something sad. And something also puzzling. Spill it, please, before I turn a year older. Cute, Jess, very cute. Even her mother could be sarcastic. Aunt Sophie passed away earlier today. Aunt Sophie? You mean Sophie Morris? Jessica wasn't expecting that. What happened? Diabetic shock, poor thing. You know, she was only diagnosed last December. I think she had trouble checking her blood sugar. She collapsed at home, and Eli called an ambulance, but she was already in a coma, and never came out of it. It was all very difficult, but they say she didn't suffer too much, so please don't fret about that, sweetheart. We're all sad, of course, and we'll miss her terrible, but she's in a better place now. Sophie Morris wasn't actually Jessica's aunt, but everyone in Snow Valley called her that, She was probably the town's oldest living citizen, a landmark, an icon. But Sophie Morris was her mother's second cousin. The funeral is this Saturday, the 19th, at the church, of course. Of course, Jessica repeated like a robot. I'm really sorry to hear this. Everyone in town loved Aunt Sophie. I always try to visit her when I'm home. She bit at her lips, trying to keep the burning in her eyes at bay. I hope it's a nice service. Briefly, she wondered which pastor would conduct the funeral services. Pastor John or James? You'll be able to see the funeral service for yourself, Jessica. Why would I do that? I can't suddenly fly home. Not when Swan Lake premieres in two weeks. Besides, I can't afford a last-minute ticket. I'm afraid you have to. The lawyer is coming. Now Jessica was really confused. What lawyer? What are you talking about? Aunt Sophie's lawyer showed up at your father's dental office within hours of the sad news. He said your presence is required at the reading of Sophie's will. You've been named a beneficiary. She's left something to you. Chapter 7 James changed out the church sign on the street every week. After rearranging the letters, he stepped back to make sure he didn't need a spell checker. God wants full custody, not just weekend visits. Hmm. Uncle John liked this sign, but for some reason it made James think of April Murphy, the newly widowed young woman at church. Now that she had 24-7 custody of her three-year-old daughter, Daphne. James couldn't even imagine losing a spouse in such a tragic, violent death, even if the man had died a hero serving the country. The shock of the suddenness must be devastating. A member of the military at your front door. He pictured April receiving the news, falling to her knees, falling apart. 
Or would she have stood stoically until the military officials left and then collapsed? Widowhood at such a young age and with a child who would never remember her father. A shiver came over him and he pulled his black scarf tighter around his neck from the brisk spring wind. Sudden thoughts of losing Jessica to such an end filled his mind. He wouldn't be able to stand it if anything happened to her. But maybe he'd have to stand it. He and Jessica were only speaking occasionally now. Even then, their phone calls had become significantly briefer and more awkward. It never occurred to James that asking her to marry him would produce such a negative effect. He'd never expected her to say no. He'd pictured himself going home the happiest man in the world and shouting it to the world. The entire situation made him unbearably sad and helpless to know what to do about it. Last week, he and the young men from church had helped Mrs. Murphy unload the moving van into her newly rented apartment. Stacks of boxes filled each room, black marker clearly appropriating them for the kitchen, living room, master suite, and Daphne's room. April Murphy had then invited James to dinner the next night. She'd served homemade lasagna, a healthy green salad with pecans and blue cheese, his favorite, and the best cheesy French bread he'd ever eaten in his life, followed by warm apple pie and ice cream. Maybe you should open a bakery, he quipped, the tender apples melting in his mouth. At first, he'd been startled by the dinner invitation, but April had insisted she wanted to show her appreciation for all the help he and John had given her and Daphne. Although she hadn't invited his uncle or the pastor's wife, or the teens who had unloaded the moving van in short order. A plate of cookies is more than enough thanks, he'd told her with a laugh. I love to cook, and I'll bet you don't get many home-cooked meals, April had said, calling attention to his bachelorhood status in a not-so-subtle way. Her manner in person was unassuming, quiet, almost peaceful. So different from Jessica Mason, who kept him on his toes. When he was with Jessica, he never knew what to expect, and that was exciting. But maybe a pastor didn't need exciting. Maybe he needed stability and order. Do you think you'll be happy here in Snow Valley? He'd asked after helping her do the dishes. It's a lot smaller than Billings. You're happy here, aren't you? April had asked, not really answering his question. Have to admit, it did take me a few months to adjust to small-town living. Small-town gossip? April said with a knowing smile. He just laughed. <laughs> there is that. But mostly kind and caring people. Plus, the job potential was good. He added with a wry smile. I'd rather be a pastor in a small town as opposed to the big city congregations where there are thousands of faces but no names. I've got a degree in counseling as well as ministry. I had just finished a business degree, going to school at nights, when Roy was... Well, you know. She finished quietly. My deepest condolences, Mrs. Murphy, James said. I'm sure you've had an enormous adjustment to go through at the same time you're grieving your husband. Oh, please call me April, she chided. You make me feel like I'm 40. Where did you go to school? Got my undergrad at Montana State University. That's where my brother attended. He played football. Lane West, lineman. Small world. I probably watched him play. I went to all the games. I can't imagine a pastor having keg parties, April said with a grin. James laughed. <laughs> I hung out with the kids who went to church. After a short stint at medical school, I attended Montana Bible College in Bozeman, studying for a pastoral degree as well as courses in biblical counseling and outdoor discipleship. I like doing things with the youth. I can see that in you, April said, watching him. There was a pause, and then James added, If you ever want to talk about your husband and what happened, please don't hesitate to call upon me or John. 
She nodded, picking at a thread in the quilt flung across the back of the couch. I appreciate that. Some days I'm driven and know exactly what I want to do, and other days I'm completely lost and scared. A surge of sympathy for the young woman came over James. Moving is a big change, too, all in the same few months. I'm sure your parents are concerned about you and Daphne. I suppose so. <laughs> she gave a brief caustic laugh. But my parents are actually getting a divorce. After 30 years. I almost took that harder than Roy's death. That's why I came to Snow Valley. I couldn't handle their problems on top of my own. I didn't like Daphne having to listen to them fight over how to split their finances and household belongings. Everything from my childhood. Like it had no value or sentiment at all. James let out his breath in a low whistle. Wow, I'm so sorry. That's rough. You're going to think I'm the most pathetic person on the planet now. Please don't feel sorry for me, Pastor James. I'll get through it one day at a time. He nodded, admiring her strength. I have a feeling you will, April. Except at midnight. She added softly. She lifted her eyes and they latched onto James's face. That's when Roy used to call when he was overseas. The time difference worked then. It was his lunch hour except when he had duty. You seem like a strong person, James told her, hoping his words gave her some measure of comfort. We're even stronger with God's help. She tucked her bare feet under the cushion on the homely couch. Spoken like a true pastor. Ah, sorry, it's in my nature. No apologies, Pastor James. I could use more religion in my life right now. Sometimes I feel as though all I have is hope to cling to. Hope is a very good place to start. And you can call me James. He added, The title during a social call does feel a bit strange. Maybe I'll get used to it when I'm forty. She gave him an intuitive gaze. You were always the good guy, huh? We all have our moments, even future pastors. He changed the subject. What sort of job are you looking for? I don't know of any ranches for sale that might be in your price range, he said jokingly but I'd only recommend that if you adore horses and manure. April laughed. <laughs> Me and horses don't have a relationship, unfortunately. At least not yet. I wanted a horse when I was ten, but my parents said a big, fat, no way. I wailed and carried on for a few months and eventually gave up when they didn't budge. As far as jobs, I was thinking perhaps a life insurance business using my business degree— I don't think it takes too long to get certified in insurance, and it's flexible hours. I could even work from home. James leaned forward, arms on his knees. Snow Valley could probably use an insurance broker, actually. Life insurance, house insurance, that sort of thing. There are fees and exams, but I'm a quick study. Before April could continue, a small cry came from the rear bedroom. April sat up straight, leaning backwards to glance down the dim hallway where a nightlight shone. A moment later, Daphne toddled out in a frilly nightgown imprinted with Princess Ariel on the front. Her red hair spread out around her as though she were underwater. Mommy, where were you? I wanted you to tuck me in. I'm talking to Pastor James from church. Remember him? We met him last Sunday. He helped us bring all our furniture and boxes into our new house. He even set up your bed for you. This isn't a house, Mama, Daphne said matter-of-factly, climbing onto the couch to curl into her mother's lap. Well, no, you're right. It's called an apartment, but it's our home now. Daphne tucked her head into the crook of her mother's arm and stuck her finger into her mouth. I want to go back to Grandma and Grandpa's house. Gently, April pulled her daughter's finger from her mouth and kissed it. Sometimes I wish that too, sweetie, but we're in a new town, and we're going to make new friends. In a few days, 
You're going to go to a fun school while Mommy looks for a job. Don't want to go to school. You'll make lots of friends, play games, do painting and Play-Doh. You'll love it, sweetheart. Not gonna love it, Daphne insisted, sticking her finger back into her mouth. April lifted her daughter up into her arms. Right now, you're going back to bed. We'll talk about it tomorrow. James rose from the couch, too. I'm headed home. You don't have to go, April said quickly. She'll fall asleep soon. It's later than I realized, and there is a youth group I have to prep for tomorrow. Plus the Easter pageant practice after school. I'm rounding up sets to paint. Lots of cardboard. He made a face, pretending agony. April laughed in sympathy. <laughs> Sounds like teenager torture. They'll want to be fed, too. Kids are always hungry. I've been getting baptized with teenagers this past year. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Some days it feels like I'm drowning. I'll bet you're great with them. Daphne whined and April shushed her. Lie down with her and tell her a story, James suggested. She needs her mom right now. Unfortunately, I wish I could clone myself. James stroked the back of Daphne's head. Good night, Daphne. I'll see you again at church, okay? The little girl just stared at him without speaking. She looked exhausted. Can you say good night, sweetheart? Daphne vigorously shook her head. I'll see myself out, April. I'm sorry, she told him, cocking her head at her offspring. I was enjoying the adult conversation. Someone to talk out my plans with. Let me know if you need to do it again. And thank you for the wonderful dinner. Anytime, James, April said. Good night. When James slid into his car that night, an unsettled sensation burned in his gut. April Murphy was a nice woman and a good mother. He admired her for setting out on her own with goals to make a new life, to provide for her daughter without her parents' help and become independent, if independence was truly her goal. She obviously didn't want him to leave, even though it had been nearly two hours. James would have to be careful not to go to her house alone very often. It might get the neighbors gossiping. He tried not to read too much into the dinner and evening because April hadn't had a chance to make friends here in Snow Valley yet. But she would. Later at home, he'd called Jessica. Once again, she seemed distracted and tired. Swan Lake is taking a toll on you, he said sympathetically. You sound a bit breathless, too. Oh, a group of us went out after work tonight. No big deal. Just tired. Getting ready for bed right now. First dress rehearsal is coming up. Are you worried about the choreography? You looked perfect when I was there two weeks ago. Her smile came through the phone. You always think I perform the steps perfectly. No, I think you're perfect, James said in a meaningful voice. In every possible way. Jessica laughed, and James felt as though she was brushing him off. It's a good thing you're not a newspaper critic. Maddox has been coming down hard on Eric lately. If Eric gets cut or fired, we all have something to be worried about. That's too bad. I hope it works out for him. Eric was the last subject James wanted to talk about, but somehow Jessica had smoothly managed to change the subject. There was a pause, and then Jessica said, The dancers had an interesting conversation tonight, especially Sierra Armstrong. You should stop comparing yourself to her, James said, wishing she was there with him, live and in the flesh, and in his arms. You both have strengths. Sierra might be precision perfect, but you dance with heart, Jessica. The conversation tonight wasn't actually about dancing, at least not in particular. It was about families and marriage and having children. James's throat clenched. His palms began to sweat, and he switched the phone to his other ear. Was this it? Was Jessica officially breaking up with him? 
She vowed not to ever get married or have children. She said that when art called to you, a person should respond and give their life to it. What's your opinion? As much as James didn't want to ask the question, he had to know where he stood. He had to know if there was still any hope for a future with this crazy girl he loved. Well, Monica didn't exactly agree, Jessica said vaguely. He tried to keep his voice light. I didn't ask about Monica's opinion. Sierra said she didn't believe artists needed to get married. They needed to be free to express themselves, not tied down or committed to a relationship that could become stagnant and stifling. Once again, Jessica avoided the unspoken question. The real question that stood between them. Huh, that's pretty extreme. What does her New York boyfriend think about that? He seemed perfectly fine, but he didn't actually say much. Well, you know what I think about that. Couples living together. It's not what I believe. I don't think it's the healthiest thing for a relationship. More couples break up after they live together, and the Bible says, You don't have to preach to me, James Douglas. Jessica cut in. I know what the Bible says. James cleared his throat. I'm not sure where we're headed with this conversation, sweetheart. Actually, I don't either. Hey, I have an early call to go over the partnering I'm doing with Alonzo. I gotta go to bed. I'll talk to you tomorrow, okay? Okay, James said slowly. When Jessica was done talking, she was done talking. I won't keep you. Good luck. Save me a ticket for Swan Lake, will you? You want to come back down here? I've been planning on it. It's your biggest role so far. I wouldn't miss it. Please don't feel obligated, she said, her voice trailing off. I know it's a long way to come and a lot of money for the airline ticket. James tried to suck in a breath of air. Are you trying to get rid of me? Because if so, you're doing a really good job of it. You're scared off that easily? All of a sudden, Jessica sounded indignant, and, if James's ears were working right, there was a hint of hurt in her voice. Was she testing him? Of course not. He tried to think of a softer way to say what was on his mind. We need to talk, Jess. Really, talk. The phone is terrible. I need to see you in person. I miss you. Okay, Jessica said quietly. We'll figure out a weekend. I really have to go now or I'll be dead on my feet at 5 a.m. Good night, my sweet Jess. The phone clicked and James groaned. She was killing him. Literally killing him. Chapter 8 When James got off the phone... He turned out the apartment lights and walked robotically towards his bed. Falling onto the mattress, he turned on the television. Staring numbly at the screen, he tried to figure out the subtle innuendos of the brief conversation he'd just had with Jessica. He almost wished Lydia hadn't gone to bed yet. She'd be a distraction from the worry circling his brain. His sister had registered for spring track and got up early to run. He was going to miss her when she took off for college in August. James didn't want to think about how lonely the house would be without Lydia, even if her busy senior year already took her away from home most of the time. At least, they still had a few of their late-night talks on the weekends. James was tired of being alone. He wanted to be married. It was time. Not getting any answers, James heaved himself out of bed and headed to the dark kitchen. He poured himself a soda and snatched a bag of Doritos from the cupboard, ripping it open. Diving into the snack food with gusto, James munched and refilled his large glass mindlessly for almost an hour. He and Jessica had gone from the topic of marriage and babies to the disturbing one of artists living together, and then ending with her chiding him not to preach at her. Jessica was sensitive about religion and church after her childhood sweetheart had been killed in an automobile accident almost six years earlier. 
She was still finding her way back to her faith. At the end of an hour, James had eaten the entire bag of chips and drunk nearly a liter of Coke. His eyes glazed over as he switched between channels of news, old movies, and inane game shows. When he glanced at the clock, it was after midnight. Which made him suddenly think of April Murphy and her husband's telephone calls when he was stationed overseas. Was midnight a difficult time of the night for her? Did she lie in bed with good memories or with tears rolling down her face? That ballet dancer Sierra Armstrong was a spoiled brat. He wanted to wring her pretty little neck. James hated the thought that she was influencing Jessica away from marriage and a family. Mostly, he hated the thought that he was losing Jessica forever. James chided himself for having uncharitable thoughts toward the woman who was Jess's nemesis. He wished Jessica would confide in him and tell him what she was truly thinking. Then they could deal with it, figure it out, work it out together. But man, it would be easier to live with someone like April Murphy, who wasn't having a crisis of faith or a crisis of marriage a woman who obviously believed in marriage and family. James wondered what April was doing right then, and if Daphne had finally settled into bed. Or did April bring her daughter into bed with her to cuddle and comfort each other? He could picture the sadness and loneliness the two shared. Life could be so unfair. It was one of the most frustrating aspects of most people's lives— The question of why bad things happen to good people. Why did God allow death and pain and suffering to his children? Why did someone like April have to go through the loss of her true love and now raise their child alone at the tender age of 25? When James stared off across the bedroom, shafts of light from the street lamp shone through the curtains falling across the nightstand and onto his set of scriptures— He needed to start reading up on the Easter themes, but right now, he felt a deep sense of empathy for April Murphy. Hopefully, she would soon make friends here in Snow Valley, find work and some semblance of peace. Did April's life include him? Of course, he did as her pastor, but right now, a strange idea was coming over him. Was God bringing them together for more than just a relationship between a shepherd caring for a member of his flock? The timing was disconcerting. Meeting April only two weeks after Jessica turned down his marriage proposal? James punched a pillow, stuck it behind his neck, and checked his phone for the tenth time. Jessica hadn't called back, and the disappointment hit him in the gut, harder than he expected. When she needed her sleep, Jessica went to bed no matter what else was going on. The demanding work of dancing as well as the stress to perform up to par with the other dancers took its toll on her physically and psychologically. But did Jess actually sleep, James wondered? Or did she lie awake fretting like he did? He had a sudden intense craving to be with her to hold her close and give her the confidence she often seemed to question. Could he convince Jessica that she could have her career and family both? With him? Perhaps he was hoping for something that was impossible. Maybe he was the one living in a fantasy world because there were no answers to the logistics of marrying Jessica. A sudden pounding on the front door startled him. Who's knocking on my door at this time of night? James jumped up, threw a shirt over his head, and pulled on a pair of sweats, knocking over the empty plastic bottle of Coke and scattering the crumbs from the empty chips bag all over the floor. He'd clean it up later. At this rate, he wasn't going to be very useful tomorrow, that was for sure. Especially with a caffeine headache. When he opened the front door, Pastor John was standing on the doorstep. Uncle John, what are you doing here? Then quickly he added, Is something wrong, Aunt Cora? Cora's fine, John said, spreading his hand toward the entryway. James opened the door wider. 
Sorry, come in, come in. The older man stepped through and they sat down in the dusky living room while James turned on a few lights. Can I get you something to drink? No, no, I was just wondering if you'd received my messages. You mean phone messages? His uncle nodded and James jogged into the bedroom and retrieved his phone. Sure enough, there was a missed call from earlier that evening and a more recent text message. Sorry, I'm not sure how I missed these. I was at April Murphy's house earlier for dinner. His uncle raised an eyebrow. She wanted to do something to say thank you after we helped her move. Oh, there was a group of you then for dinner? Well, no, James admitted lamely. Uncle John gave a half smile. I'm not here to lecture a grown man on his social life, but I will be nosy and tell you to be careful. Mrs. Murphy is fragile right now. Keep it professional. You also don't want anyone gossiping. I understand. Don't worry, James assured him, even as a twinge of guilt pricked his conscience when he thought about what he'd been ruminating over in his mind about the young widow and God's timing. What's so important that you came out at this time of night? he asked, changing the subject. Sophie Morris passed away earlier. You haven't heard about it through the grapevine? No, but the people I've been with today didn't know her. Cora spent the afternoon over at the Morris home. Then Cora got a phone call from her sister in Oregon to say that their older sister isn't doing well. The Alzheimer's has gotten worse, and she's in the hospital now with organ failure. James blinked his eyes and sat back heavily. Wow, that's a lot of news to take in all at once. Any word on funeral arrangements for Sophie Morris? Boy, she's sure loved in Snow Valley. The family wants to do it before Easter, of course, so it will be this coming Saturday at ten. That shouldn't be a problem. Yes, but it does interfere with my schedule— I already put Cora on a plane for Portland, and even though I'm going to sit tight for a couple of days while she keeps me updated, they don't expect her sister to last more than a few days, which puts me out of town for Sophie's funeral. What his Uncle John was saying suddenly sank in. You want me to do the funeral. When it rains, it often pours, Pastor James. You'll learn that soon enough when you're in charge of an entire congregation— Alone. Frown lines etched around his eyes and mouth. With his graying hair becoming more pronounced every year, the elder minister suddenly looked every bit of his sixty-one years. Any wedding scheduled? James gave a small smile, thinking about the month's sermons he'd need to take over, the Easter pageant, and now a funeral to conduct. But it should all be over before Jessica's opening night in April. He made a mental note to check into flights and get a seat reserved. No weddings are on the books except for May at the moment. And hopefully no surprise weddings, John added, trying to lighten the mood. James gave a small snort. I don't think Sam and Lydia plan on eloping. He paused, suddenly disconcerted. But I may need to come up with a plan to ward off the possibility... His uncle laughed, quieting when he discerned his nephew's sudden sobering. James caught Pastor John staring at him with an odd look on his face. You sure you don't want a drink? A cup of coffee? I've got cookies, too, out of a package. Sounds good, but I'd be pacing the floor until dawn. There was a pause, and then his uncle asked, Anything on your mind, James? It's not like you to miss calls and messages. Sinking deeper into his armchair, James leaned his head back to stare up at the ceiling. Nothing I can do a darn thing about. Jessica, he asked carefully. James's eyes narrowed. How'd you guess? When a man mopes around, it's usually a woman. I'm not moping, at least not exactly, frustrated with no solution in sight. There's always a solution. Often it just takes time to find it. James clasped his hands around the back of his neck. He had to talk to someone, and his uncle was unbiased and non-judgmental. 
Remember when I admitted to you that I asked Jess to marry me when I was there two weeks ago? Uncle John nodded. Yep, and it didn't go like you'd planned. How are things between you now? Well, I'm not the happiest man in Snow Valley right now, to put it mildly. I'm sorry, son, that hurts. Too late, I'm realizing that I put her in a hard spot. What's she supposed to say? Yes, I'll give up all my life's dreams to marry you and live in Snow Valley and be completely miserable for the rest of my life? Uncle John eyed him. She wouldn't be miserable if she loves you. James shook his head, unconvinced. But she would be, and after a while she'd resent me for asking her to give up her dream. And if I tell her, stay in New Orleans and keep your career... Dance for as long as you want to, or need to. What kind of marriage is that living 2,000 miles apart? Maybe seeing each other once a month. I, I can't do that. And you know that a pastor shouldn't do that. Why not? It's a modern and lenient age we live in now. James frowned. Never expected to hear that from you. Me and Jessica living apart, for years, would look odd to the outside world, People, especially new members, would gossip that our relationship was rocky, or that we were having outside relationships. There may even be members who would try to oust me because it was inappropriate. You have to admit that newlyweds living so far apart would be strange, to say the least. Uncle John gave him a bemused smile. I didn't say I believed in the whole lenient age of modern times. I wanted to see what you would say. I want to know what you truly think. James heaved a sigh, tossing the empty bag of chips into the trash bin just inside the kitchen door. <sighs> the potential for gossip is huge, isn't it? As a pastor, I need to visit members of the congregation. If I was seen with other single women, no matter their age, inside their homes... His voice trailed off. Rumors or gossip about a pastor and another woman would be basis for dismissal even if the rumors aren't true. James wanted to growl and throw something, or scream at the heavens. This is dangerous ground, isn't it? Uncle John soberly nodded. I'm sorry, James, this isn't an easy decision. So I keep my career, or Jessica keeps hers, and neither the twain shall meet. I wouldn't say it's that cut and dried. Living apart would be incredibly lonely, James went on, despondent. I want to be with Jessica. I'd want a true wife, closeness, physically and emotionally. Relationships suffer when a spouse has to travel a lot for work. All the things you say are very true, Uncle John admitted. And children, James added. We could never have children. I mean, how? When? It would be like taking a year off for Jessica, especially with an infant. Trying to raise a child would become like a divorced or separated couple shuttling kids back and forth between cities and homes. Many couples marry later and have children closer to 40. James gave a short laugh. <laughs> You're not making this any easier. He paced the floor, wanting to punch a wall. Welcome to the bane of adulthood. Choosing your direction. Choosing life's path, even when life throws two good roads at you. I see now that it was really unfair of me to propose to her. I wasn't thinking. What a stupid thing to do. You're a man in love, John said. Don't be too hard on yourself. No wonder she's acting distant. I boxed her into a corner. Pretty selfish. John stood up, preparing to leave. I think it's time you two talked through this. Even though it's hard, these are decisions you and Jessica need to figure out and eventually make a decision about. As they say, time to fish or cut bait. This is my life, not a fishing competition. I'm not trying to make light of it. But you and Jessica can't continue on for another year or two pretending these important issues aren't lurking. You're right, as always. As painful as it is, Jess and I need to make some decisions. I don't want to fight and argue with her. I don't want to ruin the love I feel for her. 
That's the current road you're walking. But I know you'll make the right decision. Weigh the issues, pray about it, and try to think unselfishly. James lifted his head. That's an interesting piece of advice. It often helps. Uncle John grinned, but he looked tired, his tall shoulders stooping under the glare of the overhead light. Go global. Big picture. Right. Thanks for stopping by. Now I'm not sure I even remember why you showed up on my doorstep at midnight. James glanced at the clock. It's after one now. No wonder I'm falling over from fatigue. I'm sorry to keep you up so late with my silly problems. They're not silly at all. This is about your life and future marriage. But I'm following Cora to Portland for the next week or two. Won't know how long until I actually get there, so you're holding down the fort. Easter, Sophie Morris's funeral. I have some past sermons from over the years you can choose from if you think they'll help. At a funeral, focus on the family's needs and grief. You're their minister, but also their comforter and friend. Don't be afraid to be personal, to bridge their grief with God. Good advice, thanks. Now, get some sleep. You're going to need it. Chapter 9 Two days later, James bid Uncle John goodbye and waved as the older pastor pulled out of the driveway toward the airport in Billings. He'd offered to take him, but John had refused. He planned to leave his car at his married daughter's house in Billings, and she would drop him off for his flight later that afternoon. Besides, Pastor John loved seeing the grandkids. When it was a bit warmer and the ice crystals had thawed from the church lawns, James swapped out the letters in the church marquee. Easter was still ten days away, but it couldn't hurt to remind the general population. Easter comes once a year. How often do you? The previous evening, while driving back from Dove's to pick up a few groceries, he'd passed the Snow Valley Catholic Parish. Their sign gave him a chuckle. Easter Mass next Sunday. Come hear a zombie story with a lot less annoying bickering than The Walking Dead. Trying to guilt your congregation into coming to church? A friendly voice said behind him. James turned around, surprised. The speaker was April Murphy, holding Daphne's gloved hand gripped in hers. Well, hello, James said. Pleasure came over him to see a friendly face. He'd been stewing and worrying all morning about the upcoming church events. Now he shrugged. Maybe everyone needs a little bit of guilt once in a while. It prods us into evaluating our lives and making changes if necessary. April smiled up at him, a teasing expression on her face. My, you're in a serious mood. James laughed self-deprecatingly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Life's throwing curveballs lately. If you can play baseball, you can deflect. Or run into outfield. Ha! <laughs> or get hit in the head. Only if you're out there daydreaming. But I don't think you're out on the field of life chasing butterflies, Pastor James. You'll figure it out. That's what my uncle told me the other night after I binged eating the contents of my refrigerator. You mean Pastor John? The one and only... James got down on one knee and held out his hand. Hi, Daphne, how are you today? He shook her hand with the pink mitten, noticing that the little girl had the deepest brown eyes he'd ever seen, inherited from her father. The father she'd never play hide-and-seek with, or enjoy snuggling in bed with, reading a book or a story in the dark. The father she'd never remember except for the stories her mother told her. Good. Daphne said in a small, shy voice. Where are you headed? Home from school. It's that time already? James squinted up at the sun. There must be a time warp between my front door and the church lawn. I assure you that aliens didn't just steal three hours of your day, April said, her green eyes shining at him. It's only noon. Preschool is just a half day. Ah, right. I'd suggest you walk down to Big C's and get lunch with us, but since we just did dinner so recently, I won't try to compromise your pastoral reputation. 
James blushed, wondering how she knew about the conversation with Uncle John the other night. Intuition, he guessed. Or perhaps she saw the worried thought flash across his face just now. You're not compromising my reputation, Mrs. Murphy, he said, trying to sound casual, but it came out much more stiff and uptight than he'd wanted it to. He didn't want April to think he was embarrassed to be seen with her, or that there was something wrong with grabbing a burger with one of the members of his congregation. Good grief, he was probably way overthinking this. Is something wrong, James? April asked, searching his face. Or should I call you Pastor James? Usually it's the kids who call me Pastor James, but you can call me anything you're comfortable with. This situation had never come up before. He'd never actually asked Uncle John about it. Most people just used the title of pastor and added their first name. They were in small-town Montana, not Chicago or Boston. Where did the line of minister and friend cross? Why hadn't he ever worried about this when he met Jessica? His banter with Jess had been casual and easy and natural. He was more confused than ever. Too bad Uncle John was gone, so he couldn't talk to him some more about the issue. I'm actually on my way to visit the Morris family in preparation for Sophie Morris's funeral on Saturday. Can I take a rain check on lunch? Sure, April said. Her eyes watched him, probably ascertaining more than he was willing to give up, but she was sharp. I'm sorry about Mrs. Morris. I didn't know her, of course, but my cousin was telling me stories. She was an icon here, everyone's favorite. She was certainly that. James said, bending over to add, And you, Miss Daphne, enjoy your lunch with your mother. The little girl's head bobbed up and down, her nose red from the chill in the air. She was awfully cute. He wanted to scoop her up and protect her. James's heart twisted. How could he put off having children with Jessica for the next ten years? He remembered something Uncle John had said when he first graduated from the seminary. The compassion and charity of Christ will fill your heart, breaking your heart and mending your heart over and over again. It was happening more often as he got to know the congregation here. Pastor James, you seem very preoccupied, April said, her voice gentle and understanding. Good luck with everything. I'll see you later. Thanks, Mrs. Murphy. I mean April. Thanks for calling me April. I'm younger than you, and the Mrs. title really feels weird. After James grabbed a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch, he headed to the Morris family residence. The rest of the afternoon was spent making plans for the funeral program, the music and timing of the eulogy and family stories, as well as his own spiritually-based sermon. He pushed thoughts of April and Daphne from his mind while he finalized the draft for the funeral— focusing on Christ's love and the power of the resurrection and eternal life. Now, to call Jessica. Her phone rang just twice before she answered. Jess, he said, pleased to hear her voice, grateful he didn't have to leave another voicemail. You home yet? Just walked in the door. You sound breathless. Carrying my costume to mend and my practice bag, plus juggling my purse and the cell phone, but I dropped the bags and answered. Only way to prevent breaking the phone, she added with a laugh. How was your day? Good. I finally finished memorizing the choreography for the dance with Alonzo. Great to hear, sweetheart. If James never heard the name of Alonzo Bellamini again, he'd throw a party. Now I'll be dreaming dance steps all night. Well, don't drink any Coke or Dr. Pepper. I binged the other night and didn't get to sleep until three in the morning. Watch out, you could get addicted like me. How do you push your body so hard and not need a big gulp every hour of the day to keep going? Memorizing hundreds of steps has got to be hard. I've always sucked at memorizing. Why, Pastor James, you used a word my mother would wash my mouth out with soap for saying. Hey, I'm not perfect yet. Please don't try for perfection. I'd never catch up with you. Won't happen in this lifetime, believe me, my love. Jessica harumphed. 
I think God makes it impossible on purpose. He gives us the commandment to be like him, but throws stuff at us all the time to make sure we can't. Maybe he's got a wicked sense of humor? (laughs) Sick humor, you mean. Jessica laughed, and it was so good to hear her laugh after almost two weeks away that James found himself grinning with relief. So, what are you doing this weekend? He hoped she wasn't going out on the town again with Alonzo and Sierra and the other dancers. It was hard not to let it bother him. I'm actually catching the red eye home tonight. To Montana. James blinked. Not sure I heard you right. You heard me correctly. I'm flying home for Aunt Sophie's funeral. I heard you're the preacher man, too. When did this happen? Um, just a couple of days ago. My mother called to give me the sad news. The timing isn't great, but for some reason I'm now obligated. Family and such. Her voice trailed off. Understanding dawned on James. That's right. Sophie Morris is one of your mother's cousins. Second cousin, I think, but who's counting? Nobody does in Snow Valley. Hey, that's one thing I like about Snow Valley. We're all family even if the genealogy charts aren't exactly perfect. I'm glad you weren't born and raised in Snow Valley, or I would never marry you, James Douglas. It would feel like marrying my brother. You mean there's still a chance? She was quiet for a moment, and a longing to see her swept over James. There's always a chance, she said in a soft voice. But honestly, I don't want to talk about this over the phone. I'll pick you up at the airport. What time do you get in? You need your beauty sleep, Pastor, so you can do the preaching over the pulpit and make some sort of sense. Nobody would forgive you if you messed up details about Aunt Sophie's quirks or forgot to say the right scriptures. Besides, I don't get in until almost six in the morning. My dad's coming to get me. I can sleep on the plane, I hope. Jessica, I can't wait to see you but I don't understand why you would pay the high price for a last-minute flight right in the middle of dress rehearsals for Swan Lake for your mother's second cousin's funeral. Your mom could always send you a program and pictures. Normally, I wouldn't have come, she admitted. Not just for a quick weekend, and especially not now. The timing is terrible. Maddox wasn't too happy when I told him. Furious is a better way of putting it. So why? James prompted. Well, it turns out Aunt Sophie left me something in her will. I'm obligated to be at the lawyer's office Saturday afternoon after the funeral luncheon. James's jaw dropped. Well, I'd have never guessed that. Me either. It's all quite mysterious. Do you have any idea what she could have left you? Not a clue. It doesn't make a bit of sense. And now, I will say goodbye and go pack a weekend bag. She took a breath, and James wanted to reach through the phone and kiss her. And I will see you at the funeral. This was a turn of events he'd never expected. Elation filled him. I can't believe I'm going to see you in about twelve hours. Hold you. Kiss you. Was he overdoing it? Me too. Jessica whispered, and James's entire body exploded with the strength of his feelings for this woman. Oh, and wear your cowboy boots. Aunt Sophie loved her men in cowboy boots. With a three-piece suit? That would be perfect. I love you, Jess, James said, but she'd already clicked off before she heard his words. Or responded. Chapter 10 Blinking back the sleep from her eyes, Jessica pulled her bag down from the overhead bin and lurched sleepily down the airplane aisle. She hoped her father wouldn't mind if she napped on the drive home. Sometimes he liked to talk about everything. Work complaints, aggravations with a teenage son, her beloved brother Sam, politics, religion. Her dad often spouted opinions to a patient during a filling who was unable to do more than mumble a response. Jessica checked her watch. 
Was there time for another quick nap once she got home and before the funeral started? That depended on whether her mother held her captive in a nice long chat in the kitchen. Bumping along the gangway, Jessica was grateful that the dress rehearsal had suddenly been postponed. The Orpheum Theater was undergoing a few minor repairs, so the ballet company had the entire weekend off. Worked out perfect when the funeral came up. Jessica cast her mind back to the time she had seen Aunt Sophie over the years. One of those older ladies, a stalwart member of the grand community of Snow Valley. Always doing acts of service, passing out hugs to everyone whether they needed it or not. She still remembered Aunt Sophie gushing over Jessica's final ballet recital before she went off to college. Turned out the older woman was quite conversant on the subject of dance and the traditional ballets of the 19th century like Giselle or La Sylphide. One would think a rancher's wife like Sophie Morris was only taken up with concerns about canning vegetables from her garden, quilting and baking cookies for the neighborhood. But she was well-read and had a sophisticated knowledge of the arts and culture hiding beneath that small-town exterior. Jessica checked the overhead signs for the exit to the curb where her father was picking her up. And bumped straight into Alonzo Bellamini. What in the world? she exclaimed, her heart jumping straight into her throat. Where did you come from? An airplane? Jessica shook her head. You were not on my plane. Actually, I was. In the very back row behind a magazine. Why didn't you say something or wave? And why are you in Billings of all places? Do you have family here? Here I am, from Montana, and you never mention that you have relatives here? <laughs> Slow down, mi amore. Alonzo said, laughing at the expression on her face. Except for a bit of stubble on his chin, he didn't look as though he'd just taken a red eye curled up into a cramped seat with pillow wrinkles across his face. No, I don't have family here. She shook her head again, staring at him and wanting to shove a finger into his chest. You flew all the way here because of me? He nodded a solemn expression on his face. I have come to mourn Aunt Sophie with you. What? Jessica spluttered. Words left her, but then she gained control of herself, tempted to bruise the guy's head with her suitcase. I told you I've always wanted to visit Snow Valley with you. I want to see your life, your hometown, through your eyes. Let's get one thing straight, buddy. I did not invite you. You stalked me. A spur of the moment weekend, just you and me. This is not romantic in the least. Jessica spun on her heels, trying not to explode with fury. Oh, but we could make it so very romantic. A hike in the hills, candlelit dinner in Snow Valley's best restaurant, Strolling down Main Street. You, you are impossible, she yelled, marching away down the airport hallway. Hurrying travelers swept past, giving her looks as if they were embarrassed for her while Alonzo ran after her. The breaking dawn sun cut across the expanse of tarmac and into the large airport windows, blinding Jessica. Her eyes burned from lack of sleep. Her nerves were frayed. She wanted to see James, to have a real talk after his last visit with the engagement ring. She didn't want New Orleans following her home. Alonzo Bellamini, I did not invite you to come meet my family and friends, and I most certainly did not invite you to stroll down Main Street as if we are a couple. We can be friends. The rest will come. Once outside, the cold wind whipped her hair against her face. I don't think you understand how furious I am. But fury can turn into love, he said, stepping closer. I am this close to shoving you in front of a speeding jet. The sign of true passion. I knew you had Latin blood in you. 
Oh, how I love you. Don't you dare. You are going to be lucky if I even speak to you the next two days. I only yearn to be near you. You're going to be staying in a hotel, buddy. All of a sudden, Jessica's father appeared at her elbow. Hello, sweetie pie, he said, pecking her on the cheek. I am not a sweetie pie, Dad chuckled. <laughs> I know, that's what makes it such a funny term of endearment. Not you too, she growled. I've been flying all night, I'm grumpy, and I just want to go home. That's my girl, her dad teased. The chilly spring air of Montana ran down the neck of Jessica's blouse, and she shivered uncontrollably. She wasn't acclimated to the northern cold any longer and glad she remembered to pack sweatshirts. Where'd you park, Dad? Thought I was just going to climb in at the curb. I got here early and didn't want to circle endlessly. Alonzo was trailing behind, and Jessica tried to ignore him. Why don't you introduce me to your friend? Dad suggested, obviously trying to remember if he'd been given the memo that his daughter was bringing a friend home. Dad, this is Alonzo Bellamini. He's in my dance company. We're doing a tiny duet together in Swan Lake. He thought it would be funny to come to Snow Valley. The end. Dr. Mason raised both eyebrows, used to Jessica's impatient rants. Then he popped the trunk and put the luggage inside. So what are we doing with Alonzo Bellamini? We are headed in the same direction, and he's your friend and ballet partner. Jessica tapped her foot on the pavement, staring at them both. Temporary, one-time, one-dance partner, she clarified. For about 30 seconds. Dad looked uncomfortable. Of course, he had no clue about her history with Alonzo, and he was probably wondering about James, who was supposed to be the love of Jessica's life. Finally, he shrugged. We don't turn away visitors to Snow Valley. I think he's harmless, isn't he? Alonzo smiled goofily. Completely harmless, and I'm in love with your daughter. Dad, he's lying through his New York City teeth. When his lips move, you can be sure he's telling a whopper. When we get into town, drop him off at a motel, she ordered. When she walked around to the front of the car, her dad leaned in to whisper, Well, Jess, seems like you got a lot to figure out these next few days. Two men dying to spend their weekend with you. Unfortunately, Alonzo caught the under-the-breath remark. He opened the front door with a flourish. Tell me who my competition is. Quit the dramatics. You know perfectly well who it is. I've been trying to forget. Just as you have been trying to do, my sweet Jessica. The truth of his words hit home a little too hard. Dad lifted his eyebrows and Jessica glared at him, slamming the door. Shrugging his shoulders, he stuck the key into the Pontiac's ignition and revved the engine. How far is the drive to Snow Valley? Alonzo asked from the back seat. Mr. Mason said, about 75 miles, mostly highway, so not much more than an hour. Alonzo gave a laugh. <laughs> In Manhattan, that kind of distance would take all day. He rubbed his hands together to stay warm and then shoved them under the armpits of his black leather jacket. He stared out at the hills, pine and scrub brush dotting the landscape. My first time in the country. I can't wait. Jessica's father harumphed and slid out of the parking lot of the Billings Airport. Jessica curled up into her sweatshirt, cranked up the heat, closed her eyes, and ignored them both. Chapter 11 James was buttoning his white shirt when a knock sounded at the door. He'd been practicing his talk for the funeral all through his shower. Now he scrambled into his suit jacket and hurried to the door. On the step was April Murphy, holding a plate of cinnamon rolls. So sorry to bother you, but I couldn't sleep last night, so I just got up early and started baking. Something I do when I'm nervous. I've been having a craving for sweets lately, so cinnamon rolls just came out. They're still warm. Wow, 
They look fantastic, James said. The aroma of sugar and cinnamon and cream cheese frosting rose from the plate, but the sight merely reminded him of cinnamon rolls from Jessica at Christmas time. He tried not to glance at his watch to check the time of her arrival at her parents' home this morning. Please, come in. Well, only for a minute, April said, stepping inside the door and briskly rubbing her cold hands together. Stepping into his tiny kitchen, James placed the rolls on the counter. I know you're in a rush, April said, with the funeral and all. I still have an hour and my commute is pretty short. April smiled and James realized that her daughter wasn't in tow. Where's Daphne? He slid off the clear wrapping paper. She spent the night with her sterling cousins. Maybe that's why I didn't sleep very well. I'm not used to her absence. She helps me get through the nights. I can imagine, James said gently. Here, let's have a quick breakfast. I made them for you. I can't possibly eat an entire plateful. They freeze well. Okay, let's share one at least. This will save me breakfast making time. He got out plates and the milk and then pulled out a chair for her. Would you like coffee or tea? April shook her head. Honestly, I have a penchant for baking when I'm feeling. Her voice trailed off and James knew what she was implying. And I wasn't planning on staying. I don't live that far and the brisk walk helped me clear my head. The cold air always seems to clear out the cobwebs. Maybe I should try it, James mused, chewing thoughtfully. Hey, these are most excellent. Thank you again. A pastor doesn't need to clear out any cobwebs. Don't be too sure of that, he said with a half smile. Well, keep that a secret or your congregation might have a crisis of faith. April glanced up at him and her eyes rested on his face. James leaned back in the kitchen chair. It was disloyal to Jessica, but this was how he imagined Saturday mornings when he, they, got married. A lazy breakfast together, planning out their weekend projects, cooking together, making love. His face reddened when that last part ran through his mind. To hide his thoughts, he jumped up to put the dishes in the sink. He hadn't seen Jess in three weeks since the proposal, and he had no idea what reception to expect from her. When he thought about the expectations of the funeral, the details and sober mood expected, his stomach spasmed. Seeing Jessica in the congregation before they'd even had a chance to say hello would be difficult. A metaphor for the distance between them. And here was a woman, sitting in his kitchen, who embodied the marital fantasy he'd always wanted. But what exactly was the fantasy? Jessica as a homemaker, mother, and wife? Or placing those expectations on April Murphy? A woman who obviously already loved womanhood and home life? He rubbed at his temples, and April reached out to touch his arm. Are you okay, James? Sorry, lost in thought. Over these cinnamon rolls, he added lamely. She tisked her tongue, not believing his fib. A moment ago, you looked like you had the weight of the world on your shoulders. Just life and death, he quipped. April's mouth quirked into a grin while she nodded sagely in agreement. She was pretty with those green eyes and her long, wavy hair tucked behind her ears. All of a sudden, her face turned ashen. I think I'm going to be sick, she gasped. Down here. James quickly pulled her down the hall into the bathroom that was still steamy from his shower. He shut the door and heard her retching. A few moments later... The water ran, and then the door slowly opened. I am so embarrassed, April said, ducking her head. I never intended to come over here and get sick in your bathroom. Don't be embarrassed at all. Maybe you just ate too much sugar on an empty stomach. I should fix scrambled eggs to settle you. Really, I can't stay. I shouldn't stay. Picking up Daphne in just a bit, I only meant to share the three dozen rolls I made— Taking some to my cousin's house, too. She's got three boys, so they'll be wolfed down by lunchtime. 
You should go home and lie down. I hope it's not the flu. April shook her head and her hair fell across her eyes. All of a sudden, a tear slipped out and she brushed it away with an impatient hand. April, James said, tell me what's wrong. Is it Daphne? Your health? What's going on? Will you make me come to your office for confession? I don't do confession unless someone insists. That's between you and the Lord. Come sit down for a moment until you've got your sea legs back. James, I'm perfectly fine. My only problem is that I'm pregnant. Silence followed her declaration while James tried to grasp what she had just blurted out. You mean you're going to have another baby? Like Daphne? Her laughter was weak. <laughs> exactly, except it might be a boy. When are you due? That seemed like the next logical question. Oh, don't worry, it's my deceased husband's child. Actually, I wasn't fishing for that at all. I'm sorry if I made you feel uncomfortable. She pressed her lips together, looking forlorn. Thank you. Whenever the news comes out, I get this look, as if I was cheating on my husband while he was overseas. He actually only left after the new year, three months ago. His second tour in Afghanistan. And he wasn't there a week before the IED hit his convoy. April, I'd never jump to any other conclusion. Just wondering how much time you have ahead of you. Well, all of that means I'm about three months along. Due mid to late September. Hopefully, I'm almost past the morning sickness. April sagged against the armchair and James leaned forward, wanting to comfort her. You have a lot on your plate, and you've already gone through a lot of changes in your life in less than three months. I'm sure you're overwhelmed. It was stupid to move, I guess. Probably should have stayed with my parents, but after living on my own, I felt like a teenager again who had to obey curfew. I made the decision before I knew for sure about the baby. I just thought my upset stomach was due to grief, nerves, fear... That's very understandable. All at once, April reached out to clutch his arm. Her touch was warm and firm, not clingy. How will I ever get a job or go to school or support my family with a newborn? Death benefits only go so far. Pastor John and I will help you figure all that out. There are many people who care about you. You'll get help with child care and other needs, I promise you. Snow Valley is a close and caring community. James tried not to roll his eyes at the words coming out of his mouth. They sounded so pat, so trite, and so unhelpful. It didn't address the emotional distress at all. For April to carry and deliver a second child without her husband would be difficult indeed. Compassion filled him along with a strange sensation— the need to protect and help this vulnerable young woman. An instant family, he thought. Was this an answer from God? A way to heal after the breakup with Jessica? Except they hadn't really broken up. Once again, he wished that Uncle John were here. He was desperately in need of spiritual counseling. You have a funeral to get ready for. April said, rising from the sofa. I'm sorry to dump all of this on you right now. Please forget about my problems and focus on giving the Morris family a beautiful funeral service. Honestly, don't ever worry about asking for help. That's why I'm here. After she departed, James sagged against the door, his mind scrambling over what he needed to do before leaving for the church in... 20 minutes! He grabbed his electric razor and shaved while he searched for his sermon notes. He'd forgotten to print them. While they printed, he shuffled through his desk, grabbing the black binder he usually used to store his sermons and notes, his briefcase, and his Bible. Pushing papers aside, he came across a list of church marquee signs that Uncle John had created a few months ago. One caught his eye and stopped him in his tracks. Feed your faith and your doubts will starve to death. That's exactly what he needed to do. He could find the right path. He had to. 
He had to trust that the right path would open up, starting today. Chapter 12 The choir finished singing, How Great Thou Art, Aunt Sophie's favorite hymn, and the rustling in the chapel quieted. Jessica bowed her head for the prayer, acutely aware of Alonzo sitting next to her. Sitting close, thigh to thigh. He'd tried to take her hand earlier, and she'd yanked it away, giving him another stern glare. Probably the tenth one today. After the amen... James rose and shuffled to the podium, gave a slight cough, and then stared at the stained glass window as though his mind was preoccupied. Jessica could only imagine what he was thinking. Her eyes flicked over to her parents sitting together. Marilee Mason's eyes were damp, and she crumpled a ball of tissues in her fist. Jessica's lips parted when James's eyes lingered on her face. Only she could recognize the pained expression when he spotted Alonzo sitting next to her. Inwardly, she cringed. She wasn't trying to hurt James or make it appear as though she had brought a new boyfriend home. Honestly, she wanted to scream, Alonzo followed me to Snow Valley. He's a pest. There is nothing between us. But of course, she had to sit there and stifle her emotions, sit on her hands, Stop her knee from bouncing. Glue her toes to the carpet. Not go running across the chapel and fling herself into Pastor James's arms. Jessica missed him more than she had realized. How painful it was going to be to say goodbye once and for all. It was becoming more apparent that she couldn't give James what he wanted, which meant that Jessica had to let him go. If they were truly meant to be together, perhaps they would find each other again in a few years when the timing was better. But for now, she had to let James go out of her life, at the risk of never seeing him again. He deserved better. He deserved a chance to get all the things he wanted in a wife. She was being selfish by tying him to her indefinitely. The pastor didn't look at Jessica again as if he had determined to stoically keep her from his line of vision, and she found herself biting back tears. If anyone saw her, they'd assume she was crying over Aunt Sophie, and she was, but she was also crying for her own broken heart. Jessica would probably never have the kind of life Sophie Morris had lived. A large family, loud, busy, boisterous, and in love with each other. The kind of family that filled a person's heart with unconditional love, happiness, and fun. God had given her a different life, a different talent, and Jessica had to figure out what she was supposed to do with it. A sign from heaven would be really helpful about now. When Jessica learned that Pastor John was out of town with his wife, attending to his own family crises, she was disappointed. It would have been good to meet with him and get his perspective. He always had a lot of insight and wisdom to shine on a person's problems. James's eyes suddenly riveted back to Jessica when Alonzo crept his arm around her shoulder in the pretense of comforting her, and then he quickly averted his face again to the far pews. What agony he must be in, to be in charge of the funeral, speaking, and then witnessing Jessica's betrayal right in front of his eyes? She tried not to cry even harder, focusing on listening to the young girl, Haley, seeing amazing grace in her clear, beautiful voice. After the final prayer, the congregation of family and friends moved slowly past the coffin to pay their final respects. Following that, the casket was carried out by the pallbearers to the hearse waiting in the church parking lot. Aunt Sophie would be buried right here in the church graveyard, close by Michael Grant, Jessica's Michael from high school, the very spot she'd met James Douglas for the first time. His feet had crunched across the crisp snow while she shivered on her knees in front of the headstone. She and James had come a long way over the past year. They had fallen in love over Christmas had a long-distance relationship, talked on the phone for hours, visited by plane, dreamed about a life together. And now, 
it was over. It shouldn't have taken Jessica so long to realize the end from the beginning. Penny, for your thoughts, her father said, giving his daughter a hug in the foyer amidst the crowd of people. I love that, Alonzo said. My abuela used to say that expression when I was a boy. So quaint. Mr. and Mrs. Mason just looked at him, then glanced at Jessica with raised eyebrows. So what nationality is your family, Alonzo? Her mother asked, getting right to the point as she liked to do. Oh, well, my father is Italian, and my mother is some sort of Spanish, so I steal from several cultures. It gives one's life a certain flair, don't you think? Well, bless your heart, Mrs. Mason told him, fluttering her eyes at him. She'd actually been raised by a southern woman from Alabama. Sometimes her roots came out in steely methods. All right, Mom, Jessica whispered. Tuck your claws back in. Oh, he's such a nice boy. I think he's almost 30. That's my point, sweetie. Touché. Jessica kept on the perimeters of the family crowd while the casket was lowered into the ground and the grave was dedicated with a prayer and a few comments by family members. After that, the family went back inside the church for a luncheon provided by the women of the church. I took my cake into the church kitchen from the back seat of my car, didn't I? Mrs. Mason asked her husband. You did, Merrily, he assured her. What time is the lawyer appointment? Jessica asked. Not until three. Shall we have lunch somewhere? Her mother suggested. Jessica's dad rubbed his hands together. Let's take Alonzo to Snow Valley's finest. Big C's. Snow Valley's finest? his wife said. Honestly, Dr. Mason, you're such a big spender. Dad's teasing, Jessica informed Alonzo as they headed to the car. It's the local burger joint. Nothing fancy at all. I'm not insulted, her ballet partner said. I'd love to see more of the town. Bask in this new world. Don't patronize, Alonzo, Jessica muttered under her breath. She glanced back at the church, hoping for a glimpse of James, but he was busy talking to several ladies and there was a line of others waiting for his attention, although he was trying to herd them all back inside from the graveyard since a bitter spring wind had risen, bending the branches on the trees. As if he could read her thoughts, James's eyes lifted, catching Jessica's face. They stared at each other for a moment. Not a word, not a smile as though they were already saying goodbye. Jessica wanted to go home and cry into her pillow, except her old bedroom was now a guest room for the man standing next to her. Your church even has a white picket fence, Alonzo said, staring at the marquee sign. Never thought I'd see one in real life. The current marquee read, Feed your faith and your doubts will starve to death. Jessica's heart pricked with unease. James always did the signs. Was it a message for him or for the woman he loved? After being seated at Big C's with their burgers and fries, Alonzo was in small-town heaven, pointing out the old jukebox, the greasy walls, the checkered tablecloths, and the Christmas tree with its drooping ornaments still sitting in the corner from three months earlier. Sometimes it took a while to get the tree taken down and the decorations put away, but nobody really minded. Just like the Hansons who left their Christmas lights up all year. Alonzo would probably guffaw at that. The warmth of the cozy diner and the smell of chili and onion rings wrapped around Jessica's heart like a warm blanket. She let out a small sigh and smiled wanly at her parents. Despite how crazy they often made her... She suddenly realized how much she missed them in between trips home. The jokes, the teasing, late-night movies with popcorn and blankets with a roaring fire in winter, arguments over chores, arm wrestles over the last slice of cake, her family with all its quirks and quibbles. Where's Sam? Jessica asked after they dug into their meals. Her younger brother had given her a big hug when they first arrived at the church, but then disappeared between the funeral and the graveside service. 
Her mother sipped at her drink. He took off with Lydia and some friends in Dad's pickup. I bet this town is great when it snows, Alonzo said, grease dripping down his chin. Quickly, he dabbed at it with a napkin and stared out the window. Just like the movie It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. Yeah, it was filmed here, actually, her father said with a completely straight face. Really? How cool. Alonzo gushed, completely missing Dr. Mason's deadpanned expression. Were you guys extras or anything? Alonzo, Mrs. Mason said, laying a hand on his arm and giving him her best sympathetic look. That movie came out in 1946, and Jimmy Stewart is dead. Oh man, really? That's too bad. Eat your burger, Jessica told him, stealing one of his hot onion rings. Hey, he bumped her shoulder like they were cozy. We're sharing onion rings. We've never done that before. Don't get any ideas. It's just a basket of onion rings. Oh, look at that guy with the spurs on his cowboy boots. Now that I've never seen before in real life. Real life takes many forms, Jessica told him, giving a quick wave to Nick Walton. Her father rolled his eyes and then her mother poked him. But he looks like an actor out of a John Wayne movie. Alonzo, you're getting annoying. I've known Nick Walton my whole life. He's one of the best ranchers in the state, and his family probably has ten times more money in the bank than you do. Whoa, Alonzo said, impressed. Citizens of Snow Valley may be uncultured and have a Montana twang, but we aren't stupid or uneducated. He held up his hands. No offense, meant. Hey, let's take a romantic drive into the hills after lunch? Dr. Mason's eyebrows shot up. Not with my daughter, you're not. Dad, Jessica chided. Alonzo just wants to feel like a cowboy for an hour, not go parking. Is that where the teenagers go to make out? The distant hills? Her ballet partner asked, experimenting with a twang in his accent. Not so fast, buddy, and don't overdo the accent. You're trying way too hard. I'll drive you around town before dinner. Right now, go wander Main Street, buy a cupcake at the bakery, and I'll see you after the appointment at the lawyer's office. Your wish is my command, mi amore. Alonzo kissed Jessica's hand and tossed a backward glance while she slid into the car with her parents. You're a saint, Mrs. Mason told her daughter when the door shut and Alonzo was checking out Tina's bakery window of fine donuts. I honestly don't know whether the man's conversation and declarations of love are serious or he's just putting on a show, Jessica said with a groan. And did you see Pastor James's face at the funeral, Jessica? her father asked. I thought he was going to march down from the podium and physically separate you from Alonzo. What is going on with you two? It's complicated and there's no time to give you any details. Are you coming to the attorney's office, Mom and Dad? We weren't invited, only the beneficiaries of Sophie's estate. Just call when you're ready to be picked up, sweetie. They dropped her off a few minutes later, and Jessica stood in front of Snow Valley's attorney at law, feeling awkward and guilty that her mother, who was a much closer relative, wasn't here too. And Jessica was left wondering, why in the world would Sophie Morris name her in her will? Chapter 13 Memories flooded Jessica when she gazed down Main Street. Melted snow dripped from the rooftops. A group of kids in sweatshirts were playing a pickup game of basketball in someone's driveway. The sweet smell of fried donuts wafted from the same house. Good memories of a great childhood washed over her. Those laughing kids used to be her and Michael. With a start, Jessica suddenly realized that she could think about Michael now without the burden of the deep, painful sorrow she used to carry on her shoulders all the time. The two of them had enjoyed a wonderful friendship, best friends to the end. Her only sorrow now was not to see Michael graduating with a law degree and marrying the girl of his dreams. 
It was a peculiar feeling to miss home so starkly, and to miss New Orleans at the same time. Was this a sign that she was finally a mature, real adult, as Alonzo would put it? Jessica didn't have to run away anymore, from herself, from her faith, or her future. But where did she truly belong for the rest of her life? Today was a pivotal day. Jessica could feel it in her soul. She had to make a choice that was going to hurt and leave a scar no matter which way she decided. Either she could nurture her soul in dance, or she could spend the rest of eternity with James. But not both. That was the bottom line. Sniffing past her emotions, Jessica pulled out her cell phone and texted James. We need a chance to talk. In person. Alone. The response from James came quickly. I've been hoping to hear from you. Jessica, I'm sorry about the delay. A sightseeing visitor tagged along from the airport. James, is that what you call him? Jessica, no sarcasm in text messages, please. James, sorry, Jess. I'm dying to see you, of course. Where did you go so quickly after the funeral ended? Jessica, lunch with parents and the visitor. At the attorney's now. James. That's right. I almost forgot that was today, too. You'll be at least an hour. Did you know there's an Easter ball tonight? Jessica. Nope. James. Can I entice you to attend the dance with me? Jessica. Is dancing with the pastor after a funeral kosher? James. Indubitably, my silly girl. Jessica. I'll see you there then. Save me a spot on your dance card. James. I should be the one to say that. You're breaking my heart. Jessica. Hmm, not so sure. I had my eyes on the crowd at the church today. Watched a particular woman who couldn't keep her eyes off you. James. Jess, that's not fair. Jessica. It isn't? Oops, the attorney doors are opening. Gotta go. Turning off her phone, Jessica pushed her way inside the small, dark-paneled foyer. Mr. Lloyd Orville and members of the Morris family were already there, quiet and subdued. Jessica offered her condolences, and then it turned to all business. I know it's been a long day for all of you. A long week. Please accept my deepest condolences on Mrs. Morris's passing, Mr. Orville offered. She was a favorite client of mine for so many years, but there's no point in waiting until next week. There's a lot of paperwork to be signed. In addition to all of her wonderful attributes, Sophie Morris was also an organized woman. Commendable. Heads around the room nodded. One of Aunt Sophie's gray-haired daughters leaned in toward Jessica to whisper, Where's your mother? I thought perhaps she'd be here. She didn't want to intrude, she whispered in return. I have absolutely no idea why I'm here. My mother probably has a keepsake she wanted to give your family. Jessica nodded, wondering if it was a quilt or access to her canning collection, despite the fact that she had expressed no interest in either of those pursuits. Mr. Orville read from a document full of legalese and then began to itemize Aunt Sophie's assets and property, delineating which relative or descendant was receiving her beloved possessions. Jessica was slightly embarrassed to be listening to it all. Finally, the lawyer looked at her above his glasses, and Jessica's stomach gave a small jump of nerves. There was a moment of anticipation, a collective holding of breath. Then Mr. Orville proceeded to read from the document that Aunt Sophie had signed with witnesses two years earlier. Sophie Morris has bequeathed the sum of $2,000 to Miss Jessica Mason of Banner Drive, Snow Valley, to be used to begin a school of dance for young people. The timing of said school is when Miss Mason deems it's right. Mr. Orville lowered the papers and gazed over his glasses. Jessica's mouth was open and she let out a small gasp. (gasps) What in the world? Why? Mr. Orville said, It appears that Sophie Morris always dreamed of becoming a ballet dancer and was never able to pursue it in her youth. She attended every one of your recitals and performances when you were growing up. 
She saw your talent and was tickled pink when you were offered a position with the New Orleans Dance Company. Jessica was suddenly aware of too many pairs of eyes all gazing at her with surprise. I never really thought about it before, but you're right. And Sophie did attend my ballet performances and sent me a personal card of congratulations at my job offer. Um, when did you say I'm supposed to start a school? She asked, trying to sort out a jumble of thoughts. Sophie stipulated no time frame or deadline, just when you deem the time is right. Perhaps after your career on stage is over. The lawyer gave a small chuckle. I have no idea about matters such as the arts. I... I am completely bowled over, Jessica said softly. I always thought she tried to support every Snow Valley event, no matter how large or small. Or thought it had something to do with the fact that I was her cousin's daughter. I'm sure it's all wrapped up together, Sophie's daughter told Jessica, squeezing her arm with delight. I'm so pleased. I expected nothing less from my mother. And even though we're a small town, Snow Valley will carry on its tradition of inspiring young people in music and dance and art. I'm grateful and overwhelmed, Jessica said. Plus, I've never inherited anything before in my life. Sounds of laughter broke out around the room, and after saying their goodbyes, Jessica found herself standing on the sidewalk, staring unseeing at a world that had suddenly changed in a thousand small ways. Was this her answer? The sign? The leap of faith? A breeze came over the ridge of hills, and she tightened her scarf, pulling on her gloves again. Alonzo suddenly stepped up next to her. I've been keeping warm in the Dove's grocery waiting for you. Can we walk back to your house from here? It's a little way, but we can walk until it becomes unbearably frigid. We might turn into popsicles once the sun sets. The temperature will drop into single digits. They took off at a brisk pace, and the cold afternoon began to clear Jessica's head. She had to work off the pent-up energy and shock that was consuming her mind. Alonzo took her hand and tucked it into his coat. It was a personal, romantic gesture, but Jessica was so cold she allowed it this once. And, for once, he didn't prattle on, oblivious to her pensive mood. I heard rumors of an Easter ball tonight. He finally spoke up, in a voice that was remarkably Spanish, French, and Italian accent-free. I like your real voice, Alonzo, she told him. You do? So there's hope for us? Um, no, but you are a good dance partner and I feel safe when we do the lifts, and that says a lot. He grinned. I'll take it, and I'm glad to hear that. How about we go show off some dance moves tonight? I'm starting to understand, Snow Valley. This town does holidays big. You are very astute, especially Christmas. You've never seen anything like it. Tree lighting, sleigh rides, Santa, Christmas bazaar, choir programs, you name it. Jessica didn't mention the fall she'd taken a year ago during her Sugar Plum Fairy solo, or James's embarrassing rescue on the stage in front of the entire town. Which means you come from a party town. <laughs> I guess you could call it that, Jessica said with a burst of laughter. Alonzo pulled her to him in a quick hug. I knew it all along, my pretty woman. Dancing and partying are in your blood. Jessica stepped to the side when they neared the church grounds, aware of lights in the windows of James's apartment in the back, and the appearance of a second, unknown car in his driveway. In a manner of speaking, she responded absent-mindedly. She was preoccupied the rest of the walk home, and when she and Alonzo came through the front door, Jessica's entire family was standing there, waiting for the news from the lawyers with bated breath. Jessica spilled it, and her brother Sam let out an appreciative whistle. An inheritance, he breathed. His eyes were bigger than Mrs. Mason's teacup saucers. You're rich! Hardly, Jessica told him. $2,000 will barely get you the first month's rent and a deposit on an apartment in New Orleans. But it would put down rent on a hall for you when you want to turn your skills to teaching, Mrs. Mason said with practicality. Meanwhile, her father interjected, 
Save it, invest it, and your tiny nest egg can potentially become more, much more than two months' rent several years from now. That's the plan, Jessica said, dropping a kiss on his cheek. So now I need to figure out if I have a dress for the ball tonight. What's in my closet, Mom? Oh, the dance will make a lovely activity for you young people tonight. Frankly, I'd forgotten about the Easter ball, even though it happens every year. Your father refuses to waltz. But I can do a mean jitterbug in the living room, he said in protest. That's debatable. Mrs. Mason motioned Alonzo to follow her down the hall in true mom style so he could change in the spare bathroom. Jessica set her overnight bag on her old bed with a thud and then sank into the mattress. She was going to the Easter ball, which struck her as kind of funny. The sort of dance that teenagers got into, although it was actually a family dance for the whole town. And she had two men she would be trying to appease. Maybe she should just hang out at the refreshment table and inhale a few hundred calories. Jessica was both nervous and terrified to see James. She rubbed at the fourth finger on her left hand, still feeling the imprint of the diamond ring James had slipped on that finger exactly three weeks ago. She had given up the ring freely, so she had no right to feel cheated. It was her own doing. But Jessica's heart was bursting with a sorrow she couldn't explain. Chapter 14 after a quick power nap so she wouldn't fall asleep on the dance floor, Jessica swore she would never take another red-eye flight again. She jumped into the shower, hurrying so that Sam and Alonzo could get ready for the dance, too, although Jessica sneaked into the master bathroom to finish her hair and makeup. Mrs. Mason had baked a pan of chicken enchiladas and tossed a salad so they ate in turns, Going in and out of the kitchen, Dr. Mason entertaining Alonzo with stories about Snow Valley that were outlandish and completely untrue. Alonzo ate up the tall tales, hook, line, and sinker. Dad's taking you fishing, Jessica told him, bounding downstairs to borrow her mother's black pumps since she'd neglected to pack a pair of dressy shoes. We're going fishing, Alonzo said. Sounds great. Is there a Snow Valley lake around here? Mr. Mason gave Jessica a look that told her not to breathe a word and spill the joke. Um, the lake is closed right now, her father told Alonzo. As if you could pack up an entire lake and cart it away like a traveling carnival. Jessica couldn't hold in the laughter any longer, spitting out a sip of her Dr. Pepper when she snorted. What's so funny? Alonzo demanded. Nothing, nothing, she said with an innocent look. But I have to admit that you are entertaining in your own way, Alonzo. The man beamed happily. An hour later, Jessica, Alonzo, and Sam were parking at the Snow Valley Cultural Center. You look sharp, Sam, Jessica told him. He was wearing one of his dad's suits with a crisp red tie and a rakish black hat. Thanks, sis. Alonzo pouted, so she added, You look nice, too. Although, how you happen to pack a dress shirt and leather jacket without knowing the local itinerary is a miracle. I'm hoping for a miracle tonight, ma chérie. Well, keep praying, she advised him. You're such a coquette, Jessica. She smiled prettily. One thing I've never been known for is sweet, but I'll take the coquette part. The church hall was decorated with pink streamers and snowy white tablecloths in celebration of the Easter season. Bowls of Easter chocolates and eggs made up the centerpieces for those who wanted a place to sit and watch. The Ladies of Snow Valley, not an actual organization, but it was how Jessica had always referred to the stalwart moms and grandmas who catered church dinners, baby showers, and funerals from their very own kitchens, had brought oodles of food. Long tables groaned with potluck main dishes, salads, and desserts by the dozen. We shouldn't have bothered to eat dinner beforehand, Jessica observed. Sam's eyes lit up. Food! And he was gone, 
as if he hadn't eaten in a week rather than an hour ago. The DJ did a mix of current popular songs for the high school crowd, where Sam took off, not wanting to be seen with his sister and Alonzo, and a few oldies thrown in for those who wanted to waltz and foxtrot. A couple of swing dances, then a sensuous Latin number. Ah, we get to reprise the rumba, mi chica, Alonzo said, pulling Jessica close at the very same moment she spotted James standing across the hall. How long had he been there? Jessica's heart stuttered inside her chest at the sight of him in deep conversation with Mr. Buster Wright, Sophie Morris's longtime neighbor, probably discussing the funeral or whatever Mr. Wright wanted to hash out. The next moment, Alonzo swung Jessica about, tightening his grip on her hand. When she glanced up again, Buster had disappeared, but a young woman with wavy brunette hair was now chatting James up. They were laughing about something, and Jessica's heart twisted into a pretzel at the smile on James's face. Alonzo did a new move, and Jessica accidentally stepped on his toes. Careful, my sweet, you are not paying attention to me. Uh, sorry, she muttered. I guess we need to be careful we don't sprain an ankle on this slippery floor with opening night less than two weeks away. Maddox would never forgive us, although Lily and Matt, our seconds, wouldn't mind at all. In fact, they're probably secretly rooting for us to have an accident so they can steal a few moments of fame, such as it is. So sardonic, my love. Alonzo pulled Jessica closer and his lips brushed against her forehead. Hey, buddy, cut it out. Alonzo swept her into a corner so they were on the outskirts of the dancers rather than in the middle. I can't help it if I'm interested in you, Jess, Alonzo told her, his hand gripping hers. I know we tease each other and I call you all sorts of endearments, but my feelings are real. Can we stop being buddies and go out on a real date? The man's confession stopped Jessica in her tracks. Her arms dropped to her side, but Alonzo's hand stayed on her elbow and his head bent low so they could hear each other over the music. But, but you're such a flirt, Alonzo, with everyone. How can I take you seriously? It's the only way I know how to get attention. That's why I came to Snow Valley. I didn't want to lose you to your pastor James without telling you how I feel. I think I'm in love with you. Surely not. Jessica stopped. Alonzo wasn't joking any longer. This is... I don't know what to say. Please just say you'll give me a chance before you run off with anyone else. You mean James Douglas? He shrugged. I'm not so sure James wants to run off with you anymore. What are you talking about? Take a look, my pet. Alonzo said with a bluntness Jessica had never heard before. Her dance partner turned her shoulders so that Jessica was staring out over the crowded hall. Past the couples. Past the rambunctious youngsters and their parents who were wrangling them. Past the teenagers dancing together in groups and goofing off. James wasn't standing by the punch bowl any longer. He and the woman she'd never seen before had sat down together and were talking to each other as if their lives depended on it. Your pastor is deep in conversation with another woman, and I tend to doubt that he'd conduct church business or listen to confession at a social event. So what if he's talking to one of the members of his congregation? James does that for a living. But if I'm not mistaken, that woman is madly in love with him. You're crazy. Jessica said, punching him in the arm. You're just making that up to irritate me. Alonzo shrugged. I can see it all over her face and in her body language, and I'm a pretty good judge of body language. This is silly. It doesn't mean James's feelings have changed. He proposed barely three weeks ago. And got turned down, may I remind you? James is a pastor. He's the kind of man that wants a woman by his side, through thick and thin, bad times and good times, at home and helping him with the flock while he's the shepherd. Devotion, darling. You need to think about it. He's too good for me, Jessica whispered. I think I've always thought so, from the beginning. 
He's moving on. Jessica gritted her teeth. I really hate that expression. Alonzo sighed deeply. I'm not trying to hurt you, Jessica, but you need to face reality. You need to figure out what your feelings are, and you can't keep stringing James along. Or me. Jessica glanced up into his face, wondering whether to believe him. Were his feelings for her sincere, or was he merely being a big flirt? Partners gotta stick together, he added with a small shrug. Jessica gazed across the room at James again. Who was that woman? She had never seen her before. Until the funeral this morning. Even then, she hadn't liked the way the woman stared up at James at the podium, her eyes never wavering from the pastor's face. She must be new to town, but James hadn't mentioned her. He usually kept Jessica up to date with the news of Snow Valley. So why hadn't he mentioned this attractive female? Because he had to conceal his feelings? Because he was entertaining romantic thoughts about her? Jessica felt sick to her stomach. All of a sudden, she really wanted to go home. A little girl with bouncy ringlets and wearing a pale pink lace dress came running across the floor to launch herself into the woman's lap. The young woman nuzzled the child's ear, tickling her while that mass of glossy brown hair fell across her face. When James greeted the little girl with an intimate tenderness, Jessica's heart ripped into a hundred pieces. This woman had a daughter, and she did not act as though she were still married. And James appeared comfortable with the woman and her daughter. They fulfilled the need James had to take care of someone. She'd be his perfect preacher's wife, including giving him an instant family. A moment later, James rose, murmured a casual goodbye, and then scanned the party crowd. When his eyes lit upon Jessica's face, she made a half turn away from him, blinking to clear the sudden tears. He's coming over, Alonzo said, dropping the foreign pet names for once in his life. Do I have red eyes? Jessica said with panic. Alonzo shook his head. The lights are too low. You look perfect. Beautiful. James strode closer, and Jessica was finally able to give him a wavering smile. I'll be at the food table when you need me, Alonzo said, giving a quick glance between Jessica and James, and then grinning mischievously. Chapter 15 Jessica barely heard Alonzo's parting shot, because suddenly James was there, taking her hand. May I have this dance, Miss Jessica Mason? She couldn't speak, just nodded mutely, and then suddenly Jessica was in James's arms, his hand around hers, warm and firm. Her heart was in her throat, emotions spilling all over the place, although she gulped them back and tried not to look as if she was in pain. The last few weeks had been so awkward between them. Jessica wasn't good at pretending things were normal after a misunderstanding or a fight, or giving a no to a marriage proposal. Not that it had ever happened before. James's face brushed against her hair and Jessica smelled the musky aftershave he wore and tried not to swoon. Her heart hammered in her chest. Being in his arms was a dream and she wanted to cling to him. But she held back, afraid and uncertain. I've been worrying that you'd hate me, she finally said. I know I've been difficult on the phone. I just didn't know what to say to you after. You know. Even if we never marry, Jess, I'll always love you. You've been my best friend these last 15 months. You make me laugh. You keep me on my toes. I think you have a soft heart inside you even if you keep it hidden under a tough exterior. I hope that's a compliment. He chuckled softly. <laughs> it is. When you left New Orleans, it occurred to me that I wasn't sure if you'd ever call me again. I didn't know if we were still together or if we'd accidentally just broken up. 
His fingers were warm around hers and his lips lowered to her ear so they could talk. For many couples, a no means that it's over. Jessica took a ragged breath, trying not to get emotional. And tonight I realized that you've moved on. He frowned. What do you mean? The woman over there? The one I'm trying not to give dagger eyes to? You mean April Murphy? Jessica shrugged, trying not to lose it. You two seemed really intense a few minutes ago. Her husband died recently. In combat, he was a Marine. Oh, goodness, that's awful, Jessica said in a low voice. How tragic for her and her daughter. James nodded. It's been difficult, but she's a tough woman, and she's making plans on how to get her life back together. Jessica swallowed hard. I have a feeling those plans might include you. Alonzo said she's in love with you. James had the decency to look surprised, but he didn't deny it. You felt it then. We've had some nice conversations, but I'm also her spiritual advisor at the moment. How convenient that Pastor John is out of town right now. Please don't be catty, Jess. She took a small step backward, leaning out to stare at him. His crystal blue eyes focused on hers with an intense scrutiny that made shame creep up her neck. I'm sorry. See? I'm not a very nice person. It's actually nice to know that you're a little bit jealous. I have no right to be. I'm losing you, and I have no idea what to do about it. He pulled her in again and circled to the beat. His arm was around her waist, heat coming off of him in the familiar waves of attraction they'd had from the moment they first met. Let's just enjoy the music, he said, and not worry about it right now. It's not like I'm going to run off and marry April next month. But it's crossed your mind. Jessica's voice actually broke. She'd make the perfect pastor's wife. She's pregnant, James suddenly blurted out in a low tone. Jessica had a feeling he hadn't meant to tell her that, but it was part of the whole package of April Murphy. Jessica said, I won't say anything. Who would I have to tell? It's her husband's child. I didn't think anything otherwise, but she has a long, hard road ahead of her with two babies. She and I look the same age, and a woman who's so young with small children needs a husband. How convenient for her to move to Snow Valley and meet her new husband so quickly and easily. James, the pastor dude. He laughed at the title Sam always called him. What Jessica used to call him before their relationship got serious. What if I told you that I'd quit the ballet company so we could marry and actually live in the same town? I never expected to hear that come out of your mouth. He paused, but only for a moment. You know you don't mean that. And I could never ask you to quit. You're a dancer with every fiber of your being, every muscle, every toe, every graceful line of your neck and arms shouts that you were born to dance. I do love your legs, you know. Jessica gave him a shaky smile. Seems I've heard that once or twice. The music changed into a slow two-step, and James held her a smidgen closer, his breath warm on her ear. I can't ask you to be someone you're not. If you gave up your dancing, you'd hate me within two years. Do you think so little of me? Am I that shallow? Okay, five years, he added, trying to get her to laugh. You know it, my adorable Jess, deep in your heart. That would be worse for both of us. Maybe we have to face facts. But I love you. Now Jessica was crying. I don't know how to reconcile us, because I can't ask you to give up the ministry either. Aunt Sophie gave me a small inheritance to start a dance studio here in Snow Valley. James let out a low whistle. How very generous of her. 
It is generous and thoughtful, and maybe it's a sign. Perhaps I should move back home instead of dancing on a stage. I could pass on the love of the art and the skills, inspire another young girl to become a ballerina. You have too much of your own potential to give it up to teach ten-year-olds with bony knees and no posture. You're just making it sound dreadful, so I'll laugh. He chuckled. <laughs> of course. I like to hear you laugh. Teaching is a noble calling, but we'd still be in the same boat. You'd still be giving up your life's work, your dream. Jessica buried her face in his suit coat, tugging on his tie, adoring the heat of his skin, the line of his jaw, the lips she wanted to kiss forever. All those perfect things she noticed about him every time he was close. I can't say goodbye to you. A tear rolled down her cheek, and James reached up to wipe it away. Would you give Alonzo a chance? He asked. He's been throwing daggers at me with his eyes, figuratively speaking, for the last ten minutes. Jessica shook her head, bewildered at his question. Is that a request to give Alonzo a chance or a question about my sanity? He's annoying, but he can also be sweet, so it depends. On what? You? She hadn't been aware of it, but they had stopped dancing despite the music, the swirling couples, and the sparkling white lights. The magical evening was anything but enchanting, though. Having a serious conversation on a dance floor in public wasn't what Jessica had had in mind. And she was leaving in the morning. James cupped her face in his hands and her breath caught in her throat. He stared down at her, so close, so handsome. She placed her own palms against his hands, entwining their fingers, desperately wanting him to kiss her, to see if he still gave her that same jumpy sensation in her stomach, especially after these last uncertain, heart-wrenching weeks. But Jessica couldn't do that to him, not in front of the entire town. Do you trust me, Jessica? Do you believe in me? All of a sudden, Jessica wondered if he'd kissed April Murphy, the pastor husband chaser. But when she gazed deep into James's blue, blue eyes, she knew he hadn't. He wouldn't do that, not until they had officially broken up. Her brow furrowed at his question. Of course. I trust you and believe in you, implicitly. Then will you keep on trusting me while we figure this out, one way or another? She gave him a small smile. I think you're saying that I'm supposed to have faith. And you know I'm still not very good at that. He leaned down to kiss her cheek, speaking softly. Practice, my love. It just takes practice. Before Jessica could respond, Alonzo appeared behind James's shoulder. Cutting in, he announced, grasping her arm. While her ballet partner twirled her away, Jessica glanced back over her shoulder. The man she had deeply loved for more than a year just smiled, as if he knew she would go back to New Orleans and forget about him as if he knew that Jessica should move on with another man, just as he was moving on with Mrs. April Murphy. His expression conveyed that he was letting her go, and was just waiting for Jessica to figure it out for herself. Chapter 16 James's mood turned melancholy after he parted from Jessica on the dance floor. They still hadn't officially broken up because neither of them wanted to, but there seemed to be no way out of their predicament. Dear Lord, how can I live without her? At the moment, fatigue was hitting and he wasn't thinking very clearly. What a day it had been. First, the revelation from April about her pregnancy before he was barely awake. The funeral of Sophie Morris 
And then a hundred conversations with various members of the family and congregation after the graveside service, followed by socializing during the family luncheon. Now he was trying to dance with every woman and girl at the Easter ball so that he didn't look like he was choosing favorites. Smiling, laughing, and chatting some more. He'd probably lose his voice by morning and was practically dead on his feet. There was still tomorrow's Sunday sermon to run through, too. Uncle John couldn't return home soon enough. James knew the workload wasn't really all that bad, and he actually enjoyed his life's calling. He loved meeting people and helping them through their problems and joys. It was part of who he was. It was the emotional roller coaster with Jessica that was getting to him. He filled a plate of food from the buffet table and sat down at one of the corner tables to eat. His cell phone buzzed in his pocket. A text message from Uncle John. That was unusual. Heard from an old friend. Interesting proposition. Set aside some time for me on Monday when I return. I need to talk to you. By the way, Cora's sister is doing better, at least for the moment. No more funerals for a while. James typed, That's good news, and my curiosity is definitely piqued. May I join you? April stood in front of him with a loaded plate of food. Please, sit down. James got up and pulled out her chair. Much better not to eat alone. That's the truth. When I don't feel like cooking, Daphne and I often have a bowl of popcorn and string cheese while we watch a Disney movie. The salty popcorn seems to settle my stomach. Whatever trick works, right? He smiled at her. I also need to introduce you to Max Hamilton. He's done courses in taxes and insurance. Maybe he can recommend the best direction for your educational and financial goals. I'd appreciate that very much. April took a bite from her plate and chewed thoughtfully, staring out at the dancers. Particularly Alonzo, who was now teaching Jessica a swing step variation. James focused on his food, not wanting to watch them dance not wanting to think about the hours they spent together practicing choreography. In many ways, they seemed to fit well together, but maybe that was just because they were both such skilled dancers. Anything more between them was just an illusion. When he rose from his chair to grab drinks, James was startled to see that April was gazing at him with an odd expression. Is something wrong? Are you feeling okay? Not at all. Just musing on Snow Valley and its inhabitants. Like you. James felt himself go still, wondering where she was going with the conversation. I was watching you with that girl. Jessica Mason, right? I understand she's a professional ballerina. She's a native of the town, born and bred. Her dad's the dentist, and Jess is very talented. James kept his reply short and sweet, not relishing where this might go. April touched his arm. Don't worry, I'm not about to spill any more alarming secrets. I appreciate your concern for me and Daphne as well as your friendship. But... She paused and James waited, his heart in his throat. Okay, I admit, I thought maybe we'd get to know each other better... Down the road, you know? Gosh, this is getting embarrassing. Don't be embarrassed. You're an attractive and very nice woman, April. Okay, thanks, but I'm not fishing for compliments. I see the way you look at Jessica. Your eyes. Wow. Well, nobody has to knock me over the head to convince me that you're madly in love with her. James tried not to appear as stunned as he felt. Is it that obvious? Unquestionably. Reminds me of Roy when we were dating and first married. The best time of my whole life. Except Daphne's birth might be a tiny notch higher on the rung of amazing. James gave a laugh. <laughs> I can imagine so. It's remarkable that you can look back with such pleasure. 
not allowing anger or grief to color your memories. I admire you for handling this tough road with faith and poise. You're a good man, James, even though I'm lonely beyond belief and overwhelmed. I don't want to be second choice. No, James said. You shouldn't ever be. You don't deserve that. Maybe someday a man will look at me with that kind of love again. Not just because I'd make a respectable wife or provide an instant family, but because he couldn't live without me. James nodded, trying not to feel guilty at the same time. Very wise words, April, he said softly. She bit at her lips, obviously resigned, but also wanting to do the right thing. A moment later, she lifted her head to stare hard at him. Now, go figure out what you have to do, Pastor James, to be with the woman you truly want to spend the rest of your life with. Chapter 17 it was the day before opening night of Swan Lake, and Jessica was a complete wreck. Her ankles wobbled, her palms were sweaty, and Alonzo was driving her insane. Maddox yelled, Where is your brain, Jessica Mason? Take five and then come back to center stage. Do it perfectly or you're fired. Shocked gasps sounded, and then dead silence filled the auditorium. Jessica gulped fighting a stream of tears. Fired? For missing a couple of steps? She did know better and that it was unacceptable, but she had never heard those words before and tried not to let it rattle her. Instead, she staggered off the stage, wondering where her demeanor had gone as well as her dancing skills. He's just blowing smoke, Sierra said when Jessica passed her in the wings on her way to the restroom. Maddox can't fire you, at least not until after the run of Swan Lake. So he'll fire me after the production is over? That's comforting. Course he can get rid of you, Monica added, listening to their conversation. He's a jerk and he'd rather get rid of you than have his production get bad reviews. Jessica clenched her teeth. You're not helping, Monica. She reached the hallway and lurched to the drinking fountain then headed to the ladies' room. What was wrong with her? She had been struggling ever since her return from Snow Valley two weeks ago. Her focus was shot to pieces, and she missed James desperately. Jessica had come to the full realization that she was hopelessly in love with him and had lost him forever. Her pillow was wet every single night with tears, and she had no idea how to heal her heart. Every day, it felt as broken as a precious antique vase smashed to the floor. Men problems, Sierra said when Jessica came out of the stall. Of course not, she replied, turning on the water. Sierra was the last person she'd confide in. It's always men problems. Sierra leaned against the wall, one leg bent to brace herself, her pink toe shoes perfectly tied and knotted. Who else jerks our emotions around? Perhaps Sierra was wiser than Jessica gave her credit for. She and James had only spoken a few brief times on the phone. He seemed to be really busy with a new project for Pastor John. Jessica resented the fact that she was putting in 12-hour days since Easter weekend and didn't have time to do anything but eat a sandwich and fall into bed every night. When she slammed the bathroom door shut and returned backstage, Alonzo was there, taking her arm, murmuring words of comfort. Ever since he thought he had a chance with her, he dropped the accents and the silliness, but Jessica couldn't look at him as more than a dance partner. James had ruined her heart forever. And her director was right. She was dancing woodenly. Because she'd lost her heart in Snow Valley and couldn't ever get it back. Vernon Maddox shouted from the darkened theater, Mason, back on stage now. 
After digging her toe shoes into the resin box, Jessica ran out under the spotlight to rehearse the dance piece again. By the end of the day, she had managed to push thoughts of James from her mind, shoving them into a dark corner so she could focus and keep her job. Better, Maddox growled when she exited the stage after the finale, sweating like a pig. No more dancing like a broken doll. This isn't an amateur production of The Nutcracker, but one of the finest ballets ever created. Jessica bowed her head and curtsied an apology. Yes, sir. She didn't allow herself to dream about James or wonder what he was doing with April Murphy any longer. In order to survive, she encased her heart in stone. She would become the dancer she was destined to be. It would be enough. It had to be enough. Which was why Jessica was stunned speechless when the next night after the second curtain call at the end of a smashing opening night, pastor dude James Douglas himself knocked on the door of her dressing room. It was 11 o'clock and Jessica had just finished removing her makeup and thrown a sweater over her leotard. She planned to shower at home where it was warmer and she could jump right into her pajamas. Jessica couldn't wait to fall into her bed where she planned to sleep until noon, eat a huge lunch, and then head back to the Orpheum for warm-ups for Saturday's performance. When she opened the door to the dressing room, Jessica stopped in her tracks. Was she seeing an apparition? James Douglas was like a dream come to life. The nutcracker soldier turning into a handsome prince in Clara's dream. Except that this was Jessica Mason's dream. For several long moments, they didn't speak, just stared at each other. How did you get in? Jessica finally stammered. A woman named Sierra told me how to find the right corridor to your dressing room. After I watched the most beautiful performance of Swan Lake I've ever seen, I told her I just had to meet Jessica Mason listed in the program. Sierra was amused and pointed out your room. Jessica put a hand to her mouth and laughed. <laughs> well, it's not my personal dressing room. I share it with Monica. But tonight was probably the only performance of Swan Lake you've ever seen. James lifted his shoulders into a shrug and then quirked his beautiful mouth into a grin. She was still trying to absorb the fact that he was actually here, and not in Snow Valley at his desk in the church offices. You actually had a ticket for tonight? You were in the audience, watching me? You flew to New Orleans just for this? He gave a hearty laugh, his eyes never leaving her face. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. I told you I was coming for opening night. I bought my ticket ages ago. You didn't have to feel obligated to come. You could have sold it or got it refunded. The flight must have cost a fortune. And what about your church duties? What about April Murphy? April who? Jessica's throat hurt. Her entire body and heart and soul were raw from nerves, from hope, and from fear. What's going on here, Pastor Dude? Hey, that's James to you, Jessica Mason, prima ballerina. Her lips quirked up into a grin. I do believe the humidity of New Orleans has gone to your head, Pastor. Nope. A girl named Jess has gone to my head. She's completely messed me up, forever. She's imprinted her soul with mine. Without warning... James dropped to one knee and grasped her hand. Jessica tried to pull away, but he just gripped it even tighter. You're crazy, James. Come on, don't joke about this. It hurts too much. I'm not joking. I've never been more serious in my life. She bit at her lip. But nothing has changed. We're still living with a dilemma that has no solution. James kissed her hand and then stared up into Jessica's eyes. Uncle John decided he's not going to retire yet. 
said he's been thinking about delaying it for a long time but didn't know how to break it to me. Early retirement doesn't suit him. He misses the youth and the counseling and the sermons. Jessica frowned. What are you saying? That he's firing you? That changes your entire mission of moving to Snow Valley. What about Lydia? Lydia's going away to college soon, and my uncle hasn't taken me off the payroll yet. But isn't Pastor John's wife hoping he was going to retire and they could travel? He's changing up his entire life and his wife's, plus yours. This has nothing to do with me or us. He's not that noble. James's eyes twinkled, and Jessica knew he was teasing about the last part. But he's been working on something else for me. And it finally fell into place, or right into our laps, like a miracle. Jessica lifted an eyebrow. What, a bag of gold? Without answering, James slipped one hand into the pocket of his suit coat and brought out the same gorgeous diamond ring he'd proposed with six weeks ago. Jessica couldn't speak a single word as he slipped it onto her finger. It fit even better this time, which meant that he'd had it resized before coming back to New Orleans. The engagement ring fit so perfectly, her heart was about to burst. Snow Valley may be the best little town in the entire country, but it's a little quiet for a 29-year-old who has decided that he needs a bit more experience before taking on an entire congregation. And I've always had a yearning to help inner-city kids. To set up a youth program in a bigger city. To feel like I'm doing more than attending potlucks and charity balls. Jessica tried to grasp what he was saying, but her heart was thudding so loudly she could barely register the words. My salary as a dancer would ensure that we're paupers. He shook his head, his eyes sparkling under the lights of the dressing room. Uncle John has a friend of a friend here in New Orleans who has been looking for a youth pastor. The information only came to Pastor John's ears after you left the weekend of Sophie Morris's funeral. You're moving here? Jessica had to say the words to make sure she'd heard them correctly. As in leaving Snow Valley and living here in New Orleans? The one and only Big Easy. I've done all the interviews, met the church staff, and I can't wait to get started on my new calling as a pastor. Right now, I'm staying at a hotel until I can find a place for us to live. Us? If you'll... Marry me, Jessica, James said, speaking in a low, sweet voice that made every limb of Jessica's body tremble with passion and longing for him. I, I couldn't get a wedding ready until at least the fall. My work schedule? The cost? James, I've got to save my money. We'll have a wedding whenever you want, my love. Just tell me you won't wait more than a year. I'm not sure I could stand it. Six months tops, and we're going to save our money and plan it together. The best wedding Snow Valley has ever seen. Jessica was speechless. You've been keeping this a secret all this time? I didn't want to get our hopes up and have it all fall through, but the job was offered to me this morning, and I immediately accepted I'm so proud of you, James. It sounds perfect. Tears pricked at Jessica's eyes. So, is that ring staying on your finger this time? Jessica nodded, not trusting her voice. She slid her hand out of James's and held her fist to her heart. I'm never taking it off. He laughed. So the answer is yes, and I can get up off this cold floor? Yes, 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 Jessica said with a small cry of joy. James rose to his feet and wrapped his arms around her, lifting Jessica off the ground to twirl her in a circle, the gold tutu she was wearing crunching around them. But she didn't care. 
The only thing Jessica cared about was that the man she loved had his arms around her, that he was sweeping her off her feet, and her heart was soaring into her throat, ears ringing with a giddy joy. I feel like I'm inside a dream, she said when her feet slid down to touch the floor once more. Just then, James's cell phone rang. Who's calling this late at night? Jessica teased. James stared down at the face of the phone and then pressed the video talk button. It's Uncle John, and it's only ten o'clock in Snow Valley. Pastor John's familiar voice and face came through the receiver. Did you ask her? Don't keep me in suspense, you two. James gave a booming laugh. <laughs> You're acting like a kid at Christmas, Uncle John. The older man chuckled. It's going to feel like Christmas when I perform your wedding. It's about time. So, yes, Jessica? Yes, yes, and yes, she answered, speaking directly into the phone. At last, hallelujah. Uncle John gave a fist pump from 2,000 miles away. You didn't have to find a new position for your nephew, you know, Jessica admonished the older pastor. I'm sure Cora would love for you to be retired. Retirement and wives are incompatible, even semi-retirement. Cora said I was driving her crazy being underfoot. Honestly, Snow Valley doesn't need two pastors, not for at least ten years, about the time when I can no longer give a thirty-minute sermon without falling headlong into the pews and breaking my cane. Or my head. You and Cora are two dear hearts, Jessica said affectionately. It turns out that the minister in New Orleans has been looking for someone like James for a long time. Word takes time to get out in the pastoral circles. It's going to be hard work for James setting up the new church programs and getting to know the youth and their parents, but I know you two can figure it out. James will be fantastic. Jessica said, leaning against him while he wrapped his arms around her. After the wedding, you two go live your lives until Jessica retires as a famous ballerina and then come back to Snow Valley in time to speak at my funeral. Very funny, James said, but Jessica noticed the sentimental look that crossed his face. He loved his uncle and Pastor John had just given them a tremendous gift by helping them figure out a way to be together. A few minutes later, they said goodbye and hung up the phone. Almost immediately, the lights in the corridors of the Orpheum began to shut off. We'd better go before we get locked in, Jessica warned. Not quite yet, my girl. James circled her waist with his arms and then brought Jessica close. Finally, after so many weeks, his lips were on hers, warm and tender and full of promise, and Jessica never wanted him to stop. It's about time you quit talking and kissed me, Pastor Dude, she whispered against his lips. He lifted her off her feet and twirled her around. Can we seal this proposal with a kiss? He said. No taking it back, no second thoughts. You know I'm going to glue that ring to your finger. No more questions, no more doubts. No doubts at all, Jessica told him firmly, her arms around his neck. There never was a doubt. Only the right time with the right person. The underground halls and dressing rooms were now deserted. The place was quiet, and they were completely alone. A combination of comfort and thrill came over Jessica. There was no other place in all the world she'd rather be than with James. He was her love and her best friend, the only one she wanted to go through the ups and downs of life with. Emotion overcame her when she thought of him surprising her by flying all the way to New Orleans to be with her on such an important opening night. That meant the world to her. And then moving to New Orleans to be with her? It was perfect. 
He was perfect. They might stay in New Orleans for years, or their careers might take them anywhere in the country. But those were decisions they could make together, to figure out as life unfolded. No living apart or living without each other, James said, tracing Jessica's lips with a finger. We'll seal that promise every single day, Mr. James Douglas, Pastor Dude. Her eyes misted and Jessica's throat choked up. For all eternity and beyond. Still wearing her ballet shoes, she stood on point and tightened her arms around his neck. They kissed again, softly, longingly, and Jessica's heart bubbled into her throat. Several long moments later, Jessica pushed him out the door so she could finish changing into street clothes. Then she laughingly opened up the dressing room door again, pulling her valise over her shoulder. Heading through the hallways, they at last pushed through the outer doors of the theater into the sparkling black New Orleans night. The smell of misty rain hung in the thick clouds overhead, while spicy shrimp gumbo percolated the cool air. Jessica's face lit up with a smile as she laid her head against Pastor James Douglas's shoulder, the man she adored and loved with all her heart, as they walked forward, arm in arm, into the future. Epilogue Christmas Wedding Bells Jessica stood in the center of the family room with Mrs. Snow, one of her mother's longtime friends and a talented seamstress, putting the final touches on her wedding veil. Her younger brother Sam blasted jingle bells from the living room speakers, singing as loud as he could and strumming on his guitar like there was no tomorrow. Hey, keep it down, she yelled through the adjoining double doors. Sounds like you're making up some outlandish new lyrics. Sam let out a good-natured growl, but the volume only came down a tiny notch. I'm practicing to serenade Lydia, he said with a laugh, referring to his girlfriend of almost four years. They were both juniors at the university in Billings, home for the Christmas holidays, and inseparable. <laughs> I'm sure Lydia is just dying to be serenaded with jingle bells, Jessica told him, laughing. You're such a romantic. It's for a spoof on New Year's in Billings. My band got a gig at a restaurant. Sam did have a good singing voice, and he and a couple of his college friends had started their own band. <laughs> you didn't tell me, Jessica accused. That's fantastic. I wish James and I could go, but we'll be on our honeymoon. On a ship in the middle of the ocean. I told him that if we were going to get married in Snow Valley in the winter... We were going to the Bahamas afterwards so I can get warm again. Won't James keep you warm? Sam teased, a silly grin on his face. He waggled his eyebrows for good measure. Sam! Jessica's eyes widened and she jerked her chin toward Mrs. Snow, indicating that there were listening ears too close for comfort. Nothing I haven't heard before, Mrs. Snow said with a wink, tucking and pinning for the final fitting. Now, tell me, dear, how do you plan to do your hair for the wedding day? It might make a difference in how I finish off the crown and tucks. Jessica let out a small sigh. If she had to make one more decision, she'd scream and call the whole thing off. Why in the world had she decided to get married right before Christmas, and right after auditioning for the lead role of Odette in the Swan Lake Ballet? Of course, if she stayed in New Orleans until the ballet company's upcoming production of Swan Lake was finished, it would be next summer before she and James could get married. She had already put him off for an extra four months until the summer run of Cinderella was done, and she was just as eager to marry James as he was to marry her. They had both waited a long time for this day to finally arrive. Originally, they had planned on an August or September wedding, when Jessica had finally accepted his proposal last April and allowed the man she loved to slip the gorgeous diamond ring on her finger. But the last several months ended up a whirlwind of non-stop performances of Cinderella, which meant she couldn't leave New Orleans to get married. 
Besides, there was zero time to plan a wedding, let alone a long-distance one. During all this, James had been in training for his new job as a youth pastor for a church in the French Quarter. Then he needed to relocate and move to the Big Easy, so any free time Jessica had was spent looking at apartments with him and helping him unpack boxes. Even though James's job was challenging, it was also rewarding too, as he became a big brother or father figure to kids without fathers, and teens who struggled to stay in high school, off drugs, and out of gangs. The ministry was a lot of time and work, but the kids were so worth it, and James was loving it. He'd found his calling, his purpose in life. Besides becoming her husband, Jessica thought with a happy smile, she lifted her left hand to admire the sparkling cut of the diamond James had given her at Oak Alley Plantation last April. The ring was perfect, and James was perfect. If only the wedding turned out perfect, too. It almost seemed like the bigger challenge, but she discovered that this feeling of being overwhelmed and running out of time was perfectly normal for every bride. Now, Jessica bit at her lips and shrugged at her dressmaker— I can't decide whether to go all loose curls with a wreath of flowers in my hair, or if I should put it up in a soft, elegant chignon with ringlets floating down the sides. Either one would look beautiful, said Mrs. Snow. By this point in the wedding planning, I wish somebody would just make all the decisions for me, Jessica admitted ruefully. I understand completely. Here's an idea her dressmaker said, stepping backward to gaze at the handiwork of the flowing lace veil that drifted below Jessica's shoulders. Wear it up for the pomp and circumstance of the actual ceremony in the chapel, and then take it down and add the flowers for the reception party. Jessica smiled. That's actually a great idea, thank you. One less thing to worry about. Mrs. Snow cocked her head. No worrying, sweetheart. You are going to be the most beautiful bride Snow Valley has seen in a long time. She grasped Jessica's hands in hers. I just want you to know that I'm very happy for you and our pastor James. You're going to have a full and happy life together. Tears pricked at Jessica's eyes. She swallowed and nodded, giving a tremulous smile in return. I think you're right. I just wish part of your life meant staying here in Snow Valley instead of living in New Orleans. We're going to miss seeing the babies you bring into the world. A self-conscious laugh burst out of Jessica's throat. <laughs> babies, I can't think about that right now. Little ones come sooner than anybody expects, my dear. Jessica had the sudden urge to run downstairs and work out at the bar in the basement for the next two hours just to let off some steam and relax her jittery nerves. Two days until the wedding. Would she survive the final preparations and her family? Or would her family survive Jessica when she had a nervous breakdown? The thought made her smile inside. I think we're done, Miss Jess. Let me help you take off the veil for now and finish the final details. Just a few stitches here and there to make it fit perfectly. Thirty seconds later, Jessica's cell phone rang. It was James, and her heart leapt at the sight of his name appearing on the screen. She punched the talk button, turning away from Mrs. Snow, who was placing the veil in a plastic bag to take home for finishing. I'll bring this back on the morning of the wedding, she mouthed before disappearing out the front door. Hey, baby. James's deep voice came through the receiver. Shivers of pleasure ran down Jessica's neck at the sound of his seductive tenor. For two years, they had lived several states apart, and to think that after the ceremony Friday evening, they would never be apart again. It was almost more than Jessica could take in. Her stomach floated up to her throat when she said into the phone, I miss you, Pastor Dude. That's nice to hear, but I miss you more. Always trying to one-up me, huh? She teased. You know it, he shot back. You've made me wait an awfully long time, Miss Jessica Mason. I've been a patient man. Yes, you have, she whispered. I promise it will be worth the wait. I know that, my beautiful girl. 
I just want to get this wedding show on the road and done so we can ride off into the sunset. The sound of rustling papers came through the phone, and Jessica knew he was probably at his new office in downtown New Orleans. Memories rushed over her remembering all the time she had talked to James when he was in the church offices right here in Snow Valley, talking to his Uncle John, Pastor John, a man she'd known since she was a toddler who would soon become her uncle too. You mean when we ride off into a snowdrift? Jessica glanced out the windows of the living room and hoped Sam would build a fire when he finished talking to Lydia. Those two could talk for hours. Remind me again why we're getting married at Christmas time? In the middle of a Montana winter? When James laughed, Jessica wished he were next to her so she could feel his warm arms wrap around her, as well as laying a few kisses on those amazing lips of his. <laughs> we're getting married now because I wouldn't let you delay it any longer. When I put that ring on your finger, I was hoping for no later than September. When you said next May, I almost took the ring back. Jessica stuck a hand on her hip and did a sassy wiggle, which James couldn't see, but it was the gesture that counted. Oh, you did, did you? You can say that all you want, but I know you're not going anywhere, Pastor Douglas. Now we've regressed to a last name basis. Might be safer until the wedding night. The honeymoon, I mean. Oh, you know what I mean. Jessica blushed furiously, embarrassed to talk about their upcoming intimacy while in the middle of her parents' house with Sam a mere ten feet away. Her fiancé's chuckle was low and thrilling. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean, my love. I'm counting the hours until I have you alone. There are too many people at your house all the time. I can't even give you a decent kiss anymore. So how many hours until our wedding vows? Jessica wasn't going to let him off the hook. Exactly 54 and, he paused, 23 minutes. Does that mark the actual time of the wedding? Nope. That's when we check into the starry skies bed and breakfast, and I carry you into the honeymoon suite. Jessica made her voice sound innocent as well as ignorant. Is that where we're staying Friday night after the reception? You are such a tease, he growled. You know perfectly well. Yes, I do, my adorable James. And I'm counting down the hours, too. So, sweetheart, I called to give you some good news. You mean better than 54 hours until the wedding hour? She liked to hear him laugh. It was so easy and so much fun. A rush of longing swept through her. Fifty-four hours was still an awfully long time after so many months. Get ready to launch into a pirouette, he announced. We got the house. Jessica gulped. What? Are you serious? The house? You mean our house? The one we put earnest money on? The cute yellow bungalow off the lower garden district? <laughs> the one and only. The owners have accepted our offer and we sign closing papers as soon as we get back to New Orleans. Oh my gosh, oh James, she breathed. I thought it was a long shot that we made the owners nervous about actually coming up with the down payment. It must be my pastor charm, James said. No, it's my graceful nature and long legs, she countered. <laughs> Except when you're a hard-nosed, sarcastic flirt. Take that back, Pastor James. Hey, I like hard-nosed, sarcastic flirts. In fact, I adore a certain one. Oh, well then, I'll forgive you. <laughs> You'd better if we're going to be sharing a house together. I'll even make you breakfast each morning. Now you're talking. And I'll have dinner ready when you get back from the studio. Deal. Now that we have that little tidbit of married life settled. <laughs> oh, James, we have a real house of our own! Jessica squealed with excitement, and her mother came running downstairs to see what was happening. Sam had mysteriously disappeared from the den. Maybe he was in the kitchen, but he was being unusually quiet for an almost 21-year-old with a rock band and a groupie, darling girlfriend, named Lydia Douglas, I'll be there tomorrow night, Jessica, 
Flight is on time, too. Hope you're ready to get married, Mrs. Soon-to-be James Douglas. Counting the hours like you are, you darling man. I'm just worried that you spent all summer kissing that leading man, Alonzo What's-His-Name, on stage during Cinderella after you come out of the white carriage. Jessica made an exasperated sound in her throat. James was referring to the duet, the pas de deux, she had with her dance partner. At one point, Alonzo was on one knee while Jessica did a full 90-degree arabesque as he held her at the waist while she bent over. Their faces were so close, it appeared to the audience as though they were actually sharing a romantic kiss. We don't actually kiss! No ballet dancer smooches while performing. It's not like the movies. I've told you that so many times, Mr. Douglas. I think the lady doth protest too much, James told her, amused. He teased her dreadfully, and she fell for it every time. It's over now, and you didn't have to attend every single performance, although I'm flattered that you came. It was wonderful to know you were there in the audience watching over me like my hero. I've got to keep sure my woman is safe. If something happened, would you run up on stage to save me? You know I would, James said in a low voice. You mean everything to me. Emotion pricked at Jessica's eyes. This man was incredible and amazing and kind and her hero. He'd once run out into the church cemetery, terrified she had frozen herself to Michael's headstone. Then he had jumped up to rescue her when she fell during the sugar plum fairy dance at the Christmas pageant during the same holiday season when they met for the first time. Of course, she blamed him for the fall. I know, she whispered now. You mean everything, and more to me. You saved me three years ago. Literally, figuratively, and spiritually. Even that night on stage, mere hours after the graveyard incident where she thought she might have seen Michael's ghost, a deep connection and attraction had struck between them. When she spotted those amazing crystal blue eyes latching onto hers while she was dancing, the sight of him gazing at her from the audience startled her so badly she twisted her ankle and went straight down on the stage in front of an auditorium of people. Only in Snow Valley did people jump up to help, to enthusiastically applaud, to help one another whether it was the Christmas season or not. She and Pastor James had to get married here. It only made sense. This home. Snow Valley was family, especially their church family. Over 200 invitations had gone out, but the whole town knew they were invited, and many of her childhood friends had married and remained here. Jessica fondly thought about Piper and Gabe Wesson, Katie and Jace McAllister, plus Wade and April Hadley. Porter and Missy Wilson often volunteered to teach Sunday school classes, so James knew them well, too. Heck, after serving as a pastor here the last few years, he knew just about everybody. God brought us together. Or your old friend Michael. But I still think I'm getting the better deal in you, sweetheart. He said now. Are you trying to make me cry? She sputtered. I'll just hop on a plane right now and you can cry on my shoulder. After that, we'll have a passionate makeout session. With all my family roaming the house and making themselves a nuisance? Her mother called out from the kitchen. I heard that. James began laughing so hard Jessica dissolved into giggles. He heard you through the phone, Mom, she called back. Hey, where did your brother run off to? Mrs. Mason asked, coming into the living room. He was here playing his guitar and singing. Then he disappeared, probably went out to get food. I'm fixing a big dinner if James wants to join us. Did you hear that? Jessica asked. Tell your mother I'd love to, and I'll bring Lydia if you don't mind. But it would be easier to arrive on time if it was for dinner tomorrow. I'm still 2,000 miles away. Tomorrow is the rehearsal dinner, and you better be on time, Jessica warned. I think Sam's already out picking up Lydia for dinner tonight. Right now, it's back to wedding planning.
After saying goodbye to James and clicking off, Mrs. Mason tugged Jessica back to the kitchen table to go over the wedding tasks list. We need to figure out who's picking up the flowers and the cake on Friday morning. And right now, we need to go shopping for dinner ingredients. I actually have some invitations that came back from the post office. I was going to hunt down the correct addresses and make some phone calls so people don't feel left out. Even if I resend them, they won't arrive in time. Mrs. Mason frowned. I didn't realize that had happened. They were returned to my apartment in New Orleans. It's too bad I couldn't have come home sooner to finish the wedding prep. Her mother sighed. I kept telling you to make your travel arrangements sooner. Nobody listens to me. I hope I won't be a pariah at church if any of our longtime friends are hurt when they didn't get an invitation. And your invitations turned out so nicely. Jessica tried not to grit her teeth, but continued to put forth a patient smile. That's why I'm making some personal phone calls the rest of the afternoon. Why don't we just order pizza for tonight and I'll make a salad? Pizza? How can we do pizza? That's a Saturday night throw-together meal, not for company. James and Lydia aren't company. They're almost family. There's no time to do a roast or bake a chicken. Besides, we're in countdown mode. We still need to make all the table centerpieces. Mrs. Mason nodded, sighing as she made a notation on her long list she'd titled Jessica's Wedding To-Do List. If you order pizza, I'll throw together a salad. Leaning over, Jessica grimaced at the long list with penciled-in notes, additions, subtractions, phone numbers, and errand list. I think you need to retype that up, Mom, she said, trying not to give in to panic. At least her older sister Catherine had come home a few days early to help out. The two of them had a date tonight with one of Catherine's old friends who owned a bridal boutique in Billings. The three of them were putting together the table centerpieces and backdrop for the reception. It was going to be a woman's work party tonight, and anybody else they could wrangle to the table. Catherine suddenly burst through the door, bringing in a rush of cold air that made Jessica shiver. She hurried to shut the door behind her while her sister unloaded an armful of bags all over the kitchen table. I saw Sam tearing through the intersection. What's up with him? I don't think he even saw me. Seemed very absorbed in his own world. <laughs> He's probably hungry, Jessica said with a laugh. Maybe he was headed to Big C's for a burger since nobody around here is cooking much lately. Ever since your brother got his own vehicle, Mrs. Mason said, peering over her new reading glasses while she tried to make out her own handwriting on the list. He's out and about and can't sit still. Plus, there's his band, Atomic 99. I think he said something about practicing tonight because one of the band members only lives about 30 miles from here. Are you and Alan going for their world premiere on New Year's Eve in Billings? Jessica asked her sister, referring to Catherine's husband. We're going to try. Still have to get a sitter for the girls. Are their flower girls' dresses finished? Jessica asked. Catherine and Alan's two daughters, Amber and Joni, we're thrilled to be in the wedding party. Mrs. Snow sent them over before you got in from New Orleans, and they fit perfectly. They look absolutely adorable. I think the most expensive part of this wedding is procuring hothouse flowers in December, Mrs. Mason said, murmuring to herself as she scribbled at her list. And your granddaughters are just going to toss the flower petals all over the carpet in the church, Jessica couldn't help saying. I'll get Sam to pick them up so I can dry and press them later. Oh, mother, Jessica groaned. No, just no. Besides, Sam's going to want to spend all his wedding time with Lydia. She is one of my bridesmaids, after all, as my new sister-in-law, and looks adorable in the maroon bridesmaid's dress. Mrs. Snow did a fantastic job with those. Her mother smiled with a small sigh of relief. I knew she would. Thank goodness for good friends who also know how to sew and alter and perform other miracles. When does James arrive? Catherine asked. Tomorrow. Sam volunteered to pick him up from the airport so we can finish preparation for the rehearsal dinner. The two of them will head directly from the airport to the church for the rehearsal. I'm sure Sam is just thrilled he's spending his entire Christmas break from school on a girly wedding. Jessica gave her sister a small secret smile. 
He loves me. Catherine lifted an eyebrow. Love only goes so far when it comes to wedding planning. Maybe we should have hired a wedding planner, Mrs. Mason mused, half listening to her daughter's conversation. That would have drained Dad's bank account, Catherine told her. I'll have you know that James and I are covering half of this, Jessica told her pointedly, subtly referring to the fact that Catherine had married after her second year of college, so their parents had foot the entire bill for the poor, struggling students. You girls are too old to fight, Mrs. Mason said, rising from the table to return to the kitchen. And there are too many dishes when everybody is home. But I can't complain when I have all my children and grandchildren around me, and Christmas music playing on the stereo. Jessica and Catherine looked at each other and grinned. Then Jessica reached over to grab the list their mother had been working on after she left the room. Look at this, she said, flattening the sheet. No, multiple sheets in front of her sister. She even has notes for Pastor John for the ceremony. A timeline of events at the rehearsal dinner and the reception. Mom is going to drive me berserk. Catherine nodded giving her own grimace. The errands alone are going to take someone all day tomorrow and Friday morning before we dress for the wedding itself. Mom loves to micromanage, and I just want to run away. I can't even sleep at night running through my own mental lists over and over. That's not good, Jess, Catherine said sympathetically. You want to be beautiful and refreshed for Friday, your wedding day, for James. The wedding day is exciting and fun, but it's also really, really long. You'll be exhausted by the time the reception is over. Especially if we stay at the church dancing until midnight. The DJ we hired is pretty pricey. But James and I do love to dance. Really? You love to dance, sis? Catherine quirked both eyebrows. I would have never guessed. Okay, smarty pants, you know what I mean. I do. And when I got married, I was only 20, and Mom steamrolled me. But honestly, just go with it. Brush off her comments or worries. And don't look at the lists again. They are her lists, not yours. Jessica sighed and smiled wanly. You're right. Her sister's voice softened. Hey, Mom's in heaven right now. And you are too busy with fittings and final decisions that have to be made and James not even getting here until the end of the week. Besides the other issues weighing on your mind, like waiting to hear about your new house and chewing all your fingernails off wondering if your audition for Swan Lake was good enough to get you the lead. Jessica clasped Catherine's hand across the table. I never knew you paid that much attention to me and my life. Thank you for that. I do care, sweetie. And I'm very happy for you and... What? Does Sam call him? Pastor dude? Jessica laughed. I think I called him that first, but don't tell him that. Your secret is safe with me. Catherine wrapped her arms around Jessica. I love you, little sister. You're going to be a beautiful bride, and I think you and James are going to be very happy together, despite the rocky road to get here and all your differences. Jessica leaned back to look at her. What's that supposed to mean? Hey, nothing. But who ever heard of a ballerina and a pastor falling in love? Overcoming the odds? Different personalities? Your crises of faith with a man of unwavering faith? I think it's pretty amazing, actually. Your lives are not going to be boring. I love everything you just said. And I think you're right. I also had no idea you were so aware of me the last several years, when you've been off raising a family for almost a decade. I pay more attention than anyone realizes. Besides, Catherine lowered her voice, glancing about for listening mothers. Who wouldn't fall in love with Pastor James? He's gorgeous and kind and smart and intuitive, the perfect ingredients for a religious man, especially with the right woman at his side. Which is you, Jessica. Wow, I think I'm feeling the pressure now. Just make him happy. That's all you have to do, and he'll stick to you like glue. Okay, I need to go find my girls downstairs in the basement and make sure they haven't torn the place apart. Maybe even do some laundry before this place goes nuts tomorrow.
James arrived without a hitch, and Jessica launched into his arms the moment he showed up at the front door, driven by Sam from the airport. I have missed you so much, Jessica whispered against his lips, while chilly air wafted indoors. I'm so glad the plane was a little early so I could see you here in private instead of meeting directly at the church. James shut the door with his foot while Sam and Amber and Joni made obnoxious kissing noises. Did you say private? He asked, his mouth quirking upward. Minutes later, the household became a flurry of showers, getting dressed and racing to the church for the rehearsal. The dinner that evening was catered by a new woman in town who'd become a chef and ran her own catering business out of her home. The flower girls, bridesmaids, and the bride and groom went through their paces up the aisles of the church perfectly two times before Pastor John declared it was a success and ordered everybody to go enjoy the catered meal. There were the usual winter and snow jokes, but actually, this year December was milder than normal. No piles of snow yet. Just frozen ground and pale blue skies. The florist called to say they'd received a shipment of stunning roses and orchids for the bouquets and boutonnieres, a task James had taken care of as the groom, with Jessica's help in choosing the arrangements and colors. All evening during the meal and afterward, Sam cracked silly jokes and Jessica wondered about him. She worried more about his strange behavior than ever, hoping to uncover what was causing him to act differently than normal. Her brother was thrilled about the success Atomic 99 was enjoying. He also loved his business classes at college, rejecting a career in dentistry like Dr. Mason, who had hoped his only son would inherit the practice. But the young man had a job and paid his own rent and billings, along with an apartment of roommates, most of whom were in his band. A fortuitous situation indeed. But even though Sam was talkative and funny as ever, he also seemed a little aloof, avoiding any real conversations. He seemed to be hiding something, and Jessica couldn't figure out what it was. She could never get her brother alone for five minutes to pull him aside and grill him. After the rehearsal dinner, the family spent the rest of the evening decorating the church hall for the reception, including friends and neighbors who pitched in to help. This place turned out gorgeous! Jessica cried, gazing at the twinkling white lights hanging around the walls and the tables. The orchid centerpieces floating in crystal bowls and candles would be exquisite once they were lit the next evening. The maroon tablecloths were perfect, the chairs draped in yards of the same linen. Catherine and her girls had also completed setting up the guest book table, adding pictures of Jessica and James in pretty frames. From the kitchen came the sound of the caterer and her staff hauling in food and serving dishes, gusts of cold night air rushing along the floor. Even the DJ had arrived to set up his equipment and check the speakers before the big day. I told you our wedding was going to be perfect, James said, wrapping his arms around Jessica to hold her close. You did, huh? You didn't have to do most of the work. I think I made a wise choice to stay out of everyone's way, but I did carry in a lot of tables and chairs. I love those muscles of yours and the way you carried four chairs at once, you pastor hunk. That's a new nickname, but I think it suits me. Don't let it go to your head, Jessica retorted. Now, remember, after tonight, I won't see you again until the ceremony tomorrow at five o'clock. James made a face. Does that tradition still exist? Thought somebody from the 21st century would have abolished it by now. It's bad luck for the groom to see the bride before the wedding, she said, trying to sound serious. We don't want to curse our wedding, do we? As long as it doesn't curse our marriage, right? Hmm, I'll have to look into that one. I was hoping to sneak away for a quiet breakfast, just the two of us before the day turns completely insane. You mean before the day turns beautiful and meaningful? We do get to have breakfast in bed on Sunday morning, Jessica reminded him, kissing him softly on the lips. I like the sound of that, James murmured, 
deepening the kiss until Jessica saw stars bursting behind her eyes. You'd better get home before I carry you off right now. Okay, Pastor Dude. I'll see you tomorrow at the altar. They kissed one last time and reluctantly parted, James giving Jessica a final grin while blowing her a kiss. It was all coming together at last. The church looked fantastic. The wedding dinner would be delicious. Their honeymoon warm and full of sunshine and sand. And a house of their own to move into when they returned to New Orleans. The next morning, Jessica slept in, curling up under a mountain of luxurious blankets before jumping up to run a hot bath. The water heater soon ran out as everyone showered for the day. Breakfast turned into lunch instead, and then it was time to get dressed. Catherine helped Jessica with her hair and makeup, and the hours became a special moment shared between the two sisters. You should go to beauty school, Jessica told her. I love how you made my skin appear flawless. You already have porcelain skin, little sister. I've always been envious of that in your perfect dancer's figure. I have to starve myself sometimes. Well, don't turn anorexic on me. Don't worry about that. I like cinnamon rolls too much. And dinner out at restaurants. But I think I burn it off with all the hours of practice. Catherine gave Jessica a mirror to look at the upswept hairdo and ringlets before fastening on the crowning veil. When Jessica rose to look into the full-length mirror in the bathroom, a fizz of excitement rose into her stomach. Oh my, this really was the perfect dress. You look absolutely stunning, Catherine told her. I adore the scalloped lace along the top. It almost looks like the bodice of one of your ballet outfits. Perfect choice for you. My stomach is jumping around so badly, I want to run and scream and shout with happiness. Catherine smiled fondly. I remember feeling that way on my wedding day. When you got married, I was only 15, and hanging out with Michael so much, I never really paid attention, Jessica said, regretfully, and then suddenly snapped her fingers. Last night, do you remember seeing the wreath of flowers I'm going to wear for the reception? I visited the florist yesterday, and she's keeping your wreath and bouquet in her shop cooler until the wedding begins. Jessica gave a small sigh and then laughed at herself. <laughs> you go finish dressing while I check on my adorable nieces. Amber and Joni were in Mrs. Mason's large master bedroom, twirling in their adorable magenta flower girl dresses, while Grandma curled their hair and dabbed a bit of lipstick on their puckered lips. They all twirled together, even Mrs. Mason in her floor-length mother-of-the-bride dress with a small flare at the bottom and a gold belt around her waist. Okay, now I'm worrying about everything, Jessica said suddenly. I can't remember seeing the flower baskets. They were there Thursday night for the rehearsal, don't you remember? But they were empty. Today they'll be filled with flowers. And there's a pen at the guestbook table, the one with the maroon feathers and the gold cap. Yes, dear, I've gone over the list at least ten times during the past twenty-four hours. Everything is done. It's all coming together. You look like Cinderella in that gown, Jessica. You're so beautiful, I can't believe your father and I helped create you. Thanks, Mom, and thank you for everything. For the ballet classes, the encouragement, the confidence in me when I left for New Orleans and didn't come home for five years. Thanks for supporting my good decisions as well as my crazy ones. If we're not a little crazy once in a while, life isn't worth living. Mrs. Mason's eyes twinkled under the overhead lamp, shining with unshed tears. Don't cry, Mom. Jessica warned her. If you do, then I will, and I'll ruin my makeup. Just then, Amber came racing into the bedroom, followed by her younger sister, Joni, their eyes as big as saucers. Come see! There are horses in the driveway! Horses! Did the neighbor's horses get out of his field? Frank! Mrs. Mason called. Frank! Now where did your father get to? Grandpa's outside talking to the horses, 
Joni said, grabbing Jessica's hand and pulling her downstairs. The horses are for you! What in the world? Jessica laughed, lifting up her skirts to rush down the carpeted stairs to the foyer of the house. I don't have a yard for horses at my new house in New Orleans, or a trailer to haul them there. Who would be giving us horses as a wedding gift? Horses in Snow Valley were a staple of the landscape and so many residents' livelihood. Grabbing the white plush wrap she'd bought to use with her wedding dress on this winter day, Jessica and the rest of the household trooped outside. The sun was still bright, but only two more hours until it was dark. Sure enough, there were two horses standing in front of the house on the street pavement. Two horses hitched to a gleaming white Cinderella carriage. Putting her hands to her mouth, Jessica gasped. The carriage was a perfect replica to Cinderella's carriage that carried the princess to the ball at the castle. It's Cinderella! Amber shouted, tugging at Jessica's hand. You get to go to the wedding like Cinderella! Where did it come from? Jessica was so stunned she hadn't moved yet, frozen next to the frozen flower beds along the driveway. Catherine nudged her arm. I think your Prince Charming ordered it to take you to the castle, a.k.a. the Snow Valley Community Church. It's beautiful, Mrs. Mason said, her jaw dropped just like Jessica's. How romantic. I recognize those horses, Dr. Mason said, slipping an arm around his daughter's shoulders. Nick Walton's ranch. They're marked as his. The best horses in town. The animals were a sleek chestnut color, their coats gleaming, puffs of white breath steaming from their nostrils. Look, Auntie Jessie, Joni shouted, staring at the carriage as if she were in a dream. Cushy seats, just like Cinderella, too. Come on, come on. Wobbling a little on her high heels, Jessica lurched forward, not feeling very graceful for a trained ballerina, but when she reached the pumpkin-shaped carriage, she saw that Joni was right. Plushy blue seats awaited her. On a small table sat steaming mugs of hot cocoa and a note from James. I'm finally claiming that rain check from three years ago to take you out for hot chocolate. Will you share hot cocoa with me for the rest of your life? Tears misted Jessica's eyes. Oh, yes, James, she said in a low voice. Every day for the rest of our lives. Her father stepped up, taking Jessica's chilly hands into his warm ones. It's already four o'clock. Time to get to the ball and get married and dance before the clock strikes midnight. Is this really happening, Daddy? she asked. In this Cinderella story, midnight doesn't end like Cinderella's story does. The carriage stays an elegant carriage, the glass slippers don't get lost, and Prince Charming becomes yours forever. I never knew you were such a romantic, Dad, Jessica said, giving him a kiss on the cheek. He gave her a sheepish grin. I have my moments. Today is a very happy day, my sweet daughter. I just hate to give you away. Jessica's lips twitched with a smile. I'm glad you approve. Her father helped her into the carriage, and her mother spread a cozy white blanket over her wedding dress. Her two nieces climbed in to keep her company. The princess needs her ladies-in-waiting, she told Amber and Joni, whose smiles were so huge all of their missing teeth showed adorably. We'll be following right behind. Grandma Mason called out to the girls, See you at the church. Jessica was grateful there wasn't a breeze, which would have made the afternoon even chillier. One of the Walton Ranch horse trainers slapped the rumps of the horses, and they began to clop down the street. You silly man, James Douglas, Jessica muttered under her breath. Am I charmed, or do I look ridiculous? What does that mean? Joni asked. Never mind. Do you love Cinderella as much as I do? Yes! Yes! The girls chorused. I just finished dancing in the Cinderella Ballet last month. That's why your new Uncle James surprised me with this carriage. 
Amber clasped her hands together dramatically. It's so romantic, Aunt Jessie. Jessica laughed out loud. <laughs> I didn't know you knew what that word meant. I heard it on TV. That explains everything. Let's have hot chocolate to warm us up. Jessica passed out the cups, peeking inside to see melting marshmallows in the creamy drink. The horses did a slow trot, turning the corners slowly. At least the distance to the church wasn't far. Jessica used to walk to vacation Bible school in the summers when she was a kid. Her nieces clapped their hands when the church appeared. The marquee read, The Jessica and James Love Story premieres today. The announcement was followed by a string of hearts. Amber read it out loud and sighed happily. I love wedding days. Me too, sweetheart. The horses slowly made a half circle around the parking lot, a line of cars following them when the animals pulled the carriage up to the sidewalk in front of the front doors. Brr, Jessica said. Let's get inside where it's warm. Joni's teeth were chattering, her mittened hand soft against her cheeks. Before they could alight from the carriage, the church doors opened and James Douglas burst through, striding straight for the carriage, his face breaking into a smile, his crystal blue eyes locked on Jessica's face. He let out a whistle and then performed a dramatic bow before the carriage when Jessica rose to her feet. You, she breathed, shaking her head at the same time her face was smiling so hard she was trying not to laugh at the sheer delight of the entire scene. Pastor James bowed. My princess, he said, sweeping his hand. Your wedding awaits you. Best wedding day surprise ever. His smile was broad and happy. You're the best wedding day gift. Jessica held on to the white curving doors of the carriage while James smiled up at her, his breath warm and sweet. He caught her by the waist and she smiled back for a moment before leaning into his lips. No kissing until you're married, Amber cried. That's the rules. James tugged at the ribbons around the young girl's waist. Well, if that's the rules, we'd better obey. He lifted Jessica out of the carriage while she wrapped her arms around his neck. Twirling her slowly in a circle, he finally set her down. Did I bring a wedding curse on us? He asked in a low voice. Jessica pretended to ponder the question. I think we can make an exception since I'm a royal princess today. I hereby decree a change to the wedding laws. Sounds great to me. I've been pacing the church hallway for an hour already. I'll have to buy a new carpet. Tucking Jessica's hand in his arm, James escorted her into the church, just as a few snowflakes whirled through the air. Could this day get any more magical? Guests and family were streaming into the chapel, filling the pews while Jessica freshened up in the restroom, reapplying lipstick while Catherine straightened and fluffed her veil. How do I look? Perfect. Like a princess. The two sisters embraced and then held hands while they walked down the hallway to wait in a small coat room just off the vestibule to listen for the opening chords of the processional music. Where's Lydia? I never saw her when we arrived in the carriage, Jessica said. I figured she was already here with James or dressing in the ladies' room. I haven't seen her at all, and she's supposed to be the first bridesmaid to walk up the aisle. I was so distracted by the carriage. Jessica's voice trailed off. Let me go find Sam and see where those two lovebirds are hiding out. They're walking down the aisle together since Sam is James's best man. Jessica nodded. They're probably in the kitchen checking out the wedding food. Or eating it, Catherine added, making a funny face. She disappeared down the hall while Jessica tried not to chew on her freshly manicured pink fingernails. Ten long minutes later, the door burst open again. Frown lines creased Catherine's forehead, her mouth set in a pursed expression. They're not in the kitchen. Is everyone seated? 
Jessica asked. What time is it? This room doesn't have a clock, and I left my cell phone with Dad. Nobody is lined up, and the organist is getting closer to switching to the processional. It's five minutes after five. Already? I had no idea it was that late. Before she could break into a panic attack, Mrs. Mason showed up at the door. Have you heard from Sam or Lydia? Any cell calls or text messages? No, nothing. Are they pulling some sort of joke? James hasn't seen Lydia since Sam arrived an hour ago, her mother said, beginning to panic. It's like they've disappeared. They can't disappear, Jessica contradicted. The church isn't that large, and it's too cold to be taking a walk outside or to be sitting in the car talking. Thinking quickly, she added, Sam was dressed in his tux and black shoes long before the rest of us ever finished getting ready. He left the house for the church. I know he did. This doesn't make any sense, Catherine said, sounding more annoyed. Mrs. Mason pressed Jessica's hand. Your father and James and Pastor John have all gone looking for them. I'm sure they'll turn up in two minutes. Maybe they went back to James and Lydia's house to get something she forgot. I hope so. Jessica said, a knot of worry forming in her throat. Her mind raced, thinking about how strangely her brother had been acting the past week. And now they had taken off without telling anyone where they were going. It was so secretive, which was completely unlike her brother. She and Sam usually spent a lot of time together when she was visiting from Louisiana, talking about life, their goals, their feelings— this trip, Sam never stuck around the house long enough to talk about anything other than his band or saying he was Christmas shopping. Minutes ticked by. Where is he? She said, whirling around the cramped room. I'm going to find him. She strode toward the door just as Dr. Mason came through with James on his heels. Dad, let me look at my cell phone. Her father handed it over silently, and Jessica checked for messages from her brother. Not a single one. Tears burned at the back of her eyes, worry and fear taking over. Okay, I'm panicking now. We're 15, almost 20 minutes late starting. The guests are going to start wondering if James and I got cold feet or called it off or eloped. She gasped. No. She glanced around the group, gulping back the terrifying idea. Aren't we jumping to conclusions? Dr. Mason said. James's face was sober. I was actually about to say the same thing, Jessica. Sam and Lydia were dressed in their wedding clothes well over an hour ago now. No one has actually seen them in the church building since. Pastor John knocked on the door and pushed into the room that was getting quite crowded now. I was about to call Sheriff Carter and tell him to stop any young people wearing fancy wedding clothes he saw running around town, or put out an APB. But before I could, my old friend Judge Lansing rang. My niece Lydia and her fiancé Samuel Mason are with the judge, they were trying to get married before the wedding here began. Mrs. Mason burst into tears. But why? This makes no sense. How could they run off and get married without us there? On Jessica and James's wedding day. Her husband put an arm around her shoulders. His face rattled and somber. Jessica gulped down her fear and emotion now that she knew the two kids were safe and not lying in a ditch or under a rolled car. Fears of car accidents would always haunt her. It was the first thing that sprang to her mind every time someone was late, every time a vehicle ran a red light, or when she heard tires squealing on the pavement. She shook her head, wanting to laugh with relief, but the news was too wild and unexpected to think very clearly. I guess they're not kids anymore, are they? They'll be 21 soon. They've been dating almost four years, longer than me and James. 
They're in love and extremely close, and they're good kids. But they also knew that you, Mom, Dad, James, wouldn't allow them to marry until they were finished with college. What are you saying, Jessica? James asked. You probably know Sam better than anyone else. At the moment, I want to throttle my sister. Or ground her for life. We're way past that, aren't we? Catherine said quietly from the corner. Are they in trouble? Dr. Mason asked soberly, the muscles in his face twitching with emotions he was trying to keep at bay. Do they have to get married? Is that why they did this with such secrecy? Jessica shook her head. I don't think so. The silly lovebirds just didn't want to wait any longer to be together. I think you're right, Catherine said. They'll finish school, I'm not worried about that. Alan and I managed it. Although he was a bit older than me and headed to grad school while these two still have a couple of years left. What do we do now? Mrs. Mason asked the room in a trembling voice. All eyes turned to Pastor John. Judge Lansing is dropping them off soon. Turns out they even went to Billings a couple of weeks ago and got themselves a marriage license. I'm impressed at their foresight, Catherine said with a smile at her parents. You can't lock them up. They'll just go get married in Billings in January when they get back to school after the holiday break. I still don't understand why they would want to ruin their own sister's wedding day. <laughs> hey, Jessica said with a laugh. They were dressed up. It was inexpensive. Saving for a wedding takes a long time. They probably figured they'd get married and get back here before anyone knew a thing. Tell us after the new year that it was a done deal. Get a crummy apartment and live happy as larks, studying 12 hours a day and living on macaroni and cheese. All newlyweds have done the same thing. From across the tiny anteroom, Jessica's eyes met James's clear blue compassionate ones. There was empathy there, and she was certain that he was thinking the same thing she was. He gave her a small nod and an encouraging smile. Clearing her throat, Jessica straightened her shoulders. I think today is the perfect day for a double wedding. Pastor John, are you up to marrying two Mason kids and two Douglas offspring in a few minutes? He let out a chuckle, shaking his head. <laughs> Maybe Judge Lansing just did them a favor by snitching on them before marrying them. James stepped closer, encircling Jessica with both arms while she pressed her face into his tux jacket. Let's get married, shall we? I think we've all waited long enough. She nodded against his chest, trying not to weep. There was so much emotion and joy running through her. Yes. Oh, yes. Catherine clapped her hands, instantly lightening the mood. Amber and Joni are going to be so excited. A double wedding. I get to see both my sister and brother married today. It's a happy day. It's a princess day, Amber said, appearing at the doorway and shouting, Me and Joni's flowers are wilting in the baskets. Are you guys coming or not? A red-faced Sam and a sheepish Lydia appeared a few minutes later, climbing out of the sheriff's car and then entering one of the rear doors of the church, where a cluster of people watched them, choking back emotion. Sam held Lydia's hand tight in his own, obviously protecting her, shielding her from ridicule or criticism. It was touching, and Jessica knew she was watching her baby brother become a man this very moment— Sam immediately walked up to Jessica. I'm sorry, Jess. I really am. This wasn't how I planned it. I hope you can forgive me someday. No, my silly brother, there's nothing to forgive because I love you. Today is my wedding day, but it's your wedding day now, too. And I'm thrilled. She embraced Lydia, holding the girl in her arms to whisper, Now we're truly sisters in so many ways. 
Lydia brushed away tears and Jessica could feel her trembling. I'm so sorry. Can you ever forgive us? Already forgiven, sweetheart. This is exciting. We're about to have the biggest party Snow Valley has seen in a very long time. The congregation and guests were all smiles when the wedding music began at last, and Alan and Catherine entered to walk up the aisle in their roles as best man and matron of honor. Their flower girls threw petals with wild abandon, while chuckles spread throughout the chapel. Pastor John's calm and composed voice was loud and clear, unabashed by the events. Nobody thought too much of the wedding suddenly having an extra Mason-Douglas couple. The town knew how much Sam and Lydia loved each other. When James held Jessica's hands in his to say their wedding vows, she swore she'd never been happier. This man made her swoon, made her laugh, and he was the best man she had ever known in her life. Today was a fairy tale come true, and there wasn't a dry eye in the chapel. When Jessica's parents congratulated the newlyweds, Mrs. Mason wiped the tears away, but they kept coming. I'm sorry I'm such a weepy mother. I can't believe I'm losing you and Sam both in the same day. You're not losing either of us. Our family is growing bigger with lots more people to love and spoil. Dr. Mason gave his daughter a startled look, and she shook her head vehemently. No, Dad, no. No babies for either me or Sam. Not yet. <laughs> she had never seen her parents look so relieved, which just made Jessica laugh again. The reception lasted for hours. The guests stayed through the evening reception, eating, talking, laughing, and dancing, until finally James tugged at Jessica's hand, pulling her close. It's time, my love. I am so ready to get out of here, Mrs. Douglas. That sounds very nice, Mr. Douglas, dude, she whispered against his lips. If you want another dance, we can do it in our honeymoon suite. You have brilliant ideas. After saying their goodbyes to their parents and Pastor John, delighted to see Sam and Lydia dancing with a group of their old friends, a few pounds of rice were thrown all over the parking lot of the church as they left her ride off into the sunset. Except in a horse-drawn fairy tale carriage. James helped Jessica climb into the Cinderella carriage waiting for them at the curb. During the reception, someone had enclosed the open sides, and it was toasty warm with blankets and hot cider to drink while the horses carried them to the Starry Skies bed and breakfast on the outskirts of town. A group of Christmas carolers were singing door to door as they passed them on the road, while the velvety black sky was awash in thousands of glittering stars. Snow Valley has turned into a Christmas postcard, Jessica said, snuggling up with James under the warm blankets while they kissed all the way to the starry skies B&B. When the carriage dropped them off at the renovated Victorian house, James held out a hand to help Jessica down. They called goodnight to their driver and watched the lighted carriage disappear back down the hill. James had already checked them in earlier, so the place was quiet when they arrived. Only a few lamps were lit in the lush and paneled rooms downstairs, furnished in elegant couches and sofas. A note had been left on the front desk by the owner, Raina Kinsella. Please lock the front door upon arrival. No need to come downstairs in the morning. Just give me a ring when you'd like breakfast brought up to you. Menu choices are in the room. The hot tub is newly installed in the suite, and instructions and extra towels are in the room. Enjoy and congratulations on your wedding. Raina Kinsella, the owner, had laid out a teapot, cups, and Christmas cookies for them in the parlor. But they had eaten so much at the reception, they left the arrangement on the sideboard. Jessica's wedding dress swished along the floor as she and James ascended the curving staircase, 
turning left at the top of the landing. All was quiet, but suddenly, a faint soft cry of a toddler came from somewhere behind the doors of the house. Raina's daughter, Jessica whispered, tugging at James's hand to stop and listen. The cry was immediately silenced when a woman's voice began to sing a lullaby about the miracle of the Christ child's birth in the manger. At the door of their suite, James gazed into his bride's face and smiled. It's the perfect time of year to marry the love of my life. This is the season of love and joy and miracles. It's so sweet to hear their voices singing, Jessica whispered back. I only wish your mother could have been here to celebrate you and Lydia marrying. For a moment, James was quiet, holding her in his arms as he unlocked the door with the old-fashioned brass key. She was with us, celebrating and watching over our happiness. A gentle miracle. There are a lot of miracles I believe in, my sweet Jessie not the least of which is you. We are going to have a great life together, Pastor James. I know it in my heart. A moment later, the lullaby stopped and James kissed her gently on the lips. Will we have babies of our own, Mrs. Douglas? Someday, she said, teasing him. The door of the suite swung open on silent hinges, and James lifted Jessica effortlessly into his arms to carry her across the threshold. Where are Sam and Lydia spending the night, those poor kids? Jessica said sympathetically. I think they're a little shell-shocked. Uncle John and your father were making arrangements for them. But right now, you and I are the only two people in the world. That sounds perfect, Jessica said. I'm going to slip into something a little more comfortable than a wedding dress and heels. Do you need a fairy godmother to help you out of it? James teased, sinking onto the edge of the bed. She gave him a sassy look, leaning over to kiss him long and deep. Speaking against his lips, she whispered, That depends on how much magic you can work, Pastor Dude. <laughs> Believe me. It's a lot, he said, laughing. Now go change while I fill the hot tub and get out of this tux. Let me help you with the collar. Jessica frowned as she worked at the buttons, and then the stiff collar came off in her hands. Ah, now I can breathe again, he said with a grin. She lifted her chin. Breathing comes in handy for kissing. We're going to be doing... A lot of kissing tonight. Is that a promise? Jessica scooted off to the changing room, and when she returned a few minutes later, James was staring at her cell phone, the strangest look on his face. Did somebody call? She asked. I'll turn it off so we aren't disturbed the rest of the night. Nope, that's not the problem. Actually, you just got the best wedding gift of your life. Here. What are you talking about? He held out her phone and she took it from his palm. There was a text message from the director of the ballet company, Vernon Maddox. What is my boss doing texting me on my wedding day five days before Christmas? James undid his tie, tossing it across the four-poster bed, and then sinking into a chair. He smiled broadly at her, his eyes lit up like he had a secret. Just read it, sweetheart. Miss Mason, I'm pleased to inform you that you have won the audition for the leading role of Princess Odette in Swan Lake. Congratulations, Jessica. I look forward to working with you in this very important role in one of the most beautiful ballets ever produced. Vernon Maddox. Oh! Jessica exclaimed. Oh! 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 Throwing out her arms, Jessica twirled around the honeymoon suite and did a pirouette, exhilaration and joy sweeping through her like a tidal wave. James rose from the chair and caught her up in his arms, kissing her passionately. 
I'm so proud of you, Jessica Douglas, he murmured. She held him tight, kissing him back until she was breathless. I like the way you say that, Pastor. Jessica didn't think this day could have gotten any better. A Cinderella wedding, her very own handsome prince, and becoming a beautiful swan was beyond her fairy tale imaginings when she dreamed of her wedding as a young child. Seeing the smile on James's face, knowing he loved and supported her, filled her heart to overflowing. The love and promise of a wonderful future shining from his handsome face held her captivated. He cupped her face in his hands, gazing at her with tenderness and love. Jessica, you are my sugar plum fairy, my Cinderella, my love, my wife. I can't wait to be by your side through all the many roles you and I will have together. I love you with every breath and beat of my heart, and I'll always be there to catch you if you fall. This is the beginning of our happily ever after. Jessica wrapped her arms around James's neck, mesmerized by those crystal blue eyes. Her heart was in her throat, tears misting her eyes. I love you with all my heart, James. You're everything I've always wanted. The man I didn't believe could actually be real and actually become my husband. I believe in you. I believe in us. I know we can do anything as long as we're together. Jessica leaned in to kiss him again, his lips warm and tender, making her dizzy and breathless. Love for this incredible, selfless man rose in her heart with such power it spilled over and filled up her entire being. And she knew, without a shadow of a doubt, that this was the start of her greatest adventure ever. This has been Sealed with a Kiss, a Snow Valley Small Town Romance, written by Kimberly Montpetit, narrated by Cassie Rowland, copyright 2024 by Kimberly Montpetit, production copyright by Kimberly Montpetit.